Chapter 10 That swine, Bamba, has been threatening Alice again. Damn his impudence, Thornton told James. It was early morning. The dew was still on the ground, and James and Thornton were on horseback. After a good, fast gallop to sweep the cobwebs away, they were now walking their mounts and talking. Hyde Park was almost deserted, except for a family that rode out together most mornings. James gave him a sharp look. Threatening? How? Sent her a note, complaining that the girl wasn't being seen with enough lords. Can you believe the fellow's insisting his daughter must marry someone titled? He snorted. He also sent a copy of one of the letters he's blackmailing her with, threatening to make it public. To whom had she written those letters, James wondered again. Did you see it? No, she burnt it. They rode on. James was thoughtful. Why would Bamba send Alice a copy of one of her own letters? To frighten her? It obviously had, if she'd told Gerald about it. But she'd burnt it, so she obviously was too ashamed to let him see it. Has Radcliffe's man, what was his name again, discovered anything yet? Thornton nodded. Heffernan. He's good, I'll give him that. He hasn't found Bamba. He's a slippery bastard. But he's already discovered a number of men who've been cheated by Bamba. Cheated? How? All kinds of cheats and swindles. You name it. Financial schemes that turned out to be false. Counterfeit deeds and certificates. Fraudulent share schemes. Card cheats. The sale of land he didn't own. Quite inventive, really. And blackmail? Thornton's mouth twisted. Harder to tell, according to Heffernan. Blackmail is the kind of thing people are more likely to deny, to hide. Cheat them out of their life savings and they'll scream the house down. But blackmail them and they'll deny there was ever anything to be blackmailed about. Understandable, I suppose. A breeze sprang up as they were passing under a spreading oak, and drops of water spattered down on them. None of the men we questioned knew anything about his daughter, however. James twisted in his saddle to stare at Thornton. Good God, you didn't ask them directly. Of course I didn't, Thornton retorted irritably. I know better than to draw the attention of angry, vengeful men to Bamba's daughter. Lord, they'd have had the girl for breakfast. He brushed water droplets off his coat. I simply asked whether they knew any of the family, as a way of contacting him. None of them knew a thing. And you believe them? Thornton nodded. If they had any way of contacting him, they would have done so, believe me. His victims are out for his blood. The fellow has to be one step away from our one-way journey to Botany Bay, if not a lynching. No wonder he's so hard to find. All the more reason to keep these inquiries discreet. I won't have Lady Charlton and Miss Bamber bothered any further by Bamber's nonsense than they already have been. Thornton gave him a quizzical look. You won't have my aunt bothered? James gave him a level look. No. Then... Perhaps I should ask you again about your intentions in that direction. My intentions? James responded. Breakfast. My girls will be up and dressed by now. I don't want to keep them waiting. We always take our breakfast together. Morning, Thornton. Thanks for keeping me up to date with the investigation. But I meant, Thornton began. But James was already cantering away. Gerald's visit to the horse guards had been an eye-opener. He'd found it fascinating working with Heffernan over the last few days. 
but it had been even more interesting, listening to Tarrant and Radcliffe discussing the situation in post-Napoleonic Europe, on which they'd spent quite some time in that initial visit, before moving on to the question of Bamba. He'd never given much thought to what happened after a war was won, or lost. But it was clear from their talk that a war of a different kind was being conducted on a number of different fronts. Only now it wasn't called war. It was called diplomacy. Gerald had always assumed diplomacy was a dull kind of career, where dull people attended dull functions and made or listened to endless dull speeches. He hadn't realized that under that smooth, polite surface appearance, all kinds of exciting things could be happening. Several times during the discussion, he'd felt Radcliffe's gaze resting on him with a thoughtful expression. Once this Bamba problem was dealt with, he might investigate the possibilities of the diplomatic service. It would be a change from frittering his life away with caracal races and card games and boxing matches, endlessly waiting for his father to allow him some responsibilities. But first, the hunt for Bamba. It was all very well for Aunt Alice to assure him that the Bamba girl knew nothing about her father's whereabouts. But Gerald wasn't convinced. Aunt Alice was a soft touch, and Lucy Bamba, well, she was a tricky, twisty piece. He didn't know quite what to think of her. She attracted and annoyed him in equal quantities, and she occupied far too much of his thinking time. He decided to ask her straight out, face to face. He fancied himself a reasonable judge of character. If she lied to his face, he would know. To that end, he sought out her and Alice in Hyde Park at the fashionable hour. His aunt was in her favourite burgundy pelisse, and Miss Bamber was walking on the arm of a large, neatly attired gentleman, smiling up at him with every appearance of interest. Gerald ground his teeth. What the devil was she doing with that crashing boar Humphrey Folliot? And what the devil was he doing to make her smile up at him like that? Curse him! She was looking exceptionally pretty, in shades of yellow, a breath of sunshine beneath a flower-trimmed straw bonnet that framed her face charmingly. This was an investigation, he reminded himself sternly. He was not swayed by charm, hers or any other females. He drew up beside them, greeted the ladies, gave a curt nod to Folliot, and invited Miss Bamber to take a turn around the park with him in his caracal. Her creamy complexion flushed with surprised pleasure, and assisted with pompous ceremony by Humphrey blasted Folliot, who acted far too possessive for Gerald's liking. She climbed up lightly to take the seat beside him. Part of her dress floated up and settled over his boot. He carefully removed it and shifted his leg so that they didn't touch. He needed no distractions for this, and as it was, Miss Lucy Bamber was all too distracting for his peace of mind. Folliot, eh? he said as the caracal moved off. Can't imagine what you could possibly see in that fellow. Can't you? she said with a provocative glance. And yet, you introduced him to me as an eligible prospect. Damn, he'd forgotten that. She added in a dulcet tone, Mr. Folliot has been setting my opinions right. I had no idea how ignorant I was, being a mere foolish female. Such a masterful man. Gerald snorted. If that's the sort of fellow she admired... More fool her. They drove on in silence.
She sat beside him, looking pretty and guileless, and all butter wouldn't melt. A little smile playing around her delectable mouth. But he knew, he just knew, that underneath that angelic exterior, she was as devious and deceitful and disingenuous as her scoundrel of a father. She had to be. She was the whole purpose of his vile scheme. The contrast, the cheek of her, infuriated him. He wanted to shake her until her teeth rattled, or kiss her senseless, which would be madness. She sat there smiling gently to herself, as if she knew something he didn't, and enjoyed knowing it, all the while pretending to be simply enjoying the park and the sunshine and the wretched tweeting birds. Little Miss Innocent. They reached a quiet corner of the park, and Gerald brought his horses to a stop and turned to her. Miss Bamba. She turned to him, and the soft, expectant light in her eyes caused him to catch his breath. Female wiles. He hardened his heart. I've met several men recently who knew your father. He had to know whether she was involved with her father's schemes, or if she even knew about them. And if she was involved, how much? Her eyes narrowed. Checking up on me, Lord Thorncrake? He refused to react. Checking up on your father? You mean raking up dirt? Her mouth twisted cynically. And hoping to find some dirt on me too, I suppose. He arched a sardonic brow. If the cap fits. Her mouth tightened. She gazed out across the park, saying nothing. You will admit, I hope, that I have a right to investigate your father, considering what he's doing to my aunt. You mean the blackmail? His brows flew up. You knew about that? Alice had given him no indication that Miss Bamber knew anything about it. She gave a careless flip of her hand. Only that it exists, not what it involves. She gave him a sidelong glance. Why so surprised? There had to be some reason why Alice took me in, a perfect stranger. She told me about it when I tried to wriggle out of the whole mad scheme. Mad scheme? To marry me off to a lord. She gave a scornful huff. Ridiculous. Why ridiculous, he wondered. Most girls wanted to marry into the aristocracy. He had the evidence of his own sudden popularity after his uncle died, and his father became Lord Charlton, and Gerald became Viscount Thornton. Females who'd never given him a second thought now hung on his every word, and gave every indication that he was the finest fellow in the world. He wasn't sure he believed her claim. Why would you want to wriggle out of it? She turned her head and met his gaze squarely. Because I don't like lords, and I can't think of anything worse than to be married to one. He blinked. How do you know you don't like lords? We're not all the same, you know. Lord is just a word, a title. It doesn't tell you anything about the man who bears it. She snorted. It's not just a word. It's an attitude, a belief about one's importance in the world. A lord thinks, no, he knows that the world is his oyster, and that everyone else is some kind of lesser being put on this earth for his pleasure and convenience. That's a revolting attitude. I know, which is why I could never bring myself to marry a lord. No, I meant your attitude toward lords. How do you know that's what they think? I've met plenty of lords, and I know. Her certainty annoyed him. Where? How have you met this vast profusion of lords? 
You've only been in London a short while. Lords also infest the countryside, you know. I met dozens when I lived with a... a grand lady I was living with. Another grand lady? he said sarcastically. Yes, a French Comtesse, she said coolly. And she had grand visitors, lords and ladies, marquises and dukes, coming to stay with her all the time. A French Comtesse, he repeated in a flat voice. What nonsense. In France, was it? No, in England, not far from Brighton. She kept a pet goose. Her sherry-colored eyes taunted him. The goose you tried to run over. I did not try to run the blasted thing over. I stopped. She gave an indifferent shrug, dismissing his words, as she so often seemed to do. Gerald held on to his temper. She was trying to annoy him, and he refused to let her win. And did your father blackmail her, too? She sent him a scathing look. No, he made a different arrangement. Do you think it will rain later? She said, making clear the conversation was closed as far as she was concerned. Gerald begged to differ. They drove down an avenue of trees, and something else she'd said occurred to him. You said Alice took you in, a perfect stranger. But I thought you were my aunt's goddaughter. Was that a lie? If so, he'd be surprised. Alice never told lies. No, she really is my godmother. Then in what sense were you a stranger? Oh, work it out yourself, she snapped. Color rose in her cheeks. Is this what this drive is all about? Getting me alone so you could confront me about the sins of my father? Looking for reasons to blame me? Because if so, I have the right to look out for my aunt's interests. She is family after all. Oh, family, is it? She flashed. Then why has the current Lord Charlton, your father, done nothing to help Alice out of the financial difficulties her husband, his brother, your uncle, the previous Lord Charlton, left her in? Yes, of course I know about it. And don't you dare imagine that Alice has breathed a word of it. She's far too proud to say anything. But servants let things slip, you know. And I have eyes and a brain. It's obvious. Gerald shifted uncomfortably on his seat. He completely agreed. But he wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of admitting it. She continued in a low, vehement voice. As for your mother, Gerald winced in anticipation. She loses no opportunity to belittle Alice in front of others. A fine family you can boast of. But do I blame you for your uncle's selfishness, or your father's miserly neglect of his duty, or your mother's bitchiness? No, so don't blame me for my father's dirty dealing. I blackmailed no one. I stole nothing, and I've never cheated anyone in my life. Unshed tears glittered in her eyes. She breathed in a deep, ragged breath. So how do you think I feel, knowing my father has made me the instrument of ruin for a dear, kind lady like Alice? And the only way I can prevent it is by marrying the kind of man I most despise. Gerald stared at her. That aspect of things hadn't even occurred to him. Oh, look, there is Mr. Frinton. Leaning out of the caracal, she waved vigorously. Corny Frinton, dressed up like a dog's dinner, spotted her, and beaming, manoeuvred his phaeton to come up beside them. Miss Bamber, Gerald he managed, his Adam's apple bobbing furiously. How splendid to see you again, Mr. Frinton.
Miss Bamber said warmly. And what a very smart outfit you're wearing. So stylish and elegant. She was practically gushing, Gerald thought sourly, overdoing it, lavishing compliments on his friend just to annoy him. Not that poor old Corny would realise. Corny Frinton would be over the moon if any female under 18 noticed him, let alone a pretty young thing like Lucy Bamber. Corny swallowed, ran a gloved finger around his immaculately arranged collar and neckcloth, then gestured silently toward the seat beside his. Take a turn around the park with you, Mr. Frinton, she said. Why, thank you, I'd be delighted. And before Gerald had time to blink, she was clambering across from his caracal, without even setting foot on the ground. And Corny was solicitously helping her into his rig, as if she were some kind of delicate flower, which Lord knew she wasn't. Thank you for taking me up, Lord Thorncross, she said across the gap. Her voice was flat and brittle, and she didn't even bother to look at him. And for the lesson in family honour. Next time you think to invite me, don't bother. Goodbye. Corny blinked, gave Gerald a reproachful look, tipped his hat and drove away. Gerald watched her drive off with Corny. He owed her an apology he knew he did. He didn't want to apologize. He was still annoyed with her for reasons that weren't clear to him. But he knew he'd gone too far. Alice had told him that Lucy wasn't responsible for her father's machinations. But Lucy was as much a victim as she herself was. But Gerald hadn't believed her. Alice was such a soft-hearted woman. Now. The memory of Lucy Bamber's pale, tense face, her eyes glittering with anger and indignation, and it looked almost like hurt, but it couldn't be that, could it? Do I blame you for your uncle's selfishness, or your father's miserly neglect of his duty, or your mother's bitchiness? No, so don't blame me for my father's dirty dealing. He'd almost made her cry. I blackmailed no one. I stole nothing. And I've never cheated anyone in my life. It rang shockingly true. He watched the phaeton disappear, swallowed up by the crowd of fashionable carriages and horses, and a hollow feeling of shame, or was it loss, lodged in his chest. What had he done? It being a fine day, James had decided to bring his daughters to the park to see the fashionable people and horses. He caught himself up on the thought. Might as well admit it to himself. He was hoping to meet Lady Charlton again. He couldn't stop thinking about her. He'd hired a barouche, he was trying out various carriages to see which would suit his enlarged family. Nanny McCubbin sat with a girl on either side of her, with Debo's hand firmly clasped in hers, in case the little girl spied a cat somewhere and jumped out. Judy sat up beside her father, eyeing the colourful throng with interest. In particular, the ladies on horseback. Papa. When may I get a horse? When, he noted, not may. But it was a reasonable question. All the girls needed to learn to ride. He'd had to teach their mother from scratch. Lady Fenwick had refused to allow her delicate daughter such a dangerous activity. Selina had taken to horseback like a duck to water. And as small children, both Judy and Lena had ridden up in front of their parents numerous times. I'll organise lessons for you first. Riding in London is not the same as riding in Spain. 
Judy bounced on her seat with excitement. Me too, Papa, Lena asked. You too, he agreed. I don't want a horse. I want a kitten, said a gruff little voice. Up ahead, James spotted Lord Thornton's caracal, pulling up beside Lady Charlton and Miss Bamber. Thornton took up Miss Bamber, leaving Lady Charlton alone in the company of that frightful boar, Folliot. Look, there's Lady Charlton, he said, and the children and Nanny McCubbin craned to see her. He pulled up beside her. Out you hop, girls, stretch your legs, he told the children, and helped Nanny McCubbin down. Lady Charlton, would you care to take a turn around the park? He said, after the greetings were completed. Her look of thankfulness almost made him laugh. She climbed in with alacrity, and the barouche set off at once, leaving Nanny McCubbin and the children staring after him with mixed expressions. Folliot, having no interest in children and underlings, stalked off. Thank goodness you happened this way, Lady Charlton said. I was ready to murder that man. No happened about it. I saw you in the company of the biggest boar in London and came racing to the rescue, callously abandoning my children and their nanny in the process. She laughed. Thank you. But he's not the biggest boar in London, I'm afraid. You clearly have not yet had the pleasure of the company of Mr. Cuthbert Carswell, pig breeder extraordinaire, who can talk for 40 minutes at a stretch about the breeding of pigs without ever being asked a question about anything. I promise you, he could outbore Mr. Folliot. He gave her a shocked look. No, Folliot is a member of one of my clubs, and I promise you nobody can empty a room faster. And you say this Carswell fellow is worse. Infinitely, she said with feeling. But how is it you are acquainted with these appalling windsuckers in the first place? My nephew introduced them to Lucy as likely prospects, she said grimly. Likely prospects? For what? Murder? She laughed. For marriage. Honestly, when I think of the gentleman Gerald has introduced us to, I wonder what on earth he thinks eligible means. Impossible. Completely. Oh, they're all well born, and each of them is well off, I gather. But not one of them is the slightest bit likely to appeal to a lively girl like Lucy. I cannot imagine what Gerald was thinking. Can't you? he asked dryly. No, I... She gave him a thoughtful look. You don't mean... He nodded. Your nephew is no fool, so if he's introducing impossible men to Miss Bamber, there's a reason for it. A faint crease appeared between her brows, you don't mean he wants her to fail, surely? When he knows the situation I am in, it's more likely he wants them to fail. The impossible men. Oh, she said on a long note, I see what you mean. Do you know, several times I've thought those two were playing some sort of deep game. But honestly, if they have feelings for each other, why not say so? Why not act on it, instead of all this contrary rigmarole? Why not indeed, he said meditatively. He gave her a thoughtful sidelong glance, opened his mouth, shut it, opened it again, and decided not to say what was on the tip of his tongue. Instead, he said, I don't know Lucy well enough to guess, but as for your nephew, I'm not sure he realises it himself. He just knows who he doesn't want her to marry. 
And thus, all these impossible men. What a devious boy he is. I am still cross with him, however. Do you know, at Vauxhall the other night, Gerald had the temerity to abandon Lucy and me to hours of Mr. Carswell lecturing us on pig breeds, the creation of and uses of, all with absolutely no encouragement. Gerald just walked off, leaving us stuck with Mr. Carswell in full porcine flight. James couldn't help laughing. Flying pigs, were they? Her lips twitched, but she managed to say with a fair attempt at indignation, You, sir, are a callous beast, laughing at my misfortune. You may put me down at once. Here, in the middle of nowhere, now that would be abandonment. Now, how shall we punish your nephew? String him up by his thumbs? Place him in the stocks? Or better still, lock him in a cell with Folliot and your bacon-brained pig man? He is not my pig man. She tried to keep a straight face, but failed miserably. An hour with Carswell would teach you. He patted her hand. Poor love, you have endured some dreadful people, haven't you? There was a short silence. What did you call me? She said quietly. Ah, when? He said unconvincingly. You must not say such things, she said after a moment. It is not appropriate. James took a deep breath. He hadn't meant to raise this now, but the word had slipped out and the time had come. I think it's entirely appropriate. She looked away from him, her gloved fingers knotting restlessly. I told you when we first met that I wasn't interested in anything other than friendship. Yes, but... And using words of... of endearment is not fitting for a friendship between a man and a woman. What if I want more than friendship? She shook her head distressfully. No, no, it's not possible. He couldn't see her face for the damned bonnet. He wanted to pull it off and toss it away. He placed a hand over her twisting fingers. Look at me, Alice. She stilled. And you should not be calling me Alice. I have not given you permission. Look at me, please. We cannot discuss this with your face turned away from me. We're not going to discuss it at all. She finally turned her head, and he saw at once that she was distressed, more than he'd imagined. And it wasn't simply a matter of propriety. So what was it? It's marriage I'm talking about, nothing dishonorable. She shook her head. I can't. I won't marry again. Why not? He asked softly. And then, when she remained silent, he added, Can you not trust me a little? I promise you I won't bite. She didn't answer, just shook her head, her lips pressed together. To hide their trembling, he thought. What could be so distressing about an offer of marriage? I don't mean to press. Then don't. Please, take me back. Lucy will be back by now. Very well. I haven't made this offer lightly, but I acknowledge that I've sprung it on you, and that I could have chosen a more appropriate time and place. But we will talk about it again, he said with gentle emphasis. It will make no difference. My mind is made up. And if he wasn't mistaken, that sounded like flat despair. The carriage turned around, and they headed back toward the busier part of the park, where the fashionable people were parading. An awkward silence hung between them.
Alice breathed slowly, trying hard to appear calm. Her hands were cold, her fingers trembling. She smoothed the fabric of her gloves over them and recalled the touch of Lord Tarrant's hand over hers just a few moments earlier. She darted a sideways glance at him and found him watching her. The look in the eyes told her he was recalling it too, and was puzzled by her abrupt rejection of him. She tried desperately to think of something ordinary to say, and remembered the card in her reticule. She pulled it out. Oh, by the way, I spoke to Lady Beatrice, Lady Davenham, I mean, the lady with the cats, and she said she'd be delighted to give Debo a kitten. She gave me this card to give to you. It has her direction. There's a note on the back. She handed him the card. He examined it and chuckled. I gather I'm to present this to her butler. He read the writing on the back. Admit Lord Tarrant and daughters on important kitten business. She said to call on her as soon as you liked. We'll go today. They reached Lucy, who was standing talking to a young man, with Lord Tarrant's daughters and their nanny standing close by. The nanny was chaperoning Lucy, too, by the look of it. Nanny McCubbin takes her duties seriously, he commented. She's enjoying caring for the girls. My brother and I weren't nearly such fun, I suspect. Alice would have liked to learn more about Lord Tarrant and his brother. But the time for such confidences was gone, destroyed by his wretched intention to offer her marriage. Oh, why had he done it? They could never go back to their easy friendship now. I'll call on you tomorrow, he told Alice. At eleven? She made an indifferent gesture. If you must. She climbed down, and the girls scrambled into the carriage, talking nineteen to the dozen. A passionate argument was in progress between Judy and the plump, motherly-looking nanny, about some of the hats they'd seen ladies wearing, and whether they were elegant or horrid with so many birds cruelly deprived of their feathers. The whole question hung on whether the poor birds would have survived their plucking or not. Nanny McCabin was unable to state categorically that they did. What did Papa say? Lord Tarrant glanced at Alice with a humorously resigned expression. But she turned away, pretending not to see it. They couldn't share such intimate glances any longer. But oh, it hurt. They waved the carriage and the girls off. Are you all right, Alice? Lucy said as it disappeared from sight. You're looking rather pale. A slight touch of the headache, nothing to worry about. Do you want to go home? No, a stroll in the fresh air will revive me. I'm fine. But she wasn't. Marriage. How could he deceive her like that when he'd offered her friendship? She'd been so enjoying their friendship, too. She'd never experienced anything like it but it was all spoiled now. They could never go back to how it had been. She'd have to sever the connection. They strolled on. Ladies and gentlemen greeted them, bowed, made small talk. Alice went through the motions. Marriage. The whole idea appalled her. Under a man's thumb again. Subject to his whims and fancies, her own desires ignored, her opinions trampled underfoot. Belonging to a man, her body his to use as he willed, whenever and however he wanted. The marriage bed. She shuddered. Are you cold? Lucy asked. 
She shook her head and forced herself to pay attention. Did you enjoy your drive with my nephew? Him. Ha. They walked on, brooding in silence, stopping from time to time to exchange a brief greeting with an acquaintance. Alice responded absently, her mind wholly taken up with Lord Tarrant's proposal. He wasn't at all like Thaddeus, she told herself. But when she'd first met Thaddeus, he'd seemed charming, until after the marriage had taken place. Lucy suddenly said, Lord Thornton didn't invite me for a pleasant drive in the sunshine. It was to question me about my father. He's been investigating me, did you know? Alice did know, and it was her fault Gerald was looking into Lucy's father's background. Guiltily, she wondered whether she ought to confess to Lucy what she'd asked Gerald to do. He's trying to implicate me in Papa's actions. Alice gave her a sharp look. But he can't. You're not complicit in your father's actions, are you? No, of course I'm not. Lucy gave her a hurt look. Though I doubt your nephew, with his nasty, suspicious mind, believed me. He's doing his best to paint me as some kind of an adventuress, which, to be fair, I suppose I am. Though not, she kicked at a stone on the path, by my own choice. And then he had the cheek to lecture me about family. What about fam? Lucy rushed on. You would have been proud of me, Alice. I so wanted to hit him and knock that stupid, smug, superior expression off his face, but I managed to control myself. I was a lady, on the outside at least. Luckily, Mr. Frinton came past just then. He invited me to take a turn in his phaeton, so I went off with him, and I don't care if it was rude to change carriages like that. He deserved it. Lord Thornton, I mean. I see. And how did you get on with Mr. Frinton? He was quite sweet. It was much pleasanter driving with him than it was with your horrid nephew. Oh, I'm sorry, Alice. I know I shouldn't say such things about your nephew. But honestly, he can be so infuriating. Alice nodded. Men often were, in her experience, promising a nice, safe friendship when really they were planning on marriage. And it's so much easier talking to Mr. Frinton than with that arrogant, uh, than to Lord Thornton. You mean Mr. Frinton actually spoke? At least 28 words, Lucy said. And after spending 15 minutes in a caracle with your nephew, I'm inclined to think I'd be better off with a man who never spoke. They strolled on, heading for the gates now. Did you tell Lord Tyrant about Lady Beatrice's kittens? Yes, he's probably gone straight there. Debo will be thrilled. Hmm. She was going to have to break the news to Lucy. Those little girls. He'd used them to entice Alice into his so-called friendship. And all the time, he just wanted a mother for his daughters. It was clear to her now. Men, why could they not simply say what they wanted? Why did they have to lie? She was going to miss those girls. Lucy would too. She'd opened up so much more with them. The role of big sister suited her. She was going to make a lovely mother one day. I doubt we'll see much of Lord Tarrant and the girls in the future, she told Lucy. Lucy turned to her in surprise. Why? Are they going away? No, but... Alice swallowed. Lord Tarrant and I have had a... a disagreement. I fear we've reached a parting of the ways. Lucy gave her a searching look. But all she said was, what a pity. I liked him and his daughters.
There was no reproach in her voice. After a moment, she sighed and added, What a day, eh? I quarrel with your nephew, and you quarrel with Lord Tyrant. Men, why are the wretches so impossible? She linked her arm with Alice's, and they crossed the road into Mayfair. Lord Tarrant had said he would come at eleven. Alice had been restless and pacing all morning. She'd slept badly, and had woken in the wee small hours, and lain in the dark, waiting for the dawn to show through the crack in the curtains, going over the speech she would make to him. She would be calm and quietly resolute. She would explain her reasons. No, she wasn't required to justify herself. A simple yes or no would do. And there was no question about which it would be. No. She wasn't playing coy or hard to get. She meant it. She would never marry again. Oh, why had he gone and ruined everything? It wasn't fair, making her feel safe with friendship, when all the time he was plotting marriage. She was halfway to loving his daughters already, thinking perhaps she could be like an aunt or a godmother to them, or simply an older friend, as she was now with Lucy. She recalled the feeling when little Lena had slipped her hand into Alice's and skipped along beside her. She'd never had a child hold her hand like that before. Such a simple thing, unthinking childish trust. But it had moved her unexpectedly. She would miss him as well, more than she could say. His presence in her life and that of Lucy, had dispelled some of the loneliness she'd lived with most of her life. He'd given her the kind of adult companionship, understanding and acceptance that she'd never really experienced. But as she feared, there was simply no way a single woman could be friends with an unmarried man. Oh, why did men always want more than she could give? The front doorbell jangled. Lord Tarrant had arrived on the dot, as usual. Alice smoothed down her dress, took a deep breath, turned to face him, and for a moment lost her breath. He looked magnificent, immaculately attired in fawn buckskin breeches, gleaming boots, a dark olive coat, and a subtly patterned olive waistcoat. He strode across the room to greet her. His neat, unfussy neckcloth and crisp white shirt contrasted with the slight tan of his complexion. His short, dark hair was casually tousled. His presence filled the room. Don't you look lovely this morning? Like a sea maiden. His smile went all the way to his eyes. It pierced her heart. She mustered her composure. Good morning, Lord Tarrant. She waved him to a chair and seated herself on the sofa. He was freshly shaved. She could smell his faint masculine cologne. Well, you've made one little girl very happy. Alice blinked at his unexpected opening, and almost shortened my life, he continued in a light, relaxed tone. Why didn't you warn me? Warn you of what? she asked, all at sea. That there were three kittens, three. And there I was with three little girls, all ooing and eyeing over these squeaking, climbing purring, tiny, fluffy creatures. He gave her a mock indignant look. Did I tell you that cats made me sneeze? I don't suppose I did. Otherwise, you might have warned me that there are, I don't know, how many cats in that house. Twenty-five at least. 
she couldn't help laughing. Three grown-up cats, plus the kittens. Perhaps, he said austerely, but I sneezed for twenty-five. She laughed again. Oh, dear, and how many kittens do you now own? Just one, he said triumphantly. But it was very expensive. Expensive? But I thought Lady Beatrice gave them away. Yes, and the cunning old dear did her best to foist all three kittens on me. She's a charmer, isn't she? We're not trafficking in kittens. But I foiled her. I told Judy and Lena that they could have either a kitten or a pony. The ponies won by a narrow margin. Tiny kittens are disgustingly cute, and they were there. But though stabling horses in London will cost me an arm and a leg, horses don't make me sneeze. So I consider it a victory. She laughed again. And Debo was happy, delirious with joy, except that she wanted to take all three home. But it was explained to her that with three kittens in the house, she would have to share, which is not a word in Debo's vocabulary yet, though Nanny McCubbin is on a mission to change that. So, after much anguished deliberation, she finally chose the black and white kitten with three white paws, or rather the kitten chose her by climbing up onto her shoulder and refusing to budge. Its name is Mittens, and she and Debo are in love. And yes, sadly, Mittens is female. I checked. So it seems my future will include flocks of small cats and a great deal of sneezing. But he didn't seem too distressed by the prospect. It sounded hilarious. She wished she could have been there to watch it. I'm so glad it worked out. She smiled at him and suddenly realized that they were leaning rather too close to each other, and that not only was she smiling up at him, he was smiling back at her with a warmly intimate expression in his eyes. And she had been so determined to remain cool and rational and firm. Biting her lip, she straightened and looked away. Oh, now, don't poke her up on me again he said, when we were getting on so well. He reached out to her, but she waved his hand away, saying, don't. Why not? He said it gently, inviting her to explain rather than demanding it. Because I can't, that's why. I will never marry again. I simply can't. But... She began her rehearsed speech. You're a baron with three daughters and a cat. If you're not going to take me seriously, I'm sorry, I take you very seriously. It's just, he made a helpless gesture. I don't want to hear this nonsense. It's not nonsense. Now please, let me finish. You're a baron with three daughters and you're going to need an heir to inherit the title. He opened his mouth. Puff! She glared at him and held up a minatory finger. I'm not finished. I can't give you an heir because... She took another deep breath and forced out the painful words. I'm barren. I was married 18 years, and I never once quickened with child. But, and before you suggest that maybe my husband was the one at fault, his mistress, whom he kept exclusively before and all throughout our marriage, he even died in her bed, did bear him a son. And Thaddeus had never let her hear the end of it. So you see, I was the one lacking she sat back, weaving her shaking fingers together. Foolish that she found it so upsetting to talk about. 
Thaddeus had rubbed her nose in it often enough over the last eighteen years, and Almeria too. But still, admitting it left her trembling. But at least it was out now. He sat for a moment in silence, just looking at her. Finished? Yes. Good. To start with, I don't need an heir. I have half a dozen cousins who would be delighted to step into my shoes. But... <laughs> he held up a stern finger in imitation of her earlier gesture. My turn. Second, I don't want children from you, Alice. Though if they happened, I would, of course, be delighted. So, you see, your worries are groundless. What's more? Stop! Just stop! Tears flooded her eyes. She blinked them away, shaking her head in repudiation of his words. It's very kind of you to say so. Kind? But I can't do it. Can't marry you. Can't marry anyone. I couldn't bear it. I'm not the... Not the sort of woman made for marriage. He took out his handkerchief, moved beside her on the sofa, and cupping her chin, gently blotted her tears. Alice, my dear, I don't know what maggot you have in your mind about marriage, but if there's one thing I'm certain of, it's that you're exactly the sort of woman made for marriage. Oh, don't. I'm not. She shook her head, rejecting his words, though they pierced her very soul. Yes, you are. He tilted her chin, and very gently pressed his lips to hers. She stilled. Cupping her face between his big, warm hands, he feathered tiny kisses over her mouth, her cheeks, her eyelids, as if tasting her tears. She couldn't move, could hardly breathe. Her mind went blank. The warmth of his body soaked into her. Brief, fleeting, tender touches. It was like nothing she'd ever known, almost as if she were being cherished. She put a tentative hand to his face, feeling the faint prick of bristles under the firm, smoothly shaven skin, and breathed him in. The light fragrance of his cologne mingled with a darker, more masculine scent. It was addictive. Still feathering her with kisses, he stroked along her jawline with one hand, and slipped his fingers into her hair, loosening her pins and letting her hair fall out of its careful knot. One long, strong finger stroked the tender skin of her nape. Faint shivers ran down her spine, warm and enticing. His mouth closed over hers, and she recoiled in surprise as his tongue ran along the seam of her lips, gently insistent. She pulled back, startled. Grey eyes, dark with some unknowable emotion, met hers. Alice, he murmured. He leaned forward again to capture her mouth, and again she pulled away. I'm not. Oh, stop it. She pushed feebly at his hands and said in a choked voice, Don't you see? I can't. He released her at once. Can't what, sweetheart? His voice was low, understanding. Can't be married. Ever. Not ever. She crushed her handkerchief in her hands and fought to regain her composure. She'd allowed him to kiss her. It was a mistake, giving him the wrong idea. Not even to me? As an attempt at lightness, it fell sadly flat. Despairing, 
she shook her head. It would only make us both miserable in the end. Sooner than later. I don't see why. Perhaps you don't. But I know. I cannot be a wife to you or any man. Her voice cracked, and a few more tears trickled down her cheeks. She scrubbed at them with his handkerchief. Marriage, for me, was, was unbearable. So, please, let us drop the subject. But, no, just no. In a stifled voice, she added, please, leave. He hesitated, then rose slowly and stood, troubled as he gazed down at her. I'm sorry, Alice, so sorry I have upset you. I'll leave you now, my dear. I have no wish to distress you any further. His voice was like a caress, warm and deep and sincere, and it brought on a fresh flood of useless tears. Eyes squeezed closed, she couldn't bear to look at him and see the reproach or hurt in his eyes. Alice shook her head. He hadn't distressed her. It was the situation, the resurgence of old pain, the reminder of hopes crushed and dreams shattered. All because, foolishly, she had let herself dream again. Just a small, timid, hopeful dream that she could be content with half a loaf, with friendship. But that had turned out to be just as painful, if not more so. She held out his handkerchief, and when he didn't take it, she looked up. Lord Tarrant was gone. James walked home his thoughts back in that room with Alice. What was going on? I cannot be a wife to you or any man. What did she mean by that? Did she mean she was repulsed by the opposite sex? Some women were attracted more to their own sex than to men. But he didn't think Alice was one of them. He thought about their kiss. Well, it was barely a kiss. She'd stiffened at first, like a wooden doll, wary, as if expecting... Expecting what? He had no idea, but he'd felt her trembling and knew she was taut and on edge. So he'd taken it gently at first, slow and reassuring. And she hadn't repudiated him or his attentions. In fact, after a few moments, she'd softened in his arms and started to unfurl like a flower opening to the sun. She'd begun to relax against him, savouring his caresses, mild as they were. The way she'd hesitantly stroked his face. She wasn't repelled by him, he was sure of that. In fact, he was pretty sure he'd felt the first few shivers of arousal rippling gently through her. She was attracted to him, he was certain. Well, as certain as a recently rejected man could be. Marriage for me was unbearable. Lord, but that husband of hers had a lot to answer for. Thaddeus Peyton had been an insensitive bully at school, and James doubted he'd changed much. Any woman would be miserable with him. But she'd said, unbearable. What part of marriage was unbearable for her? He thought about the moment she jerked back, pulling away from him. What had he done to cause her to startle like a wild bird? He tried to remember. It wasn't easy, as he'd been losing himself in her, 
the taste of her entering his blood, the hunger in him growing. The taste of her. That was it. It was when he'd stroked the seam of her lips with his tongue. She'd pulled back, surprised, a little shocked, as if, oh, surely not. She was a married woman. She'd been married for 18 years. And yet, he picked up his pace. Part of him wanted to turn around, march back into her house, and get to the bottom of it. But she'd had enough upset for the day. He wanted her in his life and in his bed, and the last thing he wanted to do was to bully her. Chapter 11 I'm sorry, Gerald, dear, his aunt said as she came down the stairs, but she doesn't want to speak to you. Gerald clenched his teeth. It was his second time asking to see her but Lucy Bamba refused to do him the courtesy of letting him explain. It was infuriating. After that drive in the park, he couldn't get the look in her eyes out of his mind. It disturbed him. He needed to speak to her to set things straight. But she had this absurd prejudice against anyone with a title. Any time in his first twenty-six years, he would have been perfectly acceptable to her, unless she was also prejudiced against army officers. For the first two decades of his life, he'd had no title, nor any expectation of one. But eighteen months ago, he'd become a Viscount, and thus was persona non grata for Miss Lucy Bamba. Miss Lucy Bamba of no particular background. In fact, of a particularly shady background. Blast her. He was in a mood to storm off, but his aunt had other ideas. Come into the drawing room and we'll have a nice cup of tea, and you can tell me what you've been up to. She smiled. And I have something particular to tell you. He followed her in, hoping she had some more information about that wretch Bamba. He and Heffernan kept coming up against dead ends. Heffernan was widening the search, tracing Lucy's background in the hope that it would lead to something. Some hint that would lead them to Bamba. He'd started with the place he'd met her, on the Brighton Road. There couldn't be too many French women there, contesses or not who had a pet goose. Dear boy, Alice said, as she seated herself in her favorite chair. I want to thank you for taking the trouble of introducing your friends to Lucy. I must also apologize for thinking you meant the introductions spuriously. Gerald blinked. He had meant them spuriously. What do you mean, Aunt Alice? She smiled at him. It seems to have answered after all. Answered what? Mr. Frinton wishes to court Lucy. What? For a moment he couldn't breathe. Are you telling me that Corny Frinton, the man who cannot string two words together within twenty yards of any pretty female, no, make that any female, has plucked up the courage to court a girl. To court your goddaughter? Alice nodded vigorously. Yes, he asked my permission. Intending marriage? Well, of course, intending marriage. What else, you foolish boy? Corny Frinton. Gerald sat down heavily on the sofa, as if his legs had suddenly given way. He's a very sweet boy, of course, perfectly eligible, and very rich. Alice paused, a slight crease between her brows. Though, if she took him, I suspect it would be for my sake, to get me out of her father's clutches. I hope she won't make such a sacrifice. Sacrifice? 
If Lucy married Corny Frinton, she'd be rich, would have the best of everything. Fine clothes, a position in society. Corny might be as articulate as a rock, but he was very good-natured and very well-connected. She'd be set for life. It won't do, he said firmly. It would be a very unequal match. The faint crease turned into a decided frown. Gerald Payton, I never dreamed you could be as horridly top lofty as your mother. I'm disappointed in you, really, I am. Lucy might not be born to the aristocracy, but she's a perfectly lovely girl, and any gentleman ought to be... Oh, I meant, Gerald interjected hastily, unequal in personality. Old Corny is a fine fellow, but he's not up to scratch with women. Your goddaughter would run rings around him. His aunt just looked at him, her soft blue eyes seeming quite flinty. Besides, he added, dredging up another reason why the match would be all wrong. She's probably the first female Corny's ever been able to talk to. It would be a mistake to marry only because of that. She considered it, then nodded. Perhaps Sir Hetherington Bland would be better. What? You mean Bland is also? He asked my permission at the Carter Higgins ball, she said smugly. But damn it all, the fellow's titled. I thought she refused even to look at her lord. Language, Gerald. He muttered an apology and she continued. It's a fine line, I admit, but Sir Hetherington's a knight, not a baronet, and therefore not really a member of the aristocracy. But it might be sufficient for her father to accept, though he did say a baronet was as low as he was prepared to go. And you must admit, Sir Hetherington is quite good-looking and very rich. Gerald didn't have to admit anything of the sort. But good God, the man stinks. Oh, a wife will soon fix that, his aunt said placidly. Then added after a moment, Gerald, dear, your mouth is hanging open. He shut it with a snap. James called on his reluctant lady again the following day. Alice received him with a blank look of surprise. What are you doing here? I thought... You thought I'd go away and stay away? Yes, but we agreed to be friends, didn't we? And friends don't abandon each other, not in my world. A crease appeared between her silky arched brows. But we can't be friends, not since... Since I proposed marriage? Yes. I see. Does that ban extend to my daughter's? I must say they'll be very disappointed not to be allowed to visit you or play in your garden. They haven't stopped talking about it ever since you climbed that tree with them. She gave him a troubled look, and he added sadly, I would have brought them today, but I was worried you'd send them away. I would never send them away, she said shocked. So you would still welcome their visits? Of, of course, she'd finally perceived his trap. He glanced out the window. Perhaps we could talk in the garden. In the garden? Why? Because it's spring, and the sun is out, and who knows how long that will last. And because he wanted her to lose a little of the tension that currently held her as tight as an overwound clock. He presented his arm, and with a bemused expression, she allowed him to escort her into the garden. They strolled along, the woman on his arm pretending to enjoy the delights of the garden in the intermittent mid-spring sunshine, and filling the silence with determinedly inconsequential chatter. They admired the flowers, picked some cat mint for the kitten's basket, observed the budding lavender, where she explained, in detail and rather desperately, 
how she made lavender bags to keep her linens fresh and fragrant, a subject in which he wasn't the slightest bit interested. Since the garden wasn't doing the job, James decided to get straight to the point. You know, marriage with one man might be unbearable, but it could be quite different with another. With me, in fact. Because, you must admit, as friends we've done quite well. Yes, but there is a distance between friends that makes it easier. And that's what troubles you about marriage. It's intimacy. She flushed and looked away. I wish you would not. I'm fighting for my future happiness here, he said. Our future happiness. And I don't wish to distress you, but if some plain speaking will help. At that moment, large raindrops started to fall. He glanced up. Where had the sun gone? It was all dark clouds, and blast this wretched climate, rain getting heavier by the minute. He glanced around. Here, that summer house. Taking her hand, he ran with her toward the summer house. He tried the door. Blast, it's locked. Rain pelted down. The key is here. She took an ornate key out of the nearby stone lantern, and he unlocked the door. They fell inside, breathless, laughing, and damp from the sudden downpour. She shook out her skirts, which were clinging to her shape in a most enticing and deliciously improper way. James simply stood and watched her. Her hair clustered in damp curls framing her face. Her complexion, burnished by the rain and the exercise, glowed like a pearl. Damp, disheveled, unselfconscious and natural, she purely took his breath away. Lord, but you're beautiful, he murmured. And without thinking, he stepped forward and cupped her face between his hands. Her skin was like cold silk, her mouth lush and damp and sweetly curved, and he was drowning in her eyes, her sea-deep, sea-blue eyes. James couldn't help himself. Slowly, he lowered his mouth to hers, watching her eyes widen and then flutter closed. She was tense, but she made no move to pull away as he brushed his mouth across her lush, tender lips. He nibbled gently on them, teasing and tasting, and she pressed against him, her mouth closed tight, her lips pursed as she pressed baby kisses on him. He ran his tongue along the seam of her lips, seeking entrance. Her eyes flew open, her breath hitched, and her lips parted, and he was in, and oh, the glory of her. She tasted of surprise and rain and sweet, sweet woman. Heat sizzled through him, setting his body alight. He wanted to take her now, here in the summer house, with the rain all around them, cocooning them in their own private world. He deepened the kiss and felt her hesitation, and then the first shy touches of her tongue against his. He pressed deeper, pulling her pliant body against him, feeling himself hardening. Awareness finally trickled through to his brain and hit him like a dash of cold water. It wasn't just shyness here, not just inexperience. It was a level of innocence that shocked him. Baby kisses. She had no idea how to kiss. Eighteen years of marriage, and she had no idea how to kiss. That bastard. He eased back. Alice pressed her hands against his chest, not quite sure whether she was pushing him away or just not wanting to break all contact. 
His chest was warm and firm, and she fancied she could feel his heart beating under her fingers. It couldn't possibly be beating as fast as hers. It took a few moments to clear her head. She had no idea kissing could be so... like that. He waited, gazing down at her with an unreadable look in his mist-dark eyes. She moistened her lips. His eyes dropped to her mouth and darkened further. She looked away. The intense look in his eyes was too distracting, and tried to gather her scrambled faculties. He stroked a lock of hair away from her face. It occurs to me that perhaps the aspect of marriage you disliked so much is the thing you call um, the activities in the marriage bed. Alice gasped. She didn't know where to look. Stunned by his bluntness, she floundered before managing to say, You should not. My marriage is, was, private. I'm right, aren't I? She opened her mouth, closed it, and looked away. I'll take that as a yes, he said. His calm demeanor was irritating. This conversation is not appropriate. I wish you would stop. He gave her a rueful smile. I'm not trying to upset you. Just clear the air. So, how many men have you lain with? The question shocked her. She pressed her lips together, refusing to answer. She looked toward the door but the rain was pelting down heavier than ever. The windows were starting to fog up. She ought to remove herself from this conversation, rain or not. But she didn't move. He frowned. None? Really? What about the fellow you wrote those letters to? Your secret lover? Letters? What letters? The ones Bamber is blackmailing you with. I didn't write those letters. My husband did, to his mistress. She added indignantly. I've never had a lover, secret or otherwise. I was a faithful wife. He gave her a thoughtful look, then nodded slowly. I didn't think you were the straying kind. And I suppose you were a virgin when you married. She didn't answer. Of course she'd been a virgin. She was, had always been, a virtuous woman. It was outrageous of him to suggest otherwise. So, he continued, if you disliked the um you experienced in the marital bed, and you've only ever lain with your husband, it's clear with whom the fault lies. She felt herself flinch and turned her face away. Oh, Lord, don't look like that. I didn't mean you. He caught her cold hands in his big warm ones. I meant the fault lay with your husband, the late Earl, he said softly. Oh, Thaddeus had never let up about her inadequacies as a wife, in all ways. Lord Tarrant's warm thumbs caressed her chilled fingers. Most women find, um, also known as sexual congress, pleasurable, unless... She snatched her hands away. They do not. My mother warned me it would be unpleasant, and it was. Oh, why are we even talking of such matters? It is quite reprehensible of you not to mention inappropriate and unseemly. He placed a finger on her lips, stilling her. You interrupted me. She blinked and pulled away. It was just a touch, but it was too distracting. What? I hadn't finished. Women generally find sexual congress pleasurable, unless their male partner is clumsy, ignorant, or utterly selfish. 
I'm guessing your husband was the latter. Her cheeks were on fire. She pressed her cold hands against them to try to cool the heat, but it was in vain. What was she to say to such a thing? Never in her life had anyone spoken to her in such a way, so frankly, so openly about matters that should remain behind closed doors, closed marital doors, not in a summer house in a shared garden with a man she'd only known for a relatively short time. His voice deepened. You have a dislike of um, because your experiences with your husband made it more like irk. But with me, I promise you, it would be quite different. Marry me, and I will turn um into yum. His eyes danced. She stared at him, torn between laughter and tears. This is not a subject for joking. Indeed, it is not. Except that I fear you have yet to discover that sexual congress can be fun and light-hearted, as well as extraordinary and intense and moving and earth-shattering. He waited a moment, then added, Anyway, think it over. Think it over? She couldn't think at all. His words had stirred up such turmoil in her brain, she couldn't think of a thing to say. The rain was slowing. I, I must go. Lucy and I are planning to go, uh, out. She had no idea. There were no plans. By all means, run away, he said with an infuriatingly understanding smile. But think about what I said. The um you've experienced is not the um you deserve. We'll resume this conversation another day. No, that we will not. She opened the door and looked out. The rain had slowed, and it was only a short distance to her house, but she would still get very wet. A warm hand closed around her arm, and a deep voice said, No need for you to get any wetter. I'll go. I'll send Tweed back with an umbrella. She turned to thank him, and he bent and kissed her his mouth firm and warm. Just think about what I said. He kissed her again, swift and possessive, and it seared her to the bone. Then he stepped out into the rain. Alice plonked bonelessly onto a bamboo chair and stared unseeing through the open door into the rain-washed garden. She put a shaking hand to her mouth, her lips tingled. She could still taste him. Her whole body was a tangle of sensations. So that was what a kiss, a proper kiss from a man, felt like. No wonder the poets rhapsodized so. She'd never quite understood it before. The raw intimacy of it. His tongue inside her mouth. It should have been unpleasant, but instead it was exciting, addictive. She could still taste it, the sharp, dark taste of a man, of this man. The unleashed coil of wanting it, him, swirled deep within her. Rocking gently, she wrapped her arms around her body. It was an ache a need. But for what? She might not know about kissing, but she understood what that masculine hardness pressing against her meant. And yet it hadn't repelled her. It was as if his kisses had somehow melted something inside her. She'd never felt such tenderness, such an affinity with another person. 
It left her aching, yearning, and deeply confused. Sharp, damp air from the open door cooled her cheeks. The rain was easing. He'd shocked her, had trampled over her delicate sensibilities, and blasted her assumptions about men and women wide open. Women generally find sexual congress pleasurable, unless their male partner is clumsy, ignorant, or utterly selfish. Could that possibly be true? Pleasurable? She couldn't imagine it. I'm guessing your husband was the latter. She had no difficulty believing that. Thaddeus had been selfish in all things. He took what he wanted with no care for anyone else. She thought about what her mother had told her the night before her wedding. Mama had not found sexual congress in the least pleasurable. The marriage bed is something women must endure with as much grace as possible. The activity is deeply distasteful to any lady. But remember, once you have conceived a child, it will cease. The child will be your reward. Alice had never been rewarded with a child, and the unpleasantness had gone on for years. But Lord Tarrant claimed most women found pleasure in the act. Alice could not imagine how. But Papa was a vicar and a rigidly moral man, and Mama had always been quite prudish. It was likely that both he and Mama had come to their marriage bed as virgins. Clumsy, ignorant, or selfish? Perhaps all three, if what Lord Tarrant said was true. Certainly, Papa had never been an affectionate man. She recalled the way Lord Tarrant had picked up Lena in her distress and soothed her, making the child feel loved instead of shamed, and the way he'd given little Debo her much-longed-for kitten, even though cats made him sneeze. Papa would never have done that. Nor would Thaddeus. Lord Tarrant's children were in no doubt that they were loved and valued. Alice had never felt like that. All through her childhood, she had tried to earn her father's love by being good and obedient, by doing the right thing. But no matter how hard she tried, She'd never managed to measure up to Papa's standards. She was never good enough. She'd gone to her wedding with such hope, such tender dreams, determined to find the happiness that people said came with marriage. But whatever Thaddeus had wanted in a bride, he'd made it very clear, almost from the first day, that she wasn't it. And as time went on, he'd reminded her regularly that she was as far from a satisfactory wife as a woman could be. Her barrenness had only reinforced it. The rain had stopped, but raindrops still dripped from the trees. She could hear footsteps crunching on the crushed limestone path, Tweed coming with an umbrella. Alice stood, smoothing her hair and straightening her skirts, hoping the turmoil inside her wasn't visible. She moistened her lips and remembered the way his gaze had focused on her mouth and intensified. Her lips tingled at the memory, as did other parts of her body that were nowhere near her mouth. Marry me, and I will turn um into yum. Lord Tarrant had shaken her foundations to the core in more ways than one. Chapter 12 It was the night of Lady Peplow's masquerade ball. Alice had donned her flowing blue-green gown, and her maid, Mary, had dressed Alice's hair in what she imagined was an Egyptian style, close around the head, then flowing loose with beads and gold cords plaited in. 
She'd also painted Alice's face with crimson lips and shadowed, almond-shaped cat's eyes. The woman in Alice's looking glass didn't look much like her at all. She looked glamorous and mysterious. You look gorgeous, Alice, Lucy said, entering the room. Here's the rest of your outfit. Mary, that hairstyle is perfect. The headdress will fit over it beautifully. Alice stared at the gleaming gold headpiece, armbands and belt Lucy had brought in. These look wonderful, Lucy, just like new. However did you do it? Lucy grinned. Oh, paper mache is easy. I couldn't afford proper gold leaf, but eventually I found some paint that produces a very good imitation. The shine won't last long, but that won't matter for something you wear only once or twice. And if in five years' time you want to wear it again, I'll just paint it again. Now, try it on. Mary carefully fitted the headpiece on Alice. The thick gold band, embossed with Egyptian-style motifs, enclosed her head. On her forehead was a large jewel glittering in the center of a sunburst shape entwined with snakes. It's perfect and lighter than I remember, Alice said, adjusting it slightly. She slipped the snake armbands on and fastened the belt of Egyptian-style medallions around her waist. It, too, had new glittering jewels glued on. There was also an elegant gold mask with large cat's eye eye holes with gold ribbons to tie it on. She turned to Lucy to thank her again and frowned. You'd better hurry and get dressed. I hoped we'd leave in half an hour. Lucy was wearing a wrapper and she hadn't even dressed her hair. Lucy dimpled. Don't worry, I'll be ready. I just need Mary's help with a few things. Mary smiled. Be with you in a minute, miss. Lucy danced out, and the maid added, If that's all right with you, my lady. Of course. You're enjoying yourself, aren't you, Mary? Dressing us up like dolls. I am a doll, my lady. This old house has really come to life since that young miss came to live here. Her and having Lord Tarrant's little girls come to visit. Like a breath of fresh air it is, having young life about the place. As she was leaving, she turned in the doorway and said, And you, my lady, I can tell you're happier. You look ten years younger. And dressed like that, you look stunning. Lord Tarrant's eyes are going to fall right out when he sees you. Oh no, you're Miss... But Mary had gone. Alice viewed herself in the looking glass. Mary and all the servants had the wrong idea about Lord Tarrant and her. They were all expecting a betrothal announcement, and that wasn't going to happen. She wasn't dressing for him... She really wasn't. She was dressing for herself, and so that the night wouldn't be spoiled for Lucy. And Lady Peplow, and because this was the only costume she had. Besides, she wasn't even sure he was coming. Lady Peplow might not have invited him. She stood in front of the looking glass and swished her skirts gently back and forth. A smile slowly grew. She did look quite unlike her usual self. She tied on the slender gold mask. Her eyes glinted mysteriously through the cat's eye slits. Her smile deepened. He probably wouldn't even recognize her. If he came, that is. Half an hour later, Alice watched Lucy coming gracefully down the stairs. You look wonderful, she exclaimed. I would never have recognized that as my old muslin dress. Lucy, smiling, pirouetted on the landing, skipped down the last few steps and made Alice a deep curtsy.
She was clearly looking forward to the ball. The dress was pure white. Mary had worked wonders, and it seemed looser, floatier, and less structured than the dress Alice remembered. A Grecian-style pattern had been stenciled around the hem in gold, and gold braid sewn around the neck. Gold buckles were fastened at the shoulders, to which a length of gauzy, gold-edged fabric was fastened, floating about her, adding to the impression of a statue come to life. Around her waist, Lucy wore a braided girdle of gold rope, with ivy and other creepers from the garden wove in. Her tawny hair was arranged in a vaguely Grecian style, loosely pulled back and bound in places with more gold rope. A headband made of fresh leaves crowned her brow. She wore a pair of light sandals and carried a simple white satin mask. Alice noticed with a jolt of shock that her toes were bare and her toenails were painted gold. It was very daring and wonderfully bold. The difference between this young, happy, excited girl and the sulky, badly dressed creature she had first encountered was heartwarming. It might have started as blackmail, and Alice still fretted about the consequences of that. But she couldn't regret having Lucy come to live with her. Mary was right. Lucy had brought life and liveliness to all their lives. You're so clever. I never could have created such a costume, Alice exclaimed. You could have stepped straight out of a mural in a Greek temple. And you look beautiful. It was true, too. Lucy glowed with health and youth and excitement. We both look beautiful, Lucy said. Alice helped Lucy tie on her mask and arrange her cloak over her costume, being careful of all the greenery. Then they climbed into the carriage and were on their way. Alice looked around her. There was no doubt about it. Lord and Lady Peplow knew how to throw a ball. Carriages lined the street, waiting to drop off their occupants. The front of the house was lit with blazing brands tended by liveried footmen, the dramatic leaping flames lighting up the night. A temporary porte cochere had been erected in case of rain, and a red carpet laid from inside the house to the edge of the road, ensuring that neither hem of dress nor sole of shoe need touch the common pavement. Inside, people milled about, passing their cloaks and hats to servants, though not those people wearing dominoes, who were mostly men. The crowd moved slowly up the stairs, where they were greeted by Lord and Lady Peplow. Lord and Lady Peplow looked magnificent, dressed as an oriental potentate and his queen, in sumptuous colourful silks and satins, glittering with gold and jewels. Both wore large, splendid turbans, and Alice felt a little dull by comparison. But Lady Peplow was extremely complimentary. The perfect partner for you is waiting inside, Queen Cleopatra, she said with a wink to Alice. And any number of young gentlemen will be lining up to dance with this lovely Greek goddess. Alice hoped so. Bamber's deadline was creeping ever closer. They passed the receiving line, entered the ballroom, and stopped to admire the scene. It was decorated with colourful silks draping the walls, potted palms, and sprays of greenery placed at intervals around the room and pierced brass lanterns studded with coloured glass, throwing patterns of coloured light across the crowd beneath. Isn't it wonderful? Lucy breathed. I've never seen anything like it. Alice had to agree. The Peplo ball was going to be talked about for months to come. It was already 
a sad crush, the ultimate accolade. People were dressed in every variety of costume one could imagine. There were harlequins and pirates, knights of old, several devils with horns, Cossacks and Turks, Neptune with his trident, ladies in last century's fashions, with high powdered hair and wide pannier skirts, creatures from mythology with strange heads and human bodies, jesters, medieval ladies with high pointy headdresses, Spanish ladies in mantillas, and dainty milkmaids and shepherdesses. Lucy leaned over and murmured in Alice's ear, no self-respecting shepherdess or milkmaid would be seen dead in an outfit like that. Then she added with sardonic humour, maybe I should have come as a goose girl. Alice followed her gaze and saw her nephew, Gerald, threading his way through the crowd toward them, a grim expression on his face. Not another quarrel, not again, surely. Greetings, O oh divine lady goddess. A young man dressed as a medieval page bowed to Lucy. His outfit was an unfortunate choice. His legs, clothed in white hose, were bandy and very skinny. But what he lacked in musculature, he made up for in confidence. Grant me a dance, O oh fair one. Are you Athena, perhaps, or maybe Aphrodite? Lucy shook her head. Artemis, perhaps? Or Venus? Venus was Roman, you cloth head. Another young man in a Viking outfit joined them. He bowed to Lucy. Would you be Hebe, perhaps? Goddess of youth and beauty? At that point, Gerald, who was dressed as a Spanish bullfighter, arrived, just as the first young man said to Lucy, I give up. Tell us, oh fair lady, which goddess you are, and then grant me a dance. Lucy pretended she was answering her page boy admirer, but she looked straight at Gerald as she said, I am no goddess, good sirs, but a priestess of Apollo. Her gaze clashed with Gerald's. I am Cassandra of Troy, cursed to speak the truth, but never to be believed. Gerald's jaw tightened. About that, could I have a word, please? Hey, we were first, the two young men objected. Indeed you were, Lucy cooed, and ignoring Gerald completely, she placed a hand on each young gentleman's arm, and they strolled away. Gerald watched them disappear into the crowd, then turned to Alice. She's never going to forgive me, is she, Aunt Alice? Perhaps you could intervene on my behalf. You are mistaken in me, young man, Alice said, a little irritated that she'd been so easily recognized. She supposed being with Lucy had given her away, but she didn't want to intervene on Gerald's behalf. So she clung to her current identity. I am Queen Cleopatra, aunt to no one here, and you must sort out your own tangle. Indeed you must, said a deep, amused voice behind her. Take yourself off, young fighter of bulls, and make your own amends to yon cold and angry lady. I have an appointment with my queen. You have no such? Alice began, turning. Her words dried up at the sight that greeted her. A tall Roman soldier bowed. Mark Antony at your service, Queen Cleopatra. Over his mask, he wore a gleaming gold helmet topped with a crest of red feathers. Over a short red tunic, he wore a leather cuirass, that was molded to his powerful chest and hard, flat belly. A symbolic gold eagle covered his heart. Instead of trousers, he wore a kind of kilt made of strips of leather studded with brass medallions. It ended at his knees, his bare, brawny, naked, masculine knees. 
She dragged her eyes away, but couldn't help wondering whether Roman generals wore the same thing under their tunic as Scotsmen were reputed to. She clamped down on the thought. She should not be thinking of such things. A short red cloak hung from gold buckles at his shoulders, dangling rakishly behind him. His tanned, powerful arms were bare, and a broad gold armband was clasped high on one muscular arm, while thick leather bands encircled his wrists. On his feet, he wore red, three-quarter length boots. He looked powerful, barbaric, and magnificent. The sight of him took her breath away. Mark Antony, Cleopatra's famous lover. He couldn't have known what she was wearing to the ball, could he? That gleam in his eyes told her otherwise. Who told you? He pretended puzzlement. Told me? What I was going to be wearing tonight. He laid a dramatic hand over the eagle on his breastplate. There was no need for anyone to tell me, O oh queen. It was in the stars. We are fated to be together. Nonsense. She told herself he was just playing a part. But there was a note underneath the playfulness that sounded worryingly sincere. It can't be a coincidence. Somebody must have told you what I was wearing tonight. You're right. It was a little bird. What little bird? Not Lucy. She'd be very disappointed if it were. No, your goddaughter didn't give anything away. Not knowingly, at least. He tucked her hand in the crook of his arm, and they strolled around the room. If you recall, he continued easily, you had a troop of small visitors the other day. It is very kind of you to allow them to visit the garden whenever they want, by the way. And they saw certain gold-painted items drying in the summer house. Later, when they told me about their visit, they asked a lot of questions. Questions like, who was Cleopatra, Papa? And why would she wear snakes on her head and arms? Which was interrupted by, shh. It's supposed to be a secret, which received the indignant rejoinder, I'm not talking about the costume, just the lady. It's history. We're supposed to learn about history. She couldn't help smiling at his vivid recreation of the scene. And so you put two and two together and sent my valet out to scour London for a costume. You will be astonished to learn that uniforms for Roman generals are quite thin on the ground. He glanced around and murmured in a secretive tone, Don't tell a soul that this costume is actually Caesar's. She laughed, and feeling bold, she directed a pointed glance at his legs in the short tunic. Don't you find it rather drafty? That short skirt thing? Skirt thing? He leaned back in feigned horror. Would you call a proud Scotsman's kilt a skirt thing? She shrugged. If I didn't know what it was called, probably. This, he touched the red fabric, is called a tunic. He paused. And these dangly leather straps are called, I believe, dangly leather straps. The official term, you understand. Ah, I see, she said, attempting solemnity through a bubble of laughter. As for whether I find it drafty, I don't, here in this crowded ballroom, though I suspect it might be wise to eschew the more vigorous of the country dances. But on a windy day, I suspect these dangly leather straps would come in handy. Protection in more ways than one. They strolled on. Do ladies find them drafty? He asked. Dresses, I mean. Our dresses are much longer. So they are. 
But what about ladies who have not yet adopted the newfangled underwear our late lamented princess popularised? Alice felt her cheeks warm. Princess Charlotte had scandalised some and thrilled others when she'd adopted the wearing of drawers. Most ladies wore them these days, but not the old-fashioned types, or those whose parents were rigid moralists like Papa. The church considered the wearing of drawers by ladies as scandalous and immoral, drawers being items of clothes designed for men. Then there were people like Thaddeus, who subscribed to the medical opinion that drawers overheated ladies' female parts, and thus made it more difficult for them to conceive. Alice had worn her first ever pair of drawers to Thaddeus's funeral. I have no idea, she murmured. Deciding this conversation was heading into awkward areas. She still didn't know what he was wearing under his tunic and wasn't going to ask. And she wouldn't put it past him to ask whether she was wearing drawers or not. Alice glanced around in search of some distraction. Fretting about young Cassandra, he asked. That has to be a first. What is? She constantly worried about Lucy. Cleopatra, playing chaperone to a priestess of Apollo. He smiled. Don't worry, that young lady is more than capable of looking after herself. That's not the point she began. Looks like she's occupied with young Thornton. He nodded to one of the balconies at the back of the room, where Lucy and Gerald were standing, face to face, radiating tension. As they watched, Lucy flung up her hands and stormed off, leaving Gerald staring after, frustration evident in every line of his body. Oh dear, I'd better go and... A large hand closed around her forearm. No, leave them to it. They've been circling around each other forever. Best let them get it out in the open. Forever? He shrugged. It feels like that anyway. Now come, let me procure you some refreshment, and then we shall dance. Shall we? She said dryly. Shall we not, my queen? And why would that be? Have I stepped on your toes in some way? Do you fear my tunic flying up? Worried about my dangly bits? How she knew he was quirking an amused eyebrow at her under his golden helmet, she couldn't say. But she was sure he was. His dangly bits indeed. She wished she knew how to flirt back at him and maintain a witty, light-hearted conversation. But instead, all she could do was blush and feel hot and flustered, but was determined not to show it. A lady likes to be asked. Of course. He swept her an instant bow. My dear Queen Cleopatra, would you grant a humble soldier a dance? She looked around. I might. Where is he? He snorted. Minx. Very well, then. Will you grant me a dance? Yes. Which dance would you prefer? The first waltz. And the second. But I would take every dance. Except there is some stupid rule about limiting oneself to two dances with one lady. Alice decided not to argue. Lucy prowled through the crowd furiously, peering between the clumps of gorgeously attired people, looking for the culprit. Ha! There he was, the arrogant beast, in his sinfully tight black breeches and his glittery matador's coat, thinking he looked so fine, surrounded by ladies, all cooing and gushing. She marched up and poked him in the shoulder, hard. How dare you drive away my partners? 
Lord Thornton turned, rubbing his shoulder. I didn't. Aware of his circle of admirers avidly listening, she allowed him to steer her a short distance away. You didn't, eh? Then why didn't Mr. Frinton and Mr. Grimswade both come to me in the last half hour and withdraw from the dances they had reserved? He shrugged. How would I know? Liar, she snapped. They both told me it was at your request, as my guardian's nearest male relative. He didn't answer, didn't even look the slightest bit guilty. She poked him again, this time on the bead and sequin covered chest. Matador indeed. She could happily throw him under a bull right now. Understand me, Lord Thornroach. You have no authority over me. None whatsoever. And if you ever try to arrange my dances or any other aspect of my life again, what else was I to do? You refused me even one dance earlier. As is my right. I only took your waltzes. Such smugness. She wanted to hit him. They were my waltzes to give. He shrugged again. You don't have permission to waltz yet. So, I planned to sit them out with the partners of my choice. He snorted. You planned to sit one out with Corny Frinton? And what, talk? Mr. Frinton can talk. Sometimes. Anyway, what business is it of yours how we pass the time? I'd rather sit in total silence with Mr. Frinton than with an arrogant lord who thinks he knows everything. He cocked an unimpressed eyebrow. And what did you plan to do with Tarquin Grimswade? Listen to his poetry. I can assure you it's utter drivel. You introduced me to both those gentlemen as potential husbands. So what has changed? Or is it just a case of dog in the manger? Ha! He looked uncomfortable at that little jibe. The hypocrite. I simply wanted to talk to you. I've been trying to talk to you since that drive in the park, but you've been avoiding me. I can't imagine why, when you're such delightful company. And then tonight, when you refused me even one dance. He broke off as the opening bars of a waltz sounded. Let's go outside, he said, where I can say my piece. You can berate me in relative privacy, and then we'll be done. Cupping his hand around her elbow, he escorted her across the railed terrace and down into the courtyard. Wrought iron chairs and tables were arranged around the perimeter. Large potted palms and other plants had been clustered to give privacy to the tables, and multicoloured lanterns were hung here and there, giving the scene a softly foreign appearance. Everyone had made their way inside for the much-anticipated first waltz of the evening. The courtyard was deserted. Well, she turned and faced him, her arms folded across her chest. What is it you are burning to tell me? More disgraceful family secrets you have unearthed about me? More slanders against my character? More baseless accusations about how I'm plotting with my father to ruin Alice? No. He ran a finger around his tight matador collar and swallowed, I want to apologize. Lucy blinked. Apologize? It was the last thing she'd expected. You're right. I did suspect you of working with your father, of plotting against Alice and taking advantage of her kind nature. Did? He nodded. I don't think that now. You... You convinced me of your innocence that day in the park. She raised a cynical brow. So I told you I wasn't working with my father, and you believed me, just like that. He looked uncomfortable. More or less. 
she snorted. I don't believe you. You've uncovered more dirt on Papa, haven't you? Something that exonerates me. Isn't that it? A small nerve in his jaw twitched rhythmically. He eyed her grimly as he considered her question. More or less, I learned about your school experiences. Her stomach clenched. What school experiences would those be? Five. Or was it six? Different schools in how many years? And you never went home for the holidays. She lifted an indifferent shoulder, but a sour taste flooded her mouth. And then you were sent to live with some old German opera singer for a year, and then that French contest with the goose for another year, although whether you were a guest or a maidservant isn't clear. Because, depending on the contest's whim, she was both. I suppose Alice told you all this. It was a painful betrayal. But Lord Thornton was, after all, Alice's nephew. She supposed Alice's first loyalty must go to him. Even knowing that, it hurt, more than she would have imagined. Which made no sense. She didn't even know Alice until a few weeks ago. He shook his head. No, Alice is ridiculously close-mouthed about your background. All she will ever say is that you are her goddaughter, though how that came about is still a mystery to me. He eyed her speculatively and waited. Lucy pressed her lips together and looked away. She wasn't going to enlighten him. If Alice wanted to tell him, that was her right. A burst of laughter floated out from the ballroom. Strangely, it emphasized their isolation. You haven't lived with your father for more than a few days at a time, have you? Not since your mother died. Lucy gave him a flat look. So what if I have? What business is it of yours? Why are you so interested in my history? He frowned. Don't you know? Know what? Your father has been threatening Alice again. I'm trying to trace him. Lucy blanched. Threatening her? He nodded. I gather she didn't tell you. Not a word. She felt sick. How dare Papa threaten Alice? She was doing all she could to help Lucy find a man she could happily marry. She sank onto one of the chairs. As she had dreaded from the start, this latest scheme of Papa's would result not just in her own mortification and ruin, but in Alice's as well. And the terrible irony was that the very woman her father was blackmailing and threatening was trying to protect Lucy. She took a deep breath and hoped her voice sounded calm. What is he threatening her about? The furrow between Lord Thornton's brows deepened. About you, of course. He's complaining that Alice isn't doing what he asked, arranging your marriage to a member of the nobility. Apparently someone has been reporting back to him that you've only been seen accompanied by men with no title or any expectation of one. Her fingers turned into a fist. I've told him and told him that I hate the very idea of marrying a lord. She looked up at Lord Thornton and said bitterly, Alice was sure that what my father really wanted was for me to be secure and settled happily, that the title didn't really matter. She smacked her knee. Like a fool, I allowed her to persuade me. I should have known better. Papa is stubborn and foolishly pretentious. Being related to a title obviously matters far more to him than my happiness. Lord Thornton said nothing. Inside the ballroom, the last strains of the waltz finished. Lucy rose, feeling weary and disheartened. I have to go. 
my partner for the next dance will be looking for me. She took a few steps toward the terrace and the French doors leading into the ballroom, then turned back to face Lord Thornton. There's really no point in looking for my father. He's as slippery as an eel. I've never known how to contact him, and you won't be the only person trying to trace him, I'm sure. If you really want to help Alice and get Papa off her back, there's only one thing you can do. What's that? Find me a lord to marry. Any lord, I don't care which. He can be a hundred years old for all I care. His frown deepened. But you said yourself that it was the last thing you wanted. It is. Then why would you do such a thing? She looked at him. For Alice, of course. Why else? Alice is a darling, and I won't let Papa ruin her. The orchestra played the introductory bars of the waltz. Gentlemen led their partners onto the dance floor. Lord Tarrant held out his hand, his bare hand. Unlike English gentlemen, Roman generals wore no gloves at a ball. Neither did Egyptian queens. His hand was big and warm and strong. Hers felt cold. The sensation of skin against skin was thrilling. He held one of her hands in his and placed his other on the dip of her waist. She hesitated about where to place her hand and decided that the safest option was on his epaulets, or whatever Romans called them. The dance began, and he swept her into it with complete assurance. It was far from her first waltz, and though he was holding her with perfect propriety, he felt very close, much closer than she'd expected. All that bare, masculine skin. The scent of him wrapped around her the sharp tang of his shaving cologne, the earthy scent of leather, and beneath it all, his own distinctive clean masculine smell. Soap and man. This man. It was disconcerting to realize that she'd probably recognize him blindfolded, and in the dark, by his smell alone. His enticing masculine smell. He twirled her around, his big, powerful body dominating hers, the two of them moving as one to the music. She felt as though she were flying. It didn't feel safe. It was exhilarating. Inch by inch, he drew her closer. She felt the press of his thigh against hers. Heat sizzled through her, and it wasn't because of the dancing. She felt breathless, and it wasn't because of the dancing. Every inch of her was aware of him. The heat of his body, the powerful arms, his hand on her waist, his bare thighs beneath the short tunic. She clung to him, allowing herself to simply twirl and spin to the music as he willed it. She felt almost dizzy and yet sharply, gloriously alive. And they say the waltz is a scandalous dance, he murmured. Such nonsense. She glanced up at him. Didn't he feel it? His eyes danced with knowing laughter. His mouth curved, and he drew her even closer. He felt it. She closed her eyes, unable to meet the intensity in his, and gave herself up to the music, the dance, and the man. Eventually the waltz ended, and he led her to a seat. Thirsty? She nodded. Ratafia? Lemonade? Or champagne? She was already intoxicated, and she hadn't had a drop of wine. But she found herself saying, Champagne, please. She watched as he crossed the room in search of refreshments, his stride powerful and easy, 
his shoulders broad and almost bare. He was magnificently at home in his costume. She shivered, unable to drag her gaze off his long, muscular legs in that short red tunic. Waves of heat rippled through her. So this was desire. She'd felt pale echoes of it before, but nothing like this. Never anything this strong. It had been building between them, she realized, ever since that first kiss. No, even before that. Women generally find sexual congress pleasurable. She couldn't stop thinking about it. He disappeared into the crowd, and she sat and watched people enjoying themselves. The masks and costumes seemed to have encouraged more overt flirting, and some were definitely stepping very close to the line, if not over it, she added mentally, noticing one of the shepherdesses slide her hand into the folds of a Roman senator's toga. She blushed and looked away, feeling a little out of her depth. How many of the ladies here enjoyed sexual congress? The ones who flirted? Was that why she didn't know how to flirt? Because she had disliked the marriage bed? Oh, how could she be so old and still feel so ignorant? Lucy was better at this than she was, and Lucy was half her age. Lady Peplow, superb in her enormous turban, moved among her guests, talking and chatting, bringing people together and effortlessly putting them at ease. She was a superlative hostess and very popular. As Alice watched her, a thought sprang to mind. Perhaps a decade or so older than Alice, Penny was the youngest daughter. Lady Peplow was plump, casually elegant, and very sophisticated. But Alice had always found her comfortable to talk to. She wasn't an intimate friend, but she had shown a great deal of kindness to both Alice and Lucy. She would surely not mock Alice for her ignorance and lack of sophistication. Alice waited until Lady Peplow began to move from one group to the next. She hurried across the floor and intercepted her. Lady Peplow, she began, suddenly breathless. Lady Peplow's brows rose. Is there something the matter, my dear? No, no, it's a lovely party. It's just, may I call on you tomorrow? There is something particular I would like to discuss with you. She was blushing, she knew. Of course, only make it later in the day. Say, five o'clock. I intend to sleep very late tomorrow. Oh, yes, sorry, I didn't think. Would you prefer me to come the following day? She smiled. No, I can see it's something that won't wait. It will, of course, it's just... A Lady Peplow patted her hand. Tomorrow at five will suit me very well, Lady Charlton. You can explain it all then, in complete privacy. She glanced over Alice's shoulder. Now, there's a handsome Roman general waiting with a glass of champagne for you. Better go and relieve him of it before some other lady snaps it and him up. He's a delicious sight in that costume, barely there as it is. I do like a man with a good pair of legs, don't you? And as for those gloriously muscular upper arms, she fanned herself briefly, winked at Alice, and glided away. It was time for the second waltz of the evening. Lucy watched as Alice stepped onto the floor with Lord Tarrant. Hers weren't the only eyes that watched their progress with speculative interest. They made a handsome couple. 
Lucy glanced around the ballroom. Which of these extravagantly dressed people was reporting back to her father? The thought made her simultaneously furious and sick. The sooner she married some lord, the sooner this whole ghastly thing would be over. Lord Thornton appeared at her elbow. Shall we sit this one out in the courtyard, Miss Bamber? It was very warm now in the ballroom, with all the lanterns and candles burning, and the press of overheated bodies, so she nodded. Outside it was blissfully cool, the night air fresh with a soft breeze stirring the leaves overhead. You're not cold, are you? Lord Thornton asked. He gestured to his matador's jacket with a wry smile. I'd offer to give you my coat, but I doubt I can remove it. It took all my valet's efforts to get it on. Do you have a shawl I could fetch? Lucy shook her head. I'm quite comfortable, thank you. It wasn't quite a lie. She wasn't cold, but something about sitting out here alone with Lord Thornton, not to mention the intense way he kept looking at her, made her feel a little on edge. As for his coat being tight, his whole outfit, especially his breeches, outlined his lithe, lean, muscular form almost indecently. She could hardly drag her eyes away. They sat for a few moments in silence, listening to the music floating from the ballroom. Then he said abruptly, Did you mean what you said about marrying a lord? Any lord? She looked at him in surprise. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. She didn't see any other way out of the fix Papa had trapped her in. Even an old man? She nodded. The very idea appalled her. But even worse was the knowledge that if she didn't, her father would ruin Alice. Besides, she might not have to endure an old man for long, which was a horrid thing to think. What about a young man? She shrugged. As long as he's titled, it makes no difference. Now can we stop talking about it, please? I'd rather just enjoy the night and keep these depressing realities for the cold light of day. The moon was out, hazy, lopsided and serene. The scent of flowers perfumed the air, and the music only added to the magic. You like this music, don't you? He said after a moment. Doesn't everyone? He gestured to her sandaled feet. Your feet are dying to dance. They're tapping along in time with the music. I like those gold toenails, by the way. Dashing as well as pretty. He rose to his feet. Shall we dance? She blinked at the unexpected request. But I can't. You can't waltz, or you don't have permission. I know how to waltz, of course, though I've never danced it in public. But I don't have permission. For some reason, I'm only allowed to waltz after one of the patronesses of Almax gives me permission. Seems ridiculous to me, but that's what I was told. I see, and that's why you were prepared to sit them out in wallflowery boredom with Messrs. Frinton and Grimswade. Both gentlemen to whom you introduced me, she reminded him acidly. Then let me atone. He held out his hand. Will you do me the honour of dancing this waltz with me, Miss Bamber? She hesitated and looked around. The courtyard was still deserted, as was the terrace overlooking it. Nobody will see, he said, his voice low and deep. Come on, you know you want to. Very well. She rose and took his hand. It was warm and firm. No gloves on matadors or priestesses. His other arm wrapped around her waist. 
He danced well, swirling her around with grace and assurance. Dancing alone in the courtyard, in the moonlight, with the lanterns creating pools of light among the shadows, it felt strangely intimate, as if they were alone, instead of only a few yards away from the loud, colourful throng inside. Too intimate. She could smell his cologne, feel his breath against her hair. She was achingly aware of how his costume hugged every line of his lean, lithe body, and that her costume was too loose, too floaty and insubstantial and that she was pressing up against him in a way that would not be approved of in polite circles. She had to break this feeling of intensity. Conversation, that was the thing. What made you dress as a matador? she asked. He shrugged infinitesimally. There was a costume in the shop, and I liked it. I saw several bullfights in Spain. Weren't they very terrible? He smiled. For the bull, yes, but very exciting to watch. She shuddered. I could never watch such a thing. You were in Spain for the war, weren't you? Yes. After a moment, he added, I'd like to go back there one day, now that peace has come. It's a fascinating country. You want to travel again? It surprised her. Most Englishmen she'd met, admittedly not all that many, seemed to dislike the idea of foreign travel. He appeared to think it over, then gave a decisive nod as if he'd just made up his mind. Yes, I do. I have a mind to join the diplomatic service. Really? Don't you have responsibilities here? I mean, isn't there an estate or something you're supposed to look after? Not that she knew anything about a nobleman's duties. My father controls all that. There's nothing for me here. They circled the courtyard again, and he added, What about you? If you had the opportunity to travel, would you take it? In a heartbeat. Lucy thought, but it was not to be. I'm marrying a lordly octogenarian, remember? She said lightly. I doubt I'll get to travel. About that, I think I have the solution to your problem. She looked up at him. Oh, yes? For a minute or two, he said nothing, just twirled her around in the moonlight. Then just as she was sure he wasn't going to speak, he cleared his throat and said, Become betrothed to me. She dropped his hand and stepped away. What? No, marry you. He held up his hands pacifically. Calm down. I didn't say marry me. I said become betrothed. No, that's ridic... Hear me out. You don't want to marry a lord, isn't that right? Yes, but... But, in order to save Alice from whatever your father has threatened her with, he needs to believe you are going to marry a lord. She frowned. Yes. A formal betrothal would convince him, would it not? If it was officially announced in the Morning Post and the Gazette and the bands called in St. George's, Hanover Square. She thought about it. If Papa believed it was a done deal, and he probably would, with it being all formal and official, it could just possibly work. Though he did say he'd come to her wedding. Maybe. Then you and I will announce our betrothal. She shook her head. You can't. You don't want to marry me. Don't worry. We can call it off as soon as Alice gets those letters back from your father. Actually, you will call it off. 
A gentleman cannot honorably withdraw once the announcement has been made. Why not? A gentleman cannot break his word, she snorted. Rubbish. Men break their word all the time. Perhaps, but not if they're gentlemen. I should have said a gentleman cannot honorably break his word. A gentleman's promise, his word of honor, is the foundation of his status as a gentleman. Seeing her skepticism, he continued, That's why gambling debts between gentlemen are called debts of honor, and are paid before any other kind of debt. It's also why being caught cheating at cards will result in a gentleman being expelled from his club, disgraced in society, and in some cases banished by their family to another country. What about ladies? Isn't a lady's word of honour just as important? No, ladies aren't expected to keep promises. Being the weaker sex, it is a woman's prerogative to change her mind. She bristled. She hated that term, the weaker sex. But she'd struggled with enough lustful lords to know it was true enough, physically at least. It had been her brains and agility that had kept her safe, not her physical strength. Not to mention her willingness to kick a man in his cods, a strategy taught to her by the father, planning his absence. You're saying that women have no sense of honour? Yet, yeah, no, well, not exactly. It's just girls are raised differently and not taught about... I mean, there's no blame. He was getting more and more tangled. It's not what I believe, but it is how the world sees it. The idea that only she could call off the betrothal because women were regarded as indecisive ninny hammers was insulting. But she didn't have to like it. There were many aspects of society she didn't like. So, what you're saying is that once our betrothal is announced, I can call it off, but you can't. Exactly. There was a short silence while she thought it over. You'd be taking a big risk, wouldn't you? What if I didn't call it off? I'd be relying on your sense of honour. His eyes glinted with wry humour. Not to mention your well-known antipathy to marrying a lord. This suggestion of his, coming out of the blue on the one hand seemed like a clear and simple solution. On the other, it worried her. All the time she'd known Lord Thornton, they'd been at daggers drawn. But tonight, not only had he gone out of his way to apologize, and she was sure that didn't come easily to a man of his pride, now he was proposing. All right, so it was only a pretend betrothal. But just days ago, he'd been certain she was in league with her blackmailing father. And now, he was relying on her so-called honor not to trap him into marriage. She didn't trust such an instant about face. Why would you do such a thing? Be willing to put yourself in my hands. He met her gaze squarely. Aunt Alice was very good to me as a child. She's my favorite relative. My parents have done nothing to help her since her husband died. Now she's in trouble, and I'm determined to help her however I can. He sounded sincere. She was inclined to believe him, almost. The idea was tempting. A public betrothal to a viscount, who was also heir to an earldom, might just bring Papa out of the woodwork and save Alice from any further distress. And you would trust me to break the betrothal? I would, but I should also warn you that if you did, there might be unpleasant repercussions for you.
You'd need to be prepared for that. She knew it. Because people would be furious that a girl of no background had played fast and loose with the son of an earl. I don't care. I never set out to hook a husband in the first place. It was all Papa's idea. He frowned. The idea of social disgrace doesn't worry you. She shrugged. They're not my people. She'd never belonged anywhere. So being pushed out of the ton would be nothing new. She'd miss Alice, though, and Lord Tarrant's little girls, and Penny Peplo, and some of the other friends she'd made. Thinking about it, it occurred to her that she'd made more friends than she'd realized. Oh, well, it was a risk she'd have to take. No matter what society believed, Women did have honour, and she owed it to Alice to free her from Papa's entrapment. Emerging from her reflections, she looked up to see Lord Thornton regarding her with a curious expression. Who are your people? Gypsies, who do you think? She had no people, only Papa. He eyed her shrewdly, but all he said was, so, do you agree that a false betrothal is the solution to our problems? She took a deep breath. All right, I'll do it. And there's no need to worry. I promise you that I won't hold you to it. If you can believe the promises of a blackmailer's daughter, that is. I have every faith in your honor, he said softly and for some reason she felt herself tearing up. She turned away, blinking furiously. He went on in a brisk voice. I'll put notices in the Morning Post and the Gazette. Shall we keep it quiet until then, or would you like me to arrange an announcement tonight, at this ball? His mother was at the ball, Lucy recalled. She'd be bound to make a hurried fuss, a public fuss, and she'd blame Alice. No, let's keep it secret until the announcement in the papers. He nodded. Just don't tell Alice it's a false betrothal. But I'm very fond of Alice, but she's a hopeless liar. She'd hate having to keep it a secret, and she'd probably botch it, which would upset her very much. He was right. Very well she agreed. We'll tell nobody the betrothal is a stratagem. Inside the ballroom, the waltz was just finishing. I'd better go in, she said, rising to her feet. I promised Mr. Grimswade I'd take supper with him. Just one more thing. Lord Thornton reached out and detained her with a light touch. This agreement between us, there won't be any kind of document to sign. No, of course not. So we'd better seal it in the time-honoured way. What time-honoured... Mm. His mouth came down on hers, firm, warm and possessive. She was so surprised she couldn't move or even think. She gasped and his tongue entered her mouth, hot, spicy, and demanding. By the time her brain had recovered from the shock, her body was pressing itself against him. Her arms were twined around his neck, and she was kissing him back. He cupped her face in his hands, angling her mouth the better to explore her, to taste her. Heat streaked through her in waves, pooling deep within her body. Without warning, he released her abruptly. She staggered back, struggling to gather her scrambled wits. It wasn't the first time she'd been kissed, but she'd never experienced anything like... like that. Her whole body was tingling. She was panting as if she'd run a mile instead of standing in a secluded corner. His chest was heaving too, she noticed. At least, she wasn't the only one. Had he felt what she did? 
there was no way of knowing. His eyes were in shadow, dark, intense and unreadable. Her gaze dropped to the firm, unsmiling, masculine mouth. Who knew that he could kiss like that? As the silence between them stretched, broken only by their heavy breathing and the distant hum of people talking in the ballroom, all Lucy's old insecurities came surging to the fore. Before tonight, even an hour ago, she would have sworn this man, this lord, disliked her. Only days ago he'd accused her of plotting against Alice. Then suddenly, tonight, he was talking false betrothals and trusting her. And now this, a kiss too far. Striving to sound calm and unflustered, she said, What was that about? He said coolly, as if the answer were obvious, As I said, it's a time-honoured way of sealing an agreement. His words, like a dash of cold water, brought her to her senses. This was what lords did. Take what they felt like. No care for anyone else. Ha! So you kiss your horse coper like that when you buy a horse, do you? Or your wine merchant when he agrees to deliver wine? Of course not. Men usually shake hands on an agreement. But ladies? He grinned, a purely wicked grin. Ladies don't shake hands with gentlemen, do they? So what else was I to do? She couldn't think of a response. Truth to tell, she was still dazzled by the effects of his kiss. She tried for a withering look, but he stood there, looking smug, handsome, and annoyingly unwithered. The buzz of conversation inside suddenly rose. Laughter and exclamations floated out onto the night air. The unmasking has begun, he said. I'll go inside first. Wouldn't do for us both to appear together, especially with you looking as though you've just been thoroughly kissed. She rubbed at her mouth as if he'd somehow branded her. What did thoroughly kissed look like anyway? She pressed her hands against her hot cheeks to cool them. At the steps, leading up to the ballroom, he turned and looked back. And by the way, that permission to waltz thing, I'm fairly sure it applies only to Almax, not at a private ball. Now you tell me, she began wrathfully, but he was gone. She sat back down, not yet ready to return to the ballroom and play her part. Some people had come out onto the terrace to cool down after the dance, but most would be going in to supper. She was betrothed to Lord Thornton. It was the last thing she'd expected. No, the kiss was the last thing she'd expected. Why had he done it? She removed her mask, ran her hands lightly over her hair and the circlet of vines, and checked the rest of her costume. She appeared to have lost a few leaves, but other than that, everything seemed quite intact. Taking a few deep, steadying breaths, Lucy returned to the ballroom. Chapter 13 Shortly after five the following day, Alice went to keep her appointment with Lady Peplow. She was absurdly nervous. She'd arranged for Lucy to walk in the park with Penny Peplow while Alice was visiting Lady Peplow. It would ensure their privacy. The girls headed off with a footman and maid in attendance, and Alice was shown into the drawing room. Nobody seeing this part of the house would imagine a grand ball had been held there the previous evening. Everything was immaculate. The servants must have been working since before dawn. 
Lady Peplow was seated in the bow window. She patted a chair in a welcoming gesture. Good afternoon, Lady Charlton. I'm just watching our girls heading off to the park and wishing I had half their energy. It's going to take me days to recover from the ball, but they bounce right back, bless them. Alice forced a smile. Her stomach was a tight knot. I know how you feel. Nonsense. You're still young yourself. That peach walking dress really suits Lucy, doesn't it? I do so like it when young girls wear colours instead of the endless white so many affect. Tea and biscuits were brought in, and while they drank and ate, or rather, Lady Peplow drank and ate, Alice was too nervous. They chatted about the ball and the costumes and how much everyone had enjoyed it. Alice did her best, all the while nerving herself to broach the dreaded subject. Finally, it simply burst from her. I need to ask you a personal question, Lady Peplow. Very personal, I mean. The older woman gave her a shrewd glance and set down her teacup. Of course, she added with a smile. I might not answer it, but I promise I will respect her confidence. That would suffice. It's about the, the marriage bed. Lady Peplow's elegantly plucked brows rose. So you can prepare Lucy, I presume. But surely, after your marriage, it's not the uh, mechanics I'm asking about. It's... She broke off, feeling her cheeks heat. She recalled Lord Tarrant's words. Did you ever find it... Pleasant, pleasurable, I mean, because I'm told most women, she couldn't finish. It was too humiliating. There was a short silence. Lady Peplow's brows knotted, and she took a deep breath. I never did like that husband of yours, she said briskly. Are you saying that you never... Alice, face aflame, shook her head. The selfish pig! The older lady reached out and patted Alice on the hand. Well, thank goodness it's not too late to learn. Alice blinked. But I'll be forty in a few years. Lady Peplow chuckled. And I'll be sixty. But the good news, my dear is that it only gets better with age and experience. Better? Alice struggled to hide her amazement. It had never occurred to her that older ladies might still do that, even though there was no chance of children. I married young, and for love, Lady Peplow began. She glanced at the overmantel, where a family portrait hung. Alice followed her gaze. Lord Peplow was a nondescript-looking man of medium height. These days he was balding and with a paunch, but Alice had seen the fond way his wife looked at him. I was just eighteen, and Peplow had just turned one and twenty. She sighed reminiscently. We were both so innocent. My mother had prepared me for my wedding night by telling me to do as my husband bid me. And Peplow, well, his papa had died when he was twelve, and he'd never been one of those boys who chased after women. We'd grown up together, you see. She chuckled. A pair of ignorant virgins we were. Oh, we fumbled around and managed to get the deed done. But it was awkward and uncomfortable, and quite ridiculously strange. But we both assumed that was how it was done, so we persisted. She took a sip of tea, grimaced, and rang for a fresh pot. 
But we both had the feeling that there ought to be something more. I mean, what the poets go on about was nothing like what we were finding. And we were in love. She glanced at Alice. And then Peplo had the great good sense to seek out a courtesan. Alice gasped. A retired one? Lady Peplo hastened to assure her. You don't think I'd let him actually do anything with another woman, do you? She laughed. She was a good deal older, but a woman of great experience, and she explained to him just exactly how things worked and what he should do to make it better, and even what I should do. Courtesans know all about how to pleasure men, some of them the most surprising things. I don't think anyone ever asks them how to please a woman, but she was happy to instruct my darling Peplo. And that made the experience more pleasant. Pleasant? She regarded Alice sympathetically. That husband of yours really deserved a horsewhipping. No, my dear, pleasant is far too bland a word. It became glorious, sometimes earthy, sometimes raw, sometimes sublime, and always splendid. A true physical expression of Peplo's and my love for each other. Alice tried to swallow. A lump had formed in her throat. She half wanted to cry, which made no sense to her. The fresh tea arrived, and while Alice poured and added milk and stirred in a sugar lump, she managed to get control of her emotions. Lady Peplo drank some tea, set her cup down, and sat back. So, my dear, now that you know, what are you going to do? Do? To experience for yourself some of the physical splendor your abominable husband denied you, of course. Alice picked up her teacup, unable to think of an answer. What was she going to do? She had no idea. I've noticed Lord Tarrant has a certain gleam in his eye whenever he looks at you. I'll be bound a fine strapping lad like that will know how to introduce a woman to the bliss of the bedchamber. Alice almost choked on a mouthful of tea. No, no, you have it wrong. I have no intention of... of... Discovering what it's all about? Nonsense. For nearly twenty years you did your duty to a selfish, undeserving bully. And now it's time you paid attention to your own needs and desires. Or allowed someone else to. Get that gal of yours fired off in style, and then see to your own pleasure and satisfaction. She sipped her tea and eyed Alice over the rim of her teacup. If you don't, you'll spend the rest of your life wondering. It took Alice a whole day and night to make up her mind. Lady Peplow's words kept coming back to haunt her. If you don't, you'll spend the rest of your life wondering. She was still far from convinced that she could experience anything like the pleasure Lady Peplo had described. After all, Thaddeus had kept the same mistress for twenty years, and he'd obviously been satisfied with her responses in bed, and presumably she with his. It seemed clear to Alice that she'd been the one lacking. And if that were the case... How dreadful would it be to experience it all again after she married Lord Tarrant? James. The thought of his gradual disillusion, his growing disappointment in her, was more than she could bear.
one unsatisfied, embittered husband was enough for a lifetime. Oh, James was no bully, as Thaddeus had been. But any man surely would come to resent a wife who was cold in bed. But to spend the rest of her life wondering, that was no solution to her problem. James had offered her the prospect of bliss, and she wasn't even talking about the bedroom. Companionship, and the chance to be mother to three delightful little girls. All her girlhood dreams revived. Well, most of them. One had to cut one's coat to fit the cloth. Half a loaf and all that. Not that James was half of anything. The way he made her feel, that lurking twinkle in his eye. He could meet her gaze, even in a room full of other people, and make her feel as though just the two of them were present. The way he so often seemed to understand more than she was saying, and accept whatever it revealed about her. He could even make her laugh when she was feeling down and despondent. Only a few weeks ago, she'd been facing a lonely future, relishing the thought of her freedom, but unsure about what she wanted to do with it. And then, James. He was offering marriage, family and companionship. Of course he was being practical. He wanted a mother for his girls. What widower wouldn't? And if her feelings for him were stronger than his for her, did that really matter? How cowardly and foolish to reject all that because she believed she couldn't satisfy him in the bedroom. Surely it would be better to find out once and for all. What did she have to lose? It went against the habit of a lifetime to consider what she was considering. But she could see no other solution. This endless dithering was driving her crazy. With that thought in mind, she sat down and penned a note to Lord Tarrant, asking him to call on her at his earliest convenience. He came the following morning, bringing with him the three little girls and their nanny. I hope you don't mind my bringing the girls, he said, once the chaos of their arrival had passed. They'd already been asking, could they visit you and Miss Bamber and the garden again? And Nanny McCubbin seems to have found a bosom friend in Mrs. Tweed, and it's perfectly all right, she assured him. After a hasty greeting, the girls had rushed out to join Lucy in the garden, and their nanny had headed off to the kitchen for a cup of tea. As I said before, they're welcome at any time. Lucy and I love having the girls visit, and Mrs. Tweed enjoys Mrs. McCubbin's company. She even lets Mrs. McCubbin help her in the kitchen, a great and rarely bestowed honour, I'll have you know. You're very kind. My own house has very little garden. It's just a courtyard with a couple of aspidistras and a few kitchen herbs, so the girls see your garden as some kind of paradise. It is a kind of paradise, and I'm very happy to share it. Tell me, how did you manage to pry Debo away from her cat? Separate Debo and Mittens, he said in mock horror. Perish the thought. Then in response to her raised brow, he added, Can't be done, I'm afraid. Debo will go nowhere without her cat. But, oh, she's here all right. With the kitten, which you might not have noticed was travelling as an indignant bulge under her coat, Mittens having a strong dislike of the carriage. But if she lets it out in the garden, Alice had visions of the kitten disappearing forever. Did I ever explain what a superlative nanny Nanny McCubbin is? She made a harness for Mittens, 
and then told Debo that she'd never managed to teach the cat to wear it, that cats cannot be trained. Oh, how clever. Of course, Debo rose to the challenge. Indeed, she did, and it was a battle of wills that lasted several days and entertained us all. But now Mittens is out in your garden, wearing an elegant red harness, as if to the manner born. Debo not having sufficient confidence in the manners of that ginger Tom toward visiting kittens. Alice laughed. Now, what was it you wanted to speak to me about? The bottom dropped out of Alice's stomach. He always did this to her made her forget about whatever it was she'd been worrying about. Now, all her early attention returned with a vengeance. Uh, she tried to swallow. There was a giant lump in her throat. His brows rose. Yes. I've been thinking. He inclined his head and waited. About? She could feel her cheeks heating. About? Um, his euphemism for bedroom activities. She nodded. Yes, I've decided to, to try it. Again, I mean, with you. There, she'd said it. She waited for his reaction, her stomach hollow and her pulse racing. His eyes darkened. His brows drew together in a slow frown. He didn't say a word. Did he not understand? Had she not been clear enough? Lord knew her nerves were playing havoc, and she might not have made her meaning plain. She took a deep breath. I am willing to become your mistress. The furrow between his brows deepened. My mistress, he repeated in a flat voice. Yes. I see, he said after another long pause. She waited, fidgeting nervously with the fabric of her skirt. The longer the silence stretched, the more she knew she'd made a terrible mistake. But she couldn't unsay the words. And even though she felt as if she might throw up at any minute, she wasn't going to back down from her decision. After an age, he cleared his throat. So, you won't be my wife, but you will be my mistress. Put like that, it sounded terrible, bald and blunt and ugly and scandalous. But it was how she felt. Yes, she croaked. Even though you dislike, um. I always disliked it with my husband, she swallowed again. But perhaps, his frown darkened. You're thinking that perhaps it might be different with me. She nodded, her cheeks aflame. You did say as much she reminded him, turn um into yum. I did, didn't I? Well then, he rose abruptly, his expression grim. I'm going to have to think about this. I will return in an hour to collect my children. I'll give you my answer then. He strode from the room. Alice stared at the empty doorway, confused by his reaction. She thought he'd be pleased, thought he'd jump at the chance, but he seemed neither pleased nor eager. The drawing room felt chilly. Childish laughter floated in from the garden. Was he shocked by her forwardness? It was hard to tell but the way he'd so abruptly departed, without either accepting or rejecting her proposition, must tell her something. Though what? She smoothed the fabric of her skirt and frowned. It was a mass of wrinkles. 
She'd made a mess of it, twisting and crushing it without thinking. Nerves. Did he think her offer revealed her as a strumpet? Many men would think so. But Alice refused to be shamed. It was her body to offer. She was a free agent now, and owed fidelity to no one. If he condemned her for it, well, she would be disappointed in him. More than disappointed if she was honest with herself. But she wouldn't go back on her offer, nor would she apologize. Lady Peplow was right. It was time Alice discovered for herself what most other women found in the activities of the bedchamber. She wasn't prepared to spend the rest of her life wondering. James strode away from Alice's house, oblivious of where he was going. He was as tense as a wound spring. I am willing to become your mistress. He pounded along the pavement, his fists clenched in hard knots, wanting to punch somebody. No, not somebody. Her thrice damned arse of a husband. Her face haunted him, so taut and pale when he'd arrived, then later blushing and hesitant, offering herself as if she were, he didn't know what. All he knew was that he was boiling with frustrated rage at what had been done to this sweet and giving woman. He wanted to marry her with all honor, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. She thought she had to debauch herself first. The hesitation in her eyes, the uncertainty, the courage it must have taken after refusing his offer of marriage to then offer her body to lie down with him in an act she was sure she would loathe. Had loathed, for eighteen long, blasted years. And she didn't even know how to kiss. That bastard. There were times when James caught glimpses of the hopeful young girl that she must once have been. All innocence and bright expectation. Before her pig of a husband had driven all the youthful confidence out of her. But he hadn't managed to kill off her sweetness. Alice had every right to be bitter, but there wasn't a trace of bitterness in her. If only James had met her back then, before she'd married that oaf, he would have married her. No, because then he wouldn't have met and married Selina, which he could never regret, and they wouldn't have had their precious girls. But someone should have protected her from marriage to such an uncaring swine. He added her father to the list of dead men he itched to pound to a pulp. The man had been more interested in saving souls of unknown and probably unwilling denizens than the welfare of his only daughter. Crossing a road, he paused to let a wagon rumble past and realized where he was. Turning a sharp right, he headed down Bond Street to number 13, where he could get exactly what he needed. A furious bout of fisticuffs to work off his anger. Entering Jackson's boxing saloon, he encountered the great man himself who bowed, Lord Tarrant. How may I help you? I need to go a few rounds with one of your men, Jackson. But I'll warn you now, I'm in a foul mood and need to pound on someone. Jackson chuckled and said with dry irony, You can certainly try. Follow me, my lord. Forty minutes later, James was stripped to the waist, sluicing his heated body down with cold water. Several fast and furious bouts with one of Jackson's best men had certainly loosened some of the fierce coils of anger inside him. He was feeling calmer and more clear-headed, and not to mention bruised and aching, but in a good way. 
He'd been a fool to walk out on her like that. More than a fool, an insensitive brute. What must she be thinking? At great cost to herself, she'd offered him a very precious, deeply personal gift. And what had he done? Walked out on her, saying he needed to think it over. Of course he didn't need to think it over. Alice was his. She just didn't know it yet. And if she needed first to prove to herself, or rather, if she needed him to prove to her that the marriage bed need not be something to be endured, he would do it. With pleasure. On the way back from Jackson's, he paused by a little flower girl selling violets and bought a posy. Alice deserved better, of course, but right now he needed to get back to her as quickly as possible and make up for the way he bungled things. He found her out in the garden with his daughters and Lucy. They were gathered around a pair of easels. Look, Papa! Miss Bamber painted us a painting, Judy exclaimed. But James only had eyes for Alice. I'm sorry I rushed off like that, he told her quietly and handed her the violets. She thanked him, raised the posy to her face and inhaled the scent. He couldn't see her eyes, couldn't work out what she was thinking. Was she upset with him for rushing off like that? She had every right to be. She did one of me and mittens, too, Debo said. See? It looks just like us. Very nice, he said and nodded vaguely at Miss Bamber. Lena painted one, too, Alice said, and James gave up. He couldn't possibly discuss with her what he needed to discuss. Not here, with his daughters clamouring for his attention. He turned to look at Miss Bamber's paintings, and his jaw dropped. He'd expected some kind of amateurish schoolgirl painting, but what he saw took his breath away. The main painting was an ink and watercolour of the big tree that grew in the centre of the garden, as lifelike as if it were growing from the paper. Can you see us, Papa? Judy pointed excitedly. Look, there we all are. Half hidden by the leaves of the tree and looking slightly fey, as if they were part of the tree, six faces peeped out. Judy, Lena, Debo, Alice, Lucy and himself. It was a commemoration of the great tree-climbing adventure. There was even a feline-shaped ginger smear that vividly portrayed an escaping cat. He examined the tree painting carefully, then the one of Debo and her cat, then several others of the garden, and one of Judy staring pensively up into the tree with an expression that made him want to pick his daughter up and hug her. He turned to Miss Bamber, but these paintings are marvellous, Miss Bamber. I had no idea you were this talented. Lucy looked down, blushing. None of us did, Alice said. She's kept it a secret up to now, but Lena winkled it out of her. Lena smiled proudly. Miss Bamber is teaching me how to paint and draw, Papa. See? She produced a pad filled with small sketches and paintings, and he slowly turned over page after page, examining each with solemn attention. They're very good for a girl her age, Lucy Bamber said quickly. There was an edge of defensiveness in her voice. Did she think he was going to dismiss his small daughter's efforts? She did, he saw, as others had done to her in the past. They are very good, he agreed gently. Lena has always loved to draw, and I'm very grateful you've helped and encouraged her. Even when she was very small, 
she used to draw pictures on the letters Judy wrote to me. Judy wrote me all the news, and Lena brought it to life in pictures. His two older daughters looked at him in surprise. You remember? Judy asked. Remember? I've kept every last one of those precious letters. All the years I was away at war, they were all I had of you girls. I'll show you them when we go home. He turned back to Lucy. Miss Bemba, may I buy that painting of us all in the tree? No, you may not, she dimpled. I've already given it to Lena. Buy the one of me and mittens, papa, Debo demanded. And the one of me, Judy added. Please. Before he could ask, Lucy tore both paintings off the pad and handed them to him. Please, it's my pleasure, she said when he started to argue. I don't usually show anyone my work. You, she gestured to the small group around her, are the first in a long time. I hope we won't be the last, he said seriously. You have a real talent. I'm going to have these framed. Girls, my lady, Miss Bamber, a Scottish voice called. Nanny McBride appeared around a corner. Time to come in for luncheon. There's a nice hot soup, so come along. You don't want it to go cold. And wash your hands, she called after them as the girls ran ahead. I'll be in in a few minutes. Lucy said, I'll just pack up my things. Then Lady Charlton and I will go ahead and warn Cook, James said before Alice could offer to help. He held out his arm, and after a moment's hesitation, she took it. I'm sorry I rushed off like that before, he said once they were out of earshot. I hope I didn't upset you. Not at all, her voice was cool. You took me by surprise. So I gathered. He stopped, and taking both her hands in his, faced her. Alice, you did me a great honor this morning, offering me the priceless gift of your trust. I'm a clumsy oaf, and I'm sorry if I offended you in any way. If your offer is still open... I would be privileged to accept it. He held his breath as she gazed up at him. He was drowning in those sea-blue eyes of hers. After what felt like an age, she said, I'm glad. They resumed their walk back to Alice's house. So, what do we do now? She asked. I'll make all the arrangements. What arrangements? She asked, adding, I've never done this before, so I'm unaware of the conventions. There are no conventions in our case, he said. We'll make it up as we go along. She gave him a sideways glance. You mean you've never had a mistress before? No. Oh, I thought all men had them. Not all men. Then what are these arrangements you're talking of? Do you plan to take me to your bed here, then? She gasped, with Lucy in the room above me, and the Tweeds and Mary knowing of course not. He smiled, and presumably you wouldn't want to come to my bed, with my daughters sleeping upstairs, and I'll warn you now. They have a tendency to jump on me in bed at appalling hours of the morning, generally with a cat in tow. She laughed, oh dear, and do you sneeze? Invariably. They'd reached her back gate, and he held it open for her. So, my dear Alice, will you agree to leave the arrangements to me? I suppose I must, she hesitated. Do you know, uh, when? I'll let you know. Lucy, 
having gone to sleep with her windows open, was woken early by the twittering of the birds outside. She lay there a few moments, snuggling dreamily in the warmth and comfort of her bed, contemplating the day ahead, when suddenly she remembered, and sat straight up. The announcement would be in the papers this morning. She was, officially, if not actually, betrothed to Gerald, Lord Thornton, a proper lord. Across London, people would be seeing the announcement about herself, plain Lucy Bamber and Lord Thornton. It was a strange thought. With any luck, Papa would be one of them, reading the newspaper announcement at this very minute. Well, soon, he was not an early riser, and come around here to give Alice back her letters. When would Alice see it? It was her habit to drink a cup of chocolate and glance through the newspapers before dressing and coming down to breakfast. Hasty footsteps sounded in the hallway outside. Alice. She knocked on the door and entered, waving her copy of the morning post. Lucy, the strangest thing. Someone has put a notice in the paper announcing a betrothal between you and my nephew, Gerald. I don't know how it happened. It's clearly a mistake, and it's not a mistake. We'll have to get it withdrawn. What did you say? I said it's not a mistake. Alice blinked. It's not? No, Gerald put the notice in yesterday. You're engaged to my nephew, Gerald? Lucy nodded. Alice flew across the room and embraced Lucy. Oh, my dear girl, that's marvellous. I'm so happy for you. She sat down on Lucy's bed, tossing the newspaper aside. Now, tell me all about it. How did this happen? When did it happen? I must confess, you've completely taken me by surprise. I thought you two were at daggers drawn. Beaming expectantly at Lucy, Alice folded her hands and waited for the details of the romance to be revealed. Lucy shrugged uncomfortably. Alice had every right to feel put out at not being informed. Both of Lucy's other suitors had asked Alice's permission before proposing. And here, she and Gerald had gone ahead and announced it in the papers without informing anyone. Of course, they were of age and had the right to make their own plans. But still, Alice had to feel a little hurt. And yet here she was, smiling so kindly at the girl who was deceiving her and who was preparing to deceive her even further. Lucy desperately wanted to let Alice in on the plot, but Gerald was right. Alice was a hopeless liar. It was at the Peplo Ball, she began. Gerald took over the spots where I'd arranged to sit out the waltzes. Is that right, by the way? I can't waltz anywhere until I have been approved to waltz at Almax. Oh, who cares about that? He took over your spots. Yes, he told Mr. Frinton and Mr. Grimswade that as acting head of your family, he had the right to commandeer them. Alice gasped and then laughed. Head of my family indeed. What nonsense. But how wonderfully masterful and romantic. How arrogant, you mean. I was furious. Alice chuckled, clearly not believing her. What happened next? He took me out into the courtyard and we talked. Having no wish to be questioned on the subject of their conversation, she hastily went on. And later he did it again, during the second waltz. Only then he invited me to dance, out in the courtyard. It's all right, we were quite alone and nobody saw us. But about that Almack question, 
Oh, a secret waltz in the moonlight. I would never have guessed Gerald had such romance in him. No wonder you were bowled over. Lucy smiled weakly. It might sound romantic. And in her secret heart, she had to admit that she had found it romantic. But really, it was just a plan to trap her father. Alice blanched on a sudden thought. Oh, heavens! Does Almeria, Lady Charlton, Gerald's mother, know? Lucy shook her head. No, we wanted it to be a surprise. Well, it's certainly that. Oh, dear. Almeria will be around here any moment, then. Because, of course, she won't be happy. And that's an understatement if I've ever made one. She'll be furious and blame me for it, even though I knew nothing about it. She slipped off the bed. Get dressed quickly. We'd better get ready. Man the battlements. Start boiling the oil. Lucy climbed out of bed. Alice gave a huff of laughter. You may joke, but you don't know what she's like. At the door, she paused. On second thought, you stay here. I'll deal with her. You? But you didn't know anything about it. Why should you have to deal with her? Because I've been dealing with Almeria for the last twenty years. Better still, why don't you get dressed and go out into the garden as usual? I'll be able to tell her then that you're not in the house. Alice was planning to protect her, Lucy realized, preparing to stand up to Gerald's mother on her behalf. She couldn't remember the last time anyone besides Alice had stood up for her. She was very touched. She crossed the floor and gave Alice a quick hug. Alice, you are a darling, but I am not going to run off and leave you to the dragon lady. Almeria doesn't worry me. Besides, I watched how you handled her once. It taught me a lot. Alice looked at her curiously. Really? What did it teach you? Not to lose my temper or rise to her barbs. You were quite splendid. Lucy shook out her dress and laid it on her bed. Now, off you go. I'll be downstairs shortly, and don't worry. I'm not afraid of that woman. Maybe not, but Lucy, she's going to be your mother-in-law for the rest of your life. Lucy shrugged. Almeria would never be her mother-in-law. She's been your sister-in-law for half your life. Has your careful politeness ever made any difference? Alice grimaced, then nodded. I suppose you're right. Begin as you mean to go on. With any luck, we'll have time for breakfast before Almeria descends on us. Like the Black Death. Or, Lucy added mischievously, should that be the Puce Plague? Chapter 14 Damn it! Where was Heffernan? Gerald scanned the street for the dozenth time. He'd instructed Heffernan to be on hand outside Aunt Alice's house, keeping a discreet lookout for Bamba. But there was no sign of the man. Gerald had put the betrothal notice in several papers, not just the most popular ones, so Bamba would be sure to see it. Two possibilities had occurred to Gerald. Either Bamba would give Aunt Alice her letters back and disappear from her life as agreed, or he'd decide he wanted more from her, blackmailers being notorious for wanting more. And if that were the case, Gerald, with Heffernan's aid, would pounce on the blackguard and force him to give up the letters. So, where was Heffernan? A hawker had set up farther down the street, roasting nuts over a portable brazier. Gerald's stomach rumbled. He'd missed breakfast, and the smell was enticing. He gave the street another sweeping glance, 
then hurried down and ordered some roasted almonds. The hawker filled a cone of newspaper with hot nuts and handed them to Gerald. No sign of him yet, my lord. Gerald nearly dropped the nuts. Good God, it's you. Heffernan looked nothing like himself. He looked shorter, fatter, greyer and hairier, not to mention scruffier. Don't be talking to me now, my lord. Just take yourself off, casual like. I have three men watching for Bamba. Don't worry, if he shows up, we'll get him. Three men? Gerald could see no sign of them. Aye, all Ratcliffe's men, so leave it all to us. There's no telling when Bamba will show. Could take him all day. Might even be tomorrow or later, depending on where he's been hiding himself. The minute he shows, we'll let you know. That lad over there, the one sweeping the street, he's my runner. He'll bring you any news quick as a flash. Munching on the hot nuts, Gerald walked away. It went against the grain for him to leave the scene, but Heffernan was right. There was no telling how long Bamber would take to get there. And he couldn't very well turn up at Aunt Alice's house at this hour and then hang around all day without an excuse. Because who knew when Bamba would come? Even a newly betrothed man couldn't get away with that. And Alice wasn't to know that the betrothal was a ruse. A newly betrothed man. He was betrothed to Lucy Bamba. He smiled to himself. In her own way, Lucy was as elusive as her father. Not that there was any comparison. Lucy and Alice had just finished breakfast and had taken a pot of tea into the drawing room when the front doorbell jangled. That'll be her. Are you sure you don't want to go out into the garden? Alice asked Lucy for the third time. The fact that she was obviously dreading the encounter made Lucy feel even warmer toward her. Lucy laughed. Not in the least. Are you sure you won't let me deal with her by myself? I'm quite happy to. In fact, she would prefer to. But Alice was determined to stay and protect her. Moments later, Almeria, Countess of Charlton, swept into the room and came to an abrupt stop. She shot a vitriolic glance at Lucy. You, she said in a voice of loathing. Lucy curtsied. Good morning, Lady Charlton, she said in a cheery voice. What a vision you are. Fifty shades of puce. Alice hurriedly rose, saying, Almeria, what a surprise. Ha, surprise indeed. What do you have to say for yourself, eh? Eh? She glared at Alice. Would you like a cup of tea? Alice asked, and without waiting for an answer, rang for Tweed, who appeared so quickly he must have been listening at the door, and ordered fresh tea. Tea? Almeria said with loathing, seating herself in a flurry of silk and velvet. This is not the time for tea. Coffee, then, for Lady Charlton, please, Tweed, Alice said, and returned to her place on the sofa. I want nothing, no refreshments whatsoever. Lucy hid a smile. Alice wasn't doing it deliberately, but her attempt at soothing the savage breast, or was it a savage beast, beastess, was having the opposite effect. Well, Almeria snapped, the instant Tweed had departed. Explain yourself, Alice. I told you most specifically that I did not wish my son to become acquainted with this, this, Creature! She waved a disdainful hand in Lucy's direction. A creature, was she? Any intention Lucy had of being polite and conciliatory flew out the window. Creature? 
Lucy looked ostentatiously around. Oh, you mean me. Of course you do. But you mustn't blame Alice. She was as surprised as you were. Almeria turned a baleful glare on her. Surprised is not the word. Delighted, Lucy prompted brightly. Thrilled, jubilant. I am appalled. I don't know how you managed to convince my son. Oh, there was no convincing necessary. Not at all. In fact, it was all his idea. Almeria's eyes narrowed. I don't know how you entrapped my son into this appalling mesalliance, but... Entrapped? Lucy interrupted. Have you not spoken to Gerald, then? Almeria's lips thinned. He was not in his lodgings this morning, no doubt hiding from the consequences of his rash act. Or from his dear mamma, Lucy said sweetly. Almeria's eyes flashed. Are you calling my son a coward? You were the one who said he was hiding, Lucy pointed out. I wouldn't have thought it myself, but... I don't know how he was convinced to wed the likes of you, but I intend to put a stop to it. Lucy tried to look concerned. Is your son so weak-willed, then? Weak-willed? Ice dripped from every syllable. To be so easily controlled by his mother. I confess I am surprised, especially considering how heroically he served his country, commanding I don't know how many troops, and serving with distinction for... How many years was he away at war fighting the Corsican monster, Alice? Eight, said Alice. Six, Almeria said at the same time. It was eight, Alice repeated. Almeria sniffed. Well, whatever it was, presumably his mamma knows him best, Lucy cooed. So, Lady Charlton, are you saying Gerald is easily led? A touch unreliable? What do you mean, unreliable? My son is the kind of man who gives his word without intending to keep it. How dare you? My son is the soul of honour, Almeria declared, outraged. Oh, good then, Lucy smiled serenely. So the betrothal stands. Almeria breathed heavily through her nostrils, her eyes bulging with frustration. I warn you, if you do not release him from this disastrous match, he will be penniless. His father will cut off his allowance. Like a naughty schoolboy, Lucy said incredulously. How very poor-spirited of him. Ha! That's made you think twice, hasn't it? Almeria nodded in satisfaction. Thought you were marrying a fortune, didn't you? Not in the least. Didn't you know? We're marrying for love. Lucy batted her lashes and sighed romantically. Love? Pah! People of our order do not marry for love. But then, I am not of your order, am I? Isn't that your objection? In any case, Lucy continued briskly. I doubt Gerald will need his father's financial support once he joins the diplomatic service and is living abroad. Almeria stiffened. The diplomatic service? Gerald? Abroad? What nonsense! He'll do nothing of the sort. I need him here. Lucy raised a brow. To dance attendance on you? You'll want to keep a grown man of eight and twenty tied to your apron strings. Isn't it a bit late for that? Almeria curled her lips. Apron strings? Fah! I've never worn an apron in my life. How odd, Lucy said. I've always found them very useful, though not for tying people up with. Not that I've ever tried. 
But if you don't have many dresses, an apron is a very useful garment. I'm sure it is, Almeria said disdainfully. Lucy added in a reminiscent tone, In fact, I was wearing an apron when Gerald and I first met. You were wearing an apron? She said apron, as if Lucy had confessed to wearing a filthy old sack. Yes, perhaps that's what attracted him. Something a little bit different from the usual run of girls he'd been meeting. Why were you wearing an apron? A filthy, old, manure-stained sack. Lucy smiled sweetly. To protect my clothes. I was tending geese at the time. Almeria's well-plucked eyebrows almost disappeared. Tending geese? You were a goose girl? Yes, but they were very well-bred geese. A muffled sound came from the sofa. Lucy couldn't see Alice's face. They were French geese, Lucy added. They belonged to a French contest. French, Almeria said with scorn. Yes, but German geese are held to be very fine too, I believe. Young woman, I have no interest in geese, French, German, or otherwise. Lucy widened her eyes. But you must. I mean, you surely sleep on a goose feather mattress. They are the finest. And what about the Christmas goose? Do you refrain from eating that, too? Preferring pork, or perhaps chicken? Or do you eschew meat altogether? Is that how you stay so skinny? I mean thin. No, slender. Is that what you call it? Cease and desist, you impertinent girl. By all means, your ladyship. Just tell me what you wish me to cease and desist from, and I will gladly oblige. My son's betrothal. Except for that. For a long moment, Almeria huffed and puffed in silence. Then she rose and with freezing dignity said, I am deeply disappointed in you, Alice, for bringing this atrocious female into our circle. As for you, she pointed a bony finger at Lucy, who had also risen. The only way you will marry my son is over my dead body. Oh, surely nothing so drastic, Lucy said chattily. We'd have to go into blacks, and that's such a gloomy colour for a wedding, don't you think? Almeria's eyes were chips of ice. She opened her mouth, closed it, glared at Lucy some more, and with a final muttered, a abominable creature. She swept from the room. Lucy waited until she heard the front door close behind her, then sank into her chair with a gusty sigh. Oh, that was fun, wasn't it? She glanced across at Alice, who seemed to have collapsed on the sofa. Are you all right, Alice? Alice sat up, clutching a crumpled handkerchief. She regarded Lucy with awe. Fun? It was... You were so... Brassy, bold, impertinent, all of the above, and utterly brilliant, and so brave. Brave? Oh, Pooh, what can that woman do to me, after all? She's going to be your mother-in-law. Lucy wrinkled her nose. No danger of that. She really wished she could tell Alice it was a false betrothal, but she'd made a promise. She almost wished she was going to marry Lord Thornton. It went wholly against the grain to give that woman what she wanted. It would serve Almeria right if Lucy married him after all. After a moment, Alice said, you and your well-bred French geese. I thought she was going to burst. 
She glanced at Lucy and clapped her hand over her mouth. A snort escaped her. Their eyes met, and suddenly they were both laughing uncontrollably. It's not working, Lucy told Gerald as soon as she could grab a moment alone with him. Lord and Lady Falconer's route was already a sad squeeze, and more people were arriving every minute. The news about their betrothal was well and truly out, and many people had come up to congratulate her. Some, of course, were less welcoming of the news, the Countess of Charlton being one of them. Almeria was circulating among her friends, telling people that it was a mistake, that it would be called off as soon as her son came to his senses, and that that bamber creature, as she was calling Lucy, had entrapped him. Don't worry about Almeria, Alice told her. The more people she tells that kind of thing to, the more sympathy you're getting. It's extremely bad form of her to be so obviously antagonistic toward her son's choice, particularly when he seems so happy. Besides, anybody who knows Gerald knows he's not the kind of man to be entrapped by anyone. But whatever slander Almeria was spreading about Lucy didn't bother her. It was, after all, a false betrothal. Almeria would get her victory in the end, much as it would vex Lucy to have to grant it to her. What's not working? Gerald asked. It's been two days now since the betrothal was posted in the newspapers, and there has been no word from Papa. I know. Gerald said. Lucy frowned up at him. How do you know? I've had men watching the house ever since dawn that first morning. Men watching the house? Lucy wasn't sure what she thought about that. Lying in wait for Papa, as if he were a criminal. But he was a criminal. He'd blackmailed Alice. He'd also failed to give her the money he'd promised her. Lucy knew full well that Alice was now paying for all Lucy's needs out of her own pocket, a pocket that was lean at best. And she knew he owed many people money, and that some of his schemes had resulted in serious losses for his investors, though not Papa, never for Papa. So yes, he was a cheat and a blackmailer, a criminal. She couldn't deny it. But he was still her father. And though he hadn't ever been much of a parent, he had done his best for her, according to his own peculiar and haphazard standards. He had put her in the finest schools, even if she was later expelled for his failure to pay the bills. And he had intended she would benefit from her time with Frau Steiner, and the Countess, and she had learned from them, even if most of the time they'd used her as a maidservant. Papa always came up with schemes that sounded good. He just wasn't very good at carrying them out. Or was it that he simply didn't care about the people he involved in his schemes, as long as he benefited in the end? Oh, Papa. Had he always been like this? Even with Mama? She couldn't tell. She'd been too young. But probably he was just the same. They'd moved so often, and she was sure that wasn't Mama's choice. How long do you think we should give it? She asked Gerald. How long for what? Our betrothal. If it doesn't bring Papa and the letters to us... There's not much point in going on, is there? Oh, there's plenty of time yet, he said easily. I suppose. She glanced across to where Almeria was leaning in close to one of her cronies, whispering furiously in her ear, all the while sending dagger looks at Lucy. Brightening, Lucy sent the woman a wide smile and twinkled her fingers at Almeria in a gleeful wave. Almeria stiffened in outrage 
and resumed the vehement whispering. Lucy laughed. Yes, indeed. There was still plenty of time to enjoy the fruits of her betrothal. Do you have any engagements for Thursday next? James said as he escorted Alice into supper. Lord and Lady Falconer were known for the quality of their suppers. James was hoping for crab or lobster patties. She turned her head sharply. Thursday next? You mean the day after tomorrow? Is that when we, uh, you plan to, um, yes, I'm hoping for um on Thursday, if that suits you. She glanced furtively around. And you're asking me here, in this company? His eyes danced, but he said solemnly, it is perfectly proper to inquire about a lady's social arrangements, whether in company or not. And then he added, for he could see his question had seriously discomposed her, I simply wish to invite you to take a turn in my new carriage, Lady Charlton. Your carriage? Yes, my carriage. Oh, your carriage, she said, finally understanding. She added in a clear voice, sufficient to be heard a good ten feet in any direction. I would be delighted to take a ride in your carriage, Lord Tarrant. And then she realized the possible interpretations of that statement and blushed rosily. James hid a smile. His beloved was not built for deception. Duplicity of any kind was simply not in her nature. Good, he murmured. My horses are raring to go. Her blush deepened. In that case, I will call for you at nine. He leaned closer and whispered in her ear, Pack a bag. We will stay overnight. Over- She squeaked and tried to turn it into a cough, possibly longer. Her eyes widened, but she said nothing as they took their places. James was delighted to see that there were both crab and lobster patties, and plenty of both. Alice just picked at her food. She was nervous, but he could do nothing about that. Not until Thursday. What about Lucy? She asked in a low voice. He served her a slice of lemon curd cake. Her favorite. What about her? I can't just go off and leave her. Why not? Much as I like your goddaughter, she's not coming with us. She spluttered over a mouthful of wine. No, but it would be most improper to leave her on her own in my house. He wanted to laugh, but he saw her point. What if Nanny McCubbin and my daughters came to stay? That would be adequate chaperonage, would it not? Y yes. Or perhaps I could ask Lady Peplow to invite her to stay a few days. Lucy and Penny Peplow get on very well together. I'll give it some thought. To James's amusement, Alice raised it with Lucy going home in the carriage that evening, telling her that she'd heard this evening that an old friend of hers was ailing, and Alice had decided to visit her. And no, Lucy couldn't accompany her because, because her friend was quite poor and lived in a very small cottage. There was no room. Who was this friend? An, an old school friend. Her name? Mary. Yes, that was it. Mary. James leaned back against the carriage squabs, enjoying the tangled story Alice was attempting to weave in order to have an excuse to get away for a couple of days. He had no doubt the darkness inside the carriage hid a positive battalion of blushes. The possibilities of Penny Peplow or Nanny McCubbin and the little girls were debated. Then Gerald leaned forward and said, Actually, I have been thinking of taking Lucy to meet my grandmother, who lives outside Aylesbury. Your grandmother? 
Lucy exclaimed. But I can't. She's heard so much about you already. I just bet she has, Lucy muttered. Gerald laughed. I promise you'll like her. She's not at all like my mother. In fact, she's been heard to say, when provoked, that mother was a fairy changeling and not the good sort. Grandmama would love to meet you. What an excellent idea, James said. Yes, and you can take my maid, Mary, with you, Alice agreed. Yes, I'm sure Lady Charlton will manage perfectly without the services of her maid, James said in a provocative voice. A small foot kicked him on the ankle. Alice said with dignity, Thank you, Gerald. That's the perfect solution. James didn't think Lucy was as pleased with the idea as everyone else. In fact, he got the distinct impression she was extremely reluctant to go. But he didn't care. As long as it made Alice free to come with him, he didn't give a damn what Lucy did. Good, so that's all settled, he said as the carriage drew up outside Bel Air Gardens. Good night, ladies he said as he handed them down. It's been a delightful evening. The following morning, a letter arrived addressed to Lucy in a flamboyant hand. Tweed presented it to her on a silver salver. She eyed it with a sinking heart. She knew that hand. She looked at Alice. It's from Papa. What does it say? Lucy broke open the seal, scanned the contents swiftly, then read it aloud. My dear daughter, by the time you receive this letter, I shall be far away, sailing the high seas, heading for America. Congratulate me, daughter, for I have married a Mrs. Lyman. She is a widow from Boston, Massachusetts, the relic of an extremely wealthy man, so you will be glad to know I shall be living in the comfort, even luxury, to which I have always aspired. I shall not be returning to England. It has become increasingly unfriendly to me, and I am glad to shake its dirt from my boots and to start a new life. So, daughter, for all your misgivings, my little scheme was successful, and you are securely betrothed to a viscount and the heir to an earldom. Thus I can happily leave you, knowing I have done all I can to assure your future. Please give Lady Charlton my thanks and apologies. I had no choice. Live well, my child. Farewell from your loving father, Octavius Bamber, Esquire. She choked on the last few lines. She ought to be used to this. How many times had he dumped her on strangers and abandoned her? This time, it was forever. He was glad to go. I can happily leave you. Oh, Lucy, to leave the country forever, without any warning or even a personal goodbye. Alice slipped an arm around Lucy and hugged her. The warm sympathy in her voice brought a blurring of tears to Lucy's eyes. She blinked them angrily away. She would not let her father bring her to tears. Not again. Never again. How often as a young girl had she soaked her pillow with lonely, miserable, fruitless tears, every time Papa had left her, assuring her that this, whatever it was, with whoever it was, would be the making of her. And then he'd drive blithely away without a backward glance, leaving her behind to sink or swim. And now she was alone forever, without even having the pretense of a father. Well, Better no father at all than one who regularly turned her life upside down with no warning. 
She could choose now how she would live her life. And if the future stretched ahead, frighteningly blank, that simply meant she needed to make plans. She couldn't batten on Alice much longer. I'm all right, she told Alice wearily. It's not as if it's anything new. She folded and refolded the letter until it was a small square and slipped it into her sleeve. It was so typical of Papa, the self-centeredness, the self-congratulatory tone, and the complete disregard of her feelings. All he cared about was his own success. So her future was assured, was it? Did he even know? or care anything about Lord Thornton, apart from his title. For all Papa knew, he could be a hurried wife-beater, or cat-torturer, or anything. After a moment, Alice said hesitantly, Did he even mention the letters? Lucy shook her head. I'm sorry. Maybe he's burned them. Lucy shook her head. Who knew with Papa? But what would be the use of them now? He's got what he wanted, you betrothed to a Viscount, and he must know I have no money to buy them. Lucy shrugged. I don't know. Maybe it's all over. Maybe Papa's forgotten all about them. It wouldn't be unlike him. He has an enviable ability to put awkward or uncomfortable thoughts out of his mind, particularly when he has a new scheme in mind. In this case, a rich widow. Alice sighed. He's acting as if his scheme is all over. But I would feel a lot better if he had enclosed the letters. It would cost more to post, Lucy said. Papa can be quite ridiculously penny-pinching at times. She stood up and said briskly, Now, I don't know about you, but I'm in need of fresh air. I'm going out into the garden. Do you want to come? Alice said gently, No, my dear, you've had a big upset. I think you'll be happier alone to sort out your feelings. Lucy nodded happier alone. Yes, she'd better learn how to be that. Gerald called at Bel Air Gardens later that afternoon, ostensibly to finalise the arrangements to take Lucy to visit his grandmother, but also to bring Alice the news. Lucy is out in the garden, Alice told him. Good, he said, but first, some news. My man Heffernan sent a message. Bamber has left the country. He sailed from Bristol two nights ago on a ship bound for America. I know, Alice said. Lucy got a letter from him this morning, bidding her farewell forever. He's married a rich American widow and says he's never coming back. Gerald stared at her, shocked. He said goodbye by letter, without even trying to see her. That swine, his own daughter. How did she take it? Alice shook her head. She's devastated, of course, but determined not to show it. She says it's nothing new. It seems she's quite accustomed to being abandoned by that wretched man. But honestly... How could any young girl become accustomed to such carelessness, especially as he's her only living relative? And she's such a dear girl. Oh, I could strangle him. You'll keep her with you, of course. Yes, of course, though she has her pride. My guess is she'll try to insist on leaving. Alice snorted to go where? That man has left her with nothing. I'm just thankful she is safely betrothed to you. Were it not for that, she shook her head. Gerald frowned. The betrothal was currently as strong as wet paper. 
he would have his work cut out for him now. Perhaps this visit to my grandmother might cheer her up. Alice gave him a sceptical glance. You think so? Why not? At least it will be a change. I'll go and speak to her now. On the point of leaving, he turned back at the door. There was no mention of the letters, I suppose. None. Damn him. Sorry, Aunt Alice. Don't be, Alice said. I quite agree. He found Lucy in her favourite spot, under the spreading plane tree, painting. Or rather, pretending to paint. He stood in the shadows and quietly watched her for several minutes. Her brush never moved. She just sat, staring blankly into the distance. He couldn't imagine how she must feel. To be so callously abandoned, so entirely alone. No matter how unsatisfactory his own parents were, they were at least there. He must have moved or made a sound, for she turned her head and sprang up. Gerald. She put her paintbrush down, smoothed her dress, and faced him with a forced smile. I'm glad you're here. It's time this sham came to an end. He strolled toward her. What sham would that be? The betrothal. Oh, that. There's no hurry. You don't understand. She took a small square of paper from her sleeve and handed it to him. I received this today. My father has left the country. As you will see, there's no longer any reason to continue this betrothal charade, she said in a colourless voice. Gerald unfolded the square and started to read. As he did, his anger grew. The smug self-satisfaction of the man. His complete disregard for his daughter's feelings. Not even a pretense that she would be welcome to visit, or that he intended to share any of his good fortune with her. You see, she said when he'd finished reading, it's time I set you free. I'm not quite sure how to proceed. Do I send the notice to the papers, or is it more proper for you to do so? Only I don't want people to think you have been in any way dishonourable. He refolded the letter and passed it back to her. Don't worry about it. I'm not ready to cancel our betrothal yet. A troubled crease appeared between her brows. Why not? We only did it to bring my father out from wherever he was lurking. Now he's on his way to America. There's no point. Yes, but there are other things to consider, he said vaguely. What things? People. My grandmother, for a start. She stared at him, puzzled. What does your grandmother have to do with it? She's very much looking forward to our visit tomorrow. I'd hate to disappoint her. But she doesn't even know me. And won't she be even more disappointed if we break off the betrothal after the visit? She's expecting us. And if you don't come with me, he added in a burst of inspiration, Alice won't be able to go and stay with her friend. And you know how she hates to let people down. As a betrothed couple, with a maid in attendance, you and I can travel quite respectably. But if we were no longer betrothed, it would be quite scandalous. She eyed him with a doubtful expression. Really? Yes he said firmly. By staying betrothed, we can make both my grandmother and Alice happy, and nobody will be put out or disappointed. I suppose, she agreed reluctantly. He gave her a quizzical look. Are you so keen to get rid of me? She gave a half-hearted laugh. It's not that. It's just that... Oh... My father has embroiled us all in this dreadful tangle, and I can see no way out except to cut right through it and leave everyone free and clear. Her lovely eyes were troubled. I am 
truly grateful, Lord Thornton, for your... What? He staggered back as if in shock. She put a concerned hand on his arm. What is it? Are you ill? You called me Lord Thornton. And when she didn't respond, he added, Not Lord Thorncrake, or Lord Thorndyke, or Lord Thornbottle. She looked self-conscious. Oh, yes, well, I'm sorry about that. He fixed her with a gimlet look. Who are you, and what have you done with Lucy Bamber? She laughed, a genuine one this time. That's better, he said. I don't like seeing you all crushed and guilty. None of this mess is your fault. And your father is gone, so let us put it all behind us. Before she could argue the case, he hurried on. Now, I plan to collect you at half past eight tomorrow morning. It's not too early for you, is it? It will take us most of the day to reach my grandmother's. It's not too early, she said, but I still don't like the thought of getting her hopes up. Let me worry about that, he told her. Lucy ate a hearty breakfast. Alice had toyed with a piece of toast, but hadn't been able to bring herself to eat more than a mouthful. She was too tense. She waved off Lucy and Mary shortly after half past eight. It was a rather grand affair. The smart travelling carriage had the Charlton coat of arms on the door and was pulled by a team of four fine horses. The driver wore livery, as did the footman travelling at the rear. Gerald accompanied them on horseback. As they turned the corner and disappeared from sight, Butterflies started up in Alice's stomach. James would be here in half an hour. She was all packed, but was she ready for what was to come? She had no idea. James arrived twenty minutes later in a yellow bounder, a hired post chaise pulled by two horses. A postillion rode one of the horses. We're not going far, he explained. And this is more private. No grooms or drivers to worry about or eavesdrop. No horses to stable. Alice nodded. She couldn't even think about grooms or horses. But privacy she could appreciate. She could still hardly believe she was going to do this, even less that it was at her suggestion. James put her valise into the boot at the back and helped her into the chaise. She'd never been in one of these conveyances before, and when he climbed in after her, it suddenly felt very small. Their bodies touched all down one side. His body felt so warm. She herself felt cold. Nerves. They set off, and she distracted herself by looking out the window that covered the whole front of the chaise, and pointing out various sights of possible interest. She feared she was babbling, but she couldn't seem to help herself. After a few minutes, it started to rain. Just a soft, light spitting, but it made the window hard to see out of. We'll be there in about an hour, James told her. I've rented a small cottage near a village on the outskirts of London. Mmm, she responded vaguely. In the small, close carriage, she could smell him. Nothing strong or overwhelming, just the faint scent of his soap, clean linen, a hint of his shaving cologne, and the underlying smell of his skin. The smell of James. She just wanted to lean over, press her face against his chest, and inhale him. If only that was all it took. So, how shall we while away the time? Startled, she turned to look at him. He laughed at her expression. Not with any improper activity, he said. We'll have plenty of time for that when we get there. Oh, of course, she swallowed. His big, warm hand closed over hers, and she immediately felt both comforted 
and yet foolishly, even more nervous. I meant, he continued, his thumb caressing her skin. What shall we talk about on the journey? Let's start with you. Where did you grow up? She told him about her childhood at the vicarage in Chasley. And, and what she later realized was his skillful questioning. Told him a great deal more than she'd intended. About her father's passion for saving the souls of denizens. About how she'd grown up lonely. She wasn't allowed to associate with the village children, and had always wished for brothers or sisters, but they'd never happened. And all the time his thumb caressed her, moving back and forth over her hand, slow and rhythmic. She found herself telling him how she'd come to marry Thaddeus. I barely knew him, but both Mamma and Papa were insistent that he was a good match for me. And he did seem to be good-looking and quite charming. So, two weeks to the day after we met, we were betrothed. And she, poor naive fool, had thought that Thaddeus had fallen in love with her. And she'd been so excited by this unexpected whirlwind wooing by a handsome and sophisticated London Viscount that she'd imagined she was in love with him too. Later, she'd learned that she was on a list of virtuous and eligible girls his father had given him, along with an ultimatum that if he wasn't betrothed to one of them by the end of the month, his allowance would be stopped. It was all to prevent him from marrying his mistress. She didn't tell that to James. It was too lowering. And six weeks after that, I was married and living in London, and Mamma and Papa had departed for foreign shores. Papa's lost souls, you see, she finished. And not long after that, they were dead. Yes, it was a terrible shock. And by the time I found out, they'd actually been dead for weeks. That was when she'd finally realized she was entirely alone in the world, except for her husband, who by then had shown his true colors. But enough about me, she forced a brighter tone. What about you? Did you have a happy childhood? He told her about the estate in Warwickshire, where he'd grown up, the one that was now his, and how his brother, Ross, being the heir, had been trained to take over the management of the estate. It was clear from his stories that he and his brother were very close, and that Nanny McCubbin had cared for them both. She was more of a mother to Ross and me than our own mother was. Alice, having seen Nanny McCubbin with his daughters, could easily imagine it. He told her about joining the army and going to war about how he met his wife, Selina, on leave, and how her parents were adamantly opposed to the match, but how he and Selina won out in the end. He told her how Selina had travelled with the army, and how well she'd taken to that life. As he talked and told funny and dramatic stories of their adventures, Alice became more and more aware that she could never live up to his memories of Selina. Alice couldn't even produce a baby, let alone give birth to one in the middle of a war, in a tent or a dirt-floored cottage. And from the sounds of things, Selina had treated every one of those hardships as a delightful adventure. Alice, by comparison, was dull and unadventurous. She hadn't done much with her life at all. The uncertain and dangerous life we lived made us both very aware that we needed to make the most of every day, he finished. An excellent principle to live by, Alice thought. And she was having an adventure. If the definition of the word was to do something you'd never done before, 
that felt risky and a bit nerve-wracking. There was no point in hoping that James would fall in love with her. His stories about Selina had convinced her of that. He wanted Alice as a mother for his daughters, and a wife he was comfortable with, whose company he enjoyed. She could accept that, could even live quite happily with it, as long as she didn't let herself crave more than he was prepared to give. If she could bear going to bed with him, it would be enough. The Bible said it was better to give than to receive, and Alice had a heart full of love to give. She already loved his daughters. She would just have to take care that she didn't smother James or embarrass him with her feelings, if she agreed to marry him, that was. You couldn't make someone love you. Thaddeus had taught her that. We're here. James said as the carriage pulled up, outside a small, pretty cottage. Wait here while I open it up. You don't want to get wet. He leapt down and splashed through the puddles to the front door of the cottage. He unlocked the front door and returned with an umbrella for her. While he fetched their luggage and paid off the small postillion, Alice looked around. The cottage was small and simple, but spotlessly clean. Four rooms by the look of it, a sitting room and two small bedrooms, with a kitchen at the back. The floor was slate, but made cosy with colourful rugs. A fire had been set in the fireplace, all ready to light. The kitchen contained a cast-iron stove, also readied for lighting, and a large table. Glancing out the back door, she saw a short path leading to an outhouse, which she made quick use of. She washed her hands at an outdoor pump, and then explored the cottage. One of the bedrooms contained a large double bed, made up with soft blankets, fine linen, and a beautiful satin-edged eiderdown. She sat on the bed a new mattress if she wasn't mistaken. In fact, the bed itself was too big and grand for a cottage like this. James must have furnished the whole cottage from scratch. She swallowed. He'd gone to a lot of trouble. She hoped it would be worth it. Hoped she would be worth it. She'd started shaking again. Well, what do you think? James asked, setting down the valises and a large wicker basket. I know it's small and simple, but I thought you'd be more comfortable with no strange servants and no neighbours. It's a five-minute walk into the village, and the post-chaise and postillion will be waiting there, so whenever you want to leave, I'll walk in and fetch them. She pressed her shaking hands together. She could do this. She could and smiled. It's lovely. He took a tinderbox from the shelf above the fireplace, and in a few minutes the fire was alight. Won't be long before the room warms up. She nodded. It wasn't cold that was making her shake. When had she become such a coward? She'd done this hundreds of times with Thaddeus. It couldn't be any worse but that wasn't what she was so frightened of. This was make or break. Either she could bear to be bedded by James, or she couldn't. If she could, she would marry him. If it was as it had been with Thaddeus, proving that she was the one at fault, she couldn't marry James. Oh, she was sure he'd say it didn't matter, but she knew it would and she couldn't bear to see him grow more and more disappointed with a cold wife who shrank from him in bed. And then he would turn to a mistress, and she couldn't bear that either. Are you hungry? I'll put on the kettle and organize something to eat. He disappeared into the kitchen, and she could hear him getting out crockery and clattering quietly about. She ought to be the one seeing to it, not him. 
but she couldn't even think about food at the moment. She couldn't think about anything at all, except for that big bed. She glanced out the window. It was still raining, and the dismal grey light coming through the windows gave her no idea of the time. How long until the evening? An endless, unbearable wait. Perhaps she could force herself to enjoy it, or at least make James think she enjoyed it. No, she was not prepared to be dishonest in that way. To start a marriage with such dishonesty would be to invite further cracks and deceptions. She wouldn't do it. She paced up and down in front of the fire. She wanted to throw up. So much depended on what happened in that big bed tonight. You're not the slightest bit interested in food, are you? She whirled around. He stood in the doorway watching her. His voice deepened. You're driving yourself mad with imaginary worries. She couldn't think of a thing to say. Her worries weren't imaginary. Give me a minute. He disappeared back into the kitchen. What was he thinking? She had no idea. He was back in two minutes. You need to have a little faith, he said, and pulled her gently toward him. I do have faith in you, she said tremulously. He cupped her face in one hand and gave her one of those slow smiles that never failed to melt her bones. I meant faith in yourself. He stroked her cheek with his thumb. I have every faith in you, Alice. But I can see that you need to be convinced. Can I assume you have no appetite for food at the moment? She nodded. Good, he said, and lowered his mouth to hers. Chapter 15 Oh! The glory of James's kisses. Kissing. Why had it taken her so long to learn? Thaddeus had never kissed her, not like this. She was glad that James was her first. With lips and tongue, he gently pressed her lips apart. His tongue stroked the inside of her mouth in a leisurely, sensual exploration. Every tiny motion thrummed through her body and gathered momentum. Warm shivers rippled through her, building with each stroke, pooling in the deepest recesses of her body. She pressed her hands against his chest and slid them higher, stroking his jaw, feeling the faint underlying masculine roughness of bristles in a friction that delighted her breathing in the scent of him even as the dark, masculine taste of him filled her senses. She tried to copy the things he was doing with his tongue, only they dazzled her so that she couldn't concentrate, only feel, and respond without thought or purpose. Pleasure. She slid her fingers through his hair and pressed herself against him, thigh against thigh, belly to belly, breast against chest. Her knees felt suddenly weak. A long shudder rippled down her spine, some deep hollow within her, aching for... For what? She had no idea. Only a need for which she had no name. She clutched his shoulders, leaning against him. He shifted his grip and swung her up off her feet. She squeaked in surprise, and he smiled. Time to move into the bedroom. Oh, the heat drained out of her. The kissing was over. It was time for the, the other. He set her on her feet beside the bed, then sat on the other side of the bed and pulled off his boots and stockings. He stood to remove his coat, then swiftly unbuttoned his waistcoat. 
He draped his coat over the rail at the end of the bed and folded the waistcoat over it. She watched as he dragged his fine white linen shirt over his head, shook it out, then draped it over the rail. He wore no undershirt. His chest was bare and hard, with a dusting of dark hair and two small hard nipples. She tried not to stare, but she couldn't help herself. She hadn't known that men had nipples. His arms were powerful, strong and sinewy, his forearms sunburned. She stood unmoving, gazing across the bed at him. Her mouth dried. His mouth curved in an understanding smile. Do you need help with that dress? Flushing at being caught staring, she nodded. She'd anticipated this part and knew she'd be disrobing without her maid to help, but she hadn't expected to be undressing in front of him. Even less that he would undress in front of her. She turned her back. Just untie the bow at the top and loosen the laces, please. She could manage from there. Deftly, he untied her laces and swiftly pulled them not just loose, but free. Cool air whispered down her spine. Warm fingers brushed against her skin. She shivered, not quite understanding why. She wasn't cold. Her dress started to slide. She grabbed at it, but I have it he said, and eased it down over her hips and all the way to the floor. He knelt and looked up at her, waiting, and she had no option but to step out of it, leaving her in just her underclothes. He gathered up the folds and draped the dress over the bed rail. She began to unhook her stays. She'd chosen front-fastening ones deliberately, but allow me. His voice was slightly husky. She could barely breathe as one by one he undid the hooks down the front of her stays. She wore a chemise underneath, but even so, she felt the brush of his knuckles through the fine lawn fabric. Her nipples were hard and tight and extraordinarily sensitive. On the fifth hook, he looked up from his task, you can breathe, you know. She huffed in a nervous half laugh, and he leaned forward and kissed her. Lavish, leisurely kisses that sent shivers coursing through her again. Straightening, he slipped her stays down her arms and tossed them aside. He'd undone the rest of the hooks while kissing her. She hadn't even noticed. He was breathing more heavily now. So was she. He reached for the buttons on the fall of his buckskin breeches. I'll get my stockings. She turned away hastily and sat on the bed. She stripped off her stockings and then her drawers. All she wore now was her chemise. Oh, she exclaimed, my nightgown. It's in the valise. You won't need a nightgown. His voice was deep and a little hoarse. She turned to say something, but every word evaporated from her brain. He was naked, completely, totally naked. Alice didn't know where to look. She'd never seen a naked man before. Thaddeus had always come to her either fully dressed, or, in the early part of their marriage, in a dressing gown with a nightshirt underneath. And she'd always worn a nightgown. She glanced at him, then away, and then back again, until she was unable to look away. She was fascinated by the hard-packed masculine shape of him, so different from her. And his male parts. Was that what they looked like? She'd only felt them. It pounding into her. She swallowed. He looked bigger in that area than Thaddeus. Would bigger mean more painful? She closed her eyes briefly. Stop thinking about Thaddeus, 
she told herself. This was James, and it was going to be different, quite different. It had to be. James stood and let her look, seemingly quite comfortable in his bare skin. Did he expect the same of her? She couldn't. She'd never been wholly naked in front of anyone before, only her maid when she was in her bath. She dragged her gaze off him and dived under the covers. The sheets were smooth and cold. He slid into the bed as well, and she immediately felt the effects of his big, warm body so close to hers. He rolled onto his side, facing her, and pulled her close. Rain spattered against the windows. Wind tossed the branches around and moaned around the chimney. The heat of his body soaked into hers. This was it. She opened her legs and braced herself. He paused. Relax, he said softly. Let's just kiss for a while. And before she could say anything, his mouth was on hers again, and she gave herself wholly up to the delights of kissing. As they kissed, his hands roved over her body, caressing, soothing away some nerves, while at the same time arousing others. He feathered kisses everywhere, across her eyelids, in the delicate walls of her ears, along her jawline, finding a pulse here, a sensitive spot there, causing exquisite shivers of pleasure wherever he went. He nibbled his way down her neck, and she found herself arching sensuously like a cat beneath his ministrations. He brushed a hand across her breast, and the tight, aching nipple thrust hard against him. Cupping her breast in one big hand, he scratched the nipple lightly through the fabric of her chemise. She gasped as tiny sparks of sensation stabbed through her. You like that, don't you? A kind of humming noise came from her. She wanted to say something to him, but her mind was blank of words. There was only sensation. And James. She ran her hands over him, enjoying the contrast of his hard, masculine body with the softness of hers, his smooth, firm chest. She pressed her face against the skin of his chest and inhaled deeply, as she'd wanted to do in the carriage earlier. Essence of James. His big, warm hands caressed her thighs and hips and belly. How had she never known the delight of skin against skin? She caressed him feverishly, her heart pounding, her whole focus narrowed to whichever part of her body he was touching. He cupped her face and kissed her again, deep, drugging kisses. Then he bent and placed his mouth over her breast and threw her chemise, teased her nipple with his tongue. Waves of pleasure rippled through her, and then he sucked hard, and she arched and almost came off the bed as a fierce spear of pleasure pain spiked through her. She lay back, gasping, and before she realized it, he was raising her chemise. Her scrambled brain focused, and she braced herself for his entry. But he kept pushing the chemise up. Lift your bottom. She lifted, and he pulled her chemise up over her head and tossed it aside, and she was naked. Beautiful, he murmured, and she warmed at the appreciation in his voice. He lowered his head to her breasts again, her full and aching breasts, unbearably sensitive, and she shuddered beneath him in waves of pleasure. And slowly, her body built to an aching need for she did not know what. His hand slipped between her thighs and cupped her there. Warmth spread from where they touched, and her insides rippled and clenched. 
One large finger moved, stroking the delicate folds, and a spear of hot sensation stabbed through her. Then another, and another. Her breath came in ragged gasps as she trembled and writhed beneath his knowing caresses. Her legs quivered, then fell apart, loose and trembling. Her body was wholly out of her control. She thrust against his hand, frantically, feverishly, grasping for something, she knew not what. Pressure built and built inside her. She thrashed against him, and just as she was sure she was going to burst, she heard a high, wavering sound as something happened and she shattered. Slowly, her wits returned. She lay against him, her breath slowing, enveloped by a feeling of lazy euphoria and amazement. Then as she was slowly drifting back to earth, he caressed her intimately again, rose up and entered her with one slow, sure movement. Alice's eyes flew open in surprise. There was no discomfort at all. It felt right, amazingly, wonderfully right. He was watching her, his gray eyes intense, smoky with desire. He stroked her again in that place between her thighs, and she felt the excitement start to build again. He began to move within her, slow and deliberate, and she gasped with each thrust. Without conscious volition, she found herself lifting her body, pushing herself against him in time with each thrust. Wrap your legs around me, he gasped, and she did, and oh, that was better. Closer, tighter, harder. The pressure built inside her as before. She clung to him, rocking in rhythm her body clenching around his powerful male body, feeling gloriously powerful, demanding faster, harder, more, more, more. He gave one last thrust and groaned loudly. She felt a hot gush of liquid inside her and heard herself give a high, thin scream as she shattered again, this time around him. She might have slept for a little while. She wasn't sure. All she knew was that she slowly floated back to awareness, like a feather languidly drifting to the ground, feeling so wonderfully good, sleepily euphoric. She opened her eyes and found him lying on his side, watching her. All right, he murmured. He'd pulled the covers up over them, and she felt warm and safe and so comfortable. She opened her mouth to tell him she felt wonderful, but instead her mouth crumpled and her eyes filled with tears. Oh, sweetheart. He gathered her against him and held her, rubbing her back in a gentle, soothing rhythm. Sobs jerked through her. I, I'm s sorry. It's n not. Hush. I'm not. Don't try to explain. It's all right. They're g g good tears, she managed to choke out between sobs. He gave a soft laugh. I see. Just let them come. I don't mind. And he didn't. He just held her, lending her his warmth, his strength, his acceptance. After an embarrassingly long time, the hateful sobs stopped. There was no handkerchief, so Alice found her chemise at the foot of the bed and wiped her face on it. I'm sorry, she said on a gulp. I don't know why I'm crying. I. Has that happened to you before? The climax, I mean. Climax? 
Was that what it was called? She shook her head. I didn't even know it was possible. He brushed damp hair off her face. Then perhaps your emotions were a little overwhelmed. She nodded. But it was wonderful. I feel wonderful. I don't know why I had to go and spoil it all by weeping all over you. Men hate tears, I know. He pulled her closer. Usually, when women cry, I want to rush out and kill a dragon for them or something. But good tears I can cope with. Just. They lay entwined in silence for a few moments, listening to the rain and the wind outside. Do most women experience that in the marriage bed? She asked, thinking about what Lady Peplo had told her. If a man pays attention. Yes, that was it. Thaddeus had never paid attention. Suddenly, she was angry. Eighteen years of marriage, and she'd had no idea there could even be pleasure in the act, let alone that. She reached up and kissed him. Thank you for showing me. He smiled, that slow smile that always made her insides curl. And she knew now why. Thank you for trusting me. Now. At that point, her stomach suddenly gave a loud, long rumble. She glanced at him, mortified, and then suddenly they were both laughing. I think before we go any further in this conversation, I should feed you, he said. Wait here. He slipped out of bed, and she watched shamelessly, admiring his bare, muscular body, as he pulled on his breeches and left the room. He was a magnificent specimen of a man. Her lover. She snuggled back down in the covers and thought about all she had learned in the last hour. It was, for her, the revelation of a lifetime, all those wasted years, feeling like a failure as a woman, unattractive, undesirable, barren. She wasn't ever going to let anyone make her feel like that again. She would not allow bitterness and regret to poison her life any longer. She wasn't even going to think of Thaddeus. She had a future, and she was the mistress of a wonderful man. Her lover. She lay curled in her nest of blankets and relived the lovemaking in her mind. There was so much to learn, she realized. He'd brought her to climax simply by touching her with his mouth and hands. Did it work the other way around, with her touching him? Here you are. He entered with a tray. With one hand, he caught up his shirt from the rail at the foot of the bed and tossed it to her. You might feel more comfortable in this. She slipped his shirt over her head. It was far too big and swamped her, but she enjoyed its faint masculine smell of James. Rolling back the sleeves, she sat up and arranged the pillows to lean back on. He passed her the tray and slipped in beside her. Her eyes widened. It was a veritable feast. Where did all this food come from? She hadn't noticed it before. His eyes glinted with humor. I knew we'd be hungry, so I had my cook pack a hamper. Her stomach rumbled again at the sight and smell of the food. There was a pot of tea and a little jug of milk, crusty fresh bread, curls of golden butter, tender slices of ham, a pot of honey, cold egg and bacon pie, little lemon curd cakes, and a dish of Strawberries? she asked in amazement. At this time of year? Last seasons, preserved in syrup. The cook at Towers, my country estate, makes them according to a secret recipe. And she sent some up to London when she heard the girls and I were living there for the moment. 
It's a ploy to get us to return to what she considers our proper place, which is, of course, towers. Try one. They're delicious. He scooped up one with a spoon and popped it into her mouth. It was utterly delectable, sweet and succulent. To Alice's surprise and secret pleasure, he fed her by hand, all sorts of delicious morsels, a little of everything, all washed down with fresh hot tea, until she was utterly sated. He took the depleted tray away and returned a few minutes later. I had thought we might go for a walk, but it's still pouring. Any thoughts as to what you'd like to do now? We could talk, or read, or even sleep if you'd like. Alice felt herself blushing. Could we do, um, that again? He threw back his head and laughed, uninhibited, masculine and joyous. A woman after my own heart. Indeed we can. And he slid into bed again. Gerald was regretting his choice of riding to his grandmother's. The fine mist of rain had stopped, but he wouldn't have minded being in the carriage. There were things he wanted to say, and do to Miss Lucy Bamber, but her blasted maid was in the way, which he supposed was the purpose of chaperones. They stopped at the coaching inn at Watford for a meal and to change horses. As luck would have it, the maid, Mary, got talking to the landlady. The woman had six daughters, three of whom worked at the inn, two of whom were yet too young, and one who apparently had a passion to become a lady's maid. The landlady had a host of questions to ask Mary about the life and prospects for a lady's maid, as well as the general wickedness of life in London. I'm sick of being stuck in the carriage, Lucy told him. I want to stretch my legs. So he offered her his arm, and they strolled to the edge of the village and turned down a shady tree-lined lane. I'm calling it off, Lucy said abruptly the minute they were alone. I can't stay with your grandmother, lying to her and getting her all excited about a wedding that will never take place. I want to go home. And the moment we get back to London, I want you to put a notice in the newspapers cancelling this wretched betrothal. Gerald was silent, trying to think of what to say. Eventually, he simply told the truth. I don't think it's wretched, and I don't want to cancel it. What? She jerked her arm from the crook of his elbow and stepped back, staring at him her eyes wide. What does that mean? You can't possibly. Want to marry you? I'm afraid I can. In fact, marrying you has become my heart's desire. There, it was out. She gave him a troubled look. But, but it was just a stratagem to get Papa to show himself. It was also a stratagem to get you betrothed to me, he admitted. I could think of no other way to achieve it, with your determination to hold me at arm's length and your ridiculous prejudice against lords. She shook her head, looking distressed. But you can't. I'm, I'm Lucy Bamber, the daughter of a scoundrel. You said it yourself. Papa was a swindler, a liar, a blackmailer, a... And his daughter is nothing like that. The Lucy Bamber I know is honest, honourable, loyal, spirited, and beautiful. Beautiful? Very. He drew her into his arms and kissed her, as he'd been longing to kiss her almost from the moment they'd met. She resisted for an instant, then softened against him, sliding her arms up around his neck, twining her fingers in his hair.
and kissing him back with all the passion he'd hoped for. After a few minutes, she drew back. I'm sorry. I should never have let that happen. Why not? Didn't you enjoy it? I did. He reached for her again. She pushed his hands away. I'm serious, Gerald. I'm deeply sensible of the honor you do me, but I can't marry you. Why not? She just shook her head and walked a little way along the lane. Gerald followed. You're trying to think up reasons why you can't marry me, aren't you? He said. You have this ridiculous notion that you don't belong in my world. She turned. Well, I don't. I wasn't raised in your world, and I don't fit in it. He snorted. What you don't realize is that lots of people feel that way, including me. You? You're a Viscount, the son of an earl. Yes, and I've been that for precisely eighteen months. Before that, I was a cash-strapped captain in the army, the unregarded son of a second son, and nobody gave me a second glance. Maybe, but what do you think it was like to come from a life involving years of hardship and turmoil and boredom and danger and responsibility and battlefields that stank of blood and mud and worse, with the screams and groans of the injured and dying, some of them your men and your friends, ringing in your ears. And then the war is over, and you come back and try to fit into a society where people are dressed in satin, silk and lace, smelling of perfumes, and their most serious problem is deciding who to dance with, or what to order for dinner, or how to dress their hair or what juicy snippets of gossip they can pass on. Her eyes were huge. She swallowed. I never thought of it like that. Nobody ever does. She bent and picked a long stem of grass and twirled it pensively. Why do you want to marry me, then? She glanced at him, a faint blush on her cheeks. He didn't think it was the heat. I was so rude to you from the beginning. He laughed. That's what I found so interesting. For most of my adult life, I've been of little interest to anyone. Certainly not a desirable marriage prospect. Then my uncle died unexpectedly. And suddenly, I was a viscount and the heir to an earldom, and then everything I said or did was so interesting. And the matchmaking mamas were all over me, and every unmarried young lady was flirting and flattering me and doing their best to hook me. She snorted, not me. I know, and that's what first attracted my attention. She frowned, but it wasn't some ploy to be different. Oh, I know that. He let his gaze drift so somewhere over her left shoulder and murmured, That woman over there is wearing the largest turban I've ever seen in my life. I wonder how she makes it stay on. She half turned to look and then remembered. She blushed. Yes, well, I was very badly behaved that night. I'm sorry. He laughed. Her dimple gave her away every time. I'm not. You were clever and cheeky and gorgeous and so determined to drive me away, it made me want to get to know you better. She grimaced. And then you found out who I really was, the daughter of a blackmailing scoundrel. Will you stop saying that? he snapped. You are not your father, and I don't want to hear that nonsense ever again. Their eyes met for a long, intense moment. Then a cow mooed and broke the silence. I might not be like my father, but that doesn't mean I'll fit into your society. Your mother hates me. She hates everyone, 
My grandmother will adore you. She shook her head. Not if she knows the truth. I'm sorry, Gerald. I know you think it would work. But I know that if I married you, I would end up getting things wrong and embarrassing you and myself. And I refuse to be looked down on. How will you know you will? Because I always have been. My education is scrappy. I attended five different schools and never finished the year at any of them. I never did learn all the ladylike skills. And when people look down on me and try to make me feel small and inferior, well, I have a temper. I push back. And not always in a ladylike way. He raised an ironic brow. And yet, from what I heard, you handled my mother brilliantly and in a superbly ladylike manner. Oh, a blush rose to her cheek. You heard about that? I did. And in the diplomatic service, brains, charm, and the ability to think on your feet are just as important as society connections, maybe even more important. She pulled a sceptical face, which is why most diplomats are titled. If you married me, you'd be titled too. Now, let us continue this discussion after we reach Grandmama's. She's expecting us, and if we don't arrive before dark, she'll worry. Frowning, she twisted the grass stalk into a knot, then tossed it away. All right, I'll go to your grandmother's. But I warn you, I'm going to tell her everything. Chapter 16 Alice's idyll was over. It was time to go home. They'd spent four days in the little cottage, eating, talking, and making love. Alice had never passed such a blissful time in her life. Truth be told, she never wanted to leave. It was difficult being a mistress, she thought as she packed. Glorious, but also tough on the emotions. Once they were back in their normal lives, it would all be different. They'd have to be discreet. They couldn't see each other whenever they wanted. They wouldn't wake up together, wouldn't make love in the middle of the night and again in the morning, wouldn't eat breakfast together, in bed, in such a delightfully decadent fashion as they had. No more evening strolls in the twilight, coming home to a cosy fire, a simple dinner and a glass of wine, and bed. She'd learned so much about her body, and his, in the last four days. She was saturated with pleasure, more than pleasure. The last few days had given her a new understanding of herself, and not just in bed, though that had been glorious and eye-opening. When the weather had allowed, they'd gone for long walks and in bed or out of it, they'd talked and talked and talked of everything. Stories of their past, thoughts about the world, even favourite books, because James was a reader. Alice couldn't have imagined a more perfect time. But now, it was over. This has been the happiest four days and nights of my life, she told James as they waited for the carriage to collect them. I'm glad. He wrapped his arms around her and kissed her, a long, passionate kiss. Can we do it again, sometime? The chaise arrived as she spoke. What, come here, do you mean? Why not? I paid the rent for a couple of months. He grinned down at her and opened the front door. It can be our secret getaway place. They travelled back to London in relative silence. Alice, with James's arm wrapped around her, felt a little blue. James appeared to be lost in thought. 
It hardly seemed to take any time at all before they were pulling up outside Bel Air Gardens. Too public a place for one last kiss, so James simply pulled out her valise and handed it to Tweed, then said a polite goodbye, his eyes said more, and left. How is your friend, milady? Tweed asked. Alice blinked and then remembered. All better now, thank you. She pulled herself together and walked up the stairs. James had made no attempt to speak of marriage again. Not this time, not any more. She was his mistress now, and mistresses didn't ask to be married. Ironic that now she was ready to take the plunge, he'd changed his mind. It was her own fault. Had she had more courage, she might have had it all. Marriage to James, and the glory of going to bed with him. But she'd chosen to become his mistress instead, and now she had to live with her choice. And she would, according to her new principle to live by. No regrets. She'd had four glorious days and nights in James's arms and she didn't regret them in the least. Gerald's grandmother, Lady Stornoway, was a bit of a surprise. She'd obviously been a beauty in her day, and was still very good-looking in a plump old lady way. Her silver hair was swept up in a stylish arrangement, and she was simply but fashionably dressed. She welcomed them warmly, and once they'd refreshed themselves after the journey, settled them down in a comfortable, elegantly appointed sitting room with sherry and biscuits. Congratulations on your betrothal, dear boy, she said to Gerald. I suppose Almeria is delighted. Not exactly, he admitted. Not at all, Lucy said. The old lady turned to Lucy with a faint frown. My daughter doesn't approve of you. Lucy grimaced. Your daughter despises me. Lady Stornoway brightened. Really? Yes, really. And also, Gerald and I are not betrothed. Not really, Lucy said, making a clean breast of it. We are betrothed, Gerald insisted and it's still official as far as society is concerned. Lady Stornoway gave them a shrewd look. Quarrelled, have you? No, Lucy said. It was never a proper betrothal in the first place. It was a, a stratagem, and I didn't want to lie to you about it. The old lady sipped her sherry. Fascinating. Tell me more. So Lucy explained. She didn't leave anything out. Not her lack of family, her irregular upbringing, her many schools, and her time as pupil maidservant to Frau Steiner and the Countess. From time to time, Gerald interrupted to add something. But for the most part, he let her tell her own story. She'd just reached the part about her father's blackmail of Alice and her consequent entry into the ton when the butler announced dinner. With the old lady's encouragement, she related that little episode over the soup. And you say my daughter dislikes you, Lady Stornoway said when Lucy had finished. Lucy nodded. She didn't like to stress how much. Most edifying, the old lady said. She turned to her grandson. Now, Gerald, you mentioned in your letter that you had decided to enter the diplomatic corps. How is that going? While Gerald explained, Lucy ate her dinner. She was rather taken aback. The old lady had barely reacted to Lucy's confession and had simply moved on to the next topic of conversation, as if it were perfectly normal to hear about blackmail and deception. Bemused, 
Lucy caught Gerald's eye and raised her brows in a silent question. He simply shrugged and went on telling his grandmother about his plans for his future career. And then he filled her in on the news of various acquaintances she had in London. And at the end of the meal, the old lady rose from the table and said, A most interesting meal. Thank you. Now, I expect you're very tired after your long journey. We keep early hours here, so I'll bid you both good night. She left. Lucy looked at Gerald, totally bewildered. I don't understand. She didn't even react. Gerald shrugged. No one can ever tell what Grandmama is thinking. Just go to bed and try to sleep. I'll see you in the morning. Which was no help at all. The following morning after breakfast, Lady Stornoway invited Lucy to go for a drive around the estate. Just Lucy, she said. Gerald could entertain himself. Lucy swallowed her misgivings and fetched her shawl. They set out in a smart little Tilbury. Lady Stornoway drove. There was no groom. It was clear the old lady wanted a private conversation with Lucy. Despite breakfast, Lucy's stomach felt hollow. Lady Stornoway was, after all, Almeria's mother. For the first twenty minutes, the old lady simply pointed out local sights. Lucy's tension mounted. What was the purpose of this drive? Finally, they drew up outside an old cottage with a thatched roof and a crooked chimney. It was small and neat, but not particularly prepossessing. They contemplated it for a few minutes. Were they going to visit someone? Children and hens ran about in the yard, and when the children saw Lady Stornoway, they ran eagerly toward the carriage, calling out greetings. Lady Stornoway smiled and produced a bag of sweets, but apart from exhorting the recipient to share them out fairly, she made no move to get down, and no adult came out to greet her. I expect you're wondering what we're doing here, Lady Stornoway said after a while. Lucy couldn't deny it. I was born in that cottage. Lucy turned to her, shocked. You were? The old lady nodded. I have no connection with the tenants now, except as Lady of the Manor. But when I was a girl... Papa was a tenant farmer, not a particularly good one. But how did I end up a lady? Lucy nodded. I married Gerald's grandfather, she smiled. There was a terrible fuss at the time, but we didn't care. We were in love. Albert got a special license, and we went off and got married without anyone being the wiser. Then he took me to London, to a top modiste, and had me dressed from the skin out. That's your first lesson, my girl, and I can see you've already learned it. It's hard for people to put you down when you're better dressed than they are, and with the right clothes, you feel up to anything. Lucy agreed. Wearing Miss Chance's dresses, she felt quite different from the girl who'd arrived in London in that horrid, frilly pink dress. So now you know where I came from. She glanced at Lucy and chuckled. That's why my daughter, Almeria, is so frightfully top lofty. Living me down, you see, or imagining she is. Really, nobody worth anything gives tuppence about my background. Oh, some might whisper about it behind my back, but how does that hurt me? 
It's who you are and what you do and say that's important, not where you come from. Are you listening to me, Gail? Of course I am. Lucy's brain was whirling. So, you need not have any qualms about marrying my grandson. Lady Stornoway snapped the reins and the Tilbury moved on. If you're young and in love, you should marry. But Gerald and I are not in love. The old lady gave her a sardonic glance. Pish tush, you told me you weren't going to lie to me. Lucy blushed. You care for my grandson, don't you? Lucy hesitated, then nodded. Yes, but, but nothing. Now you listen to me, my girl. You don't get many chances for happiness in this life. And when you get one, you need to seize it and hang on to it. But what about seize it and make it work? Be the woman you want to be and take no nonsense from anyone. She eyed Lucy shrewdly. You don't want people to look down on you, and I appreciate that. But you're also thinking of Gerald, aren't you? Lucy nodded. I wouldn't want to embarrass him. Then don't. He's chosen you out of all the silly high-born widgeons who've been setting their caps at him for the last couple of years. Gerald takes after his grandfather, my Albert. He knows what he wants. Conversation paused as they negotiated a shallow ford. Then she continued, If Gerald is the man you want, then take him and make it work. But be the woman you are, not the woman you imagine he ought to want. That's the quickest way to drive a wedge between you. Be honest with each other. And for God's sake, talk things over. A flock of sheep surged down the road toward them, and the carriage stopped as the sheep flowed around it. The shepherd tugged his forelock to Lady Stornoway and nodded at Lucy. And forget about separate bedrooms, the old lady said, when the buying of the sheep had become sufficiently distant. Bed is where you and your husband will do the best talking, before or after you make love. She darted a glance at Lucy. Shocked you, have I? Lucy laughed. A bit. Good. I like to shock people every now and then. Stops people taking me for granted. You should think about doing that, too. It's all so enormous fun. Lucy laughed again. A few minutes later, Lady Stornoway said thoughtfully, And you know, your father, scoundrel as he undoubtedly is, didn't give you such a bad start in life. Lucy turned to her in surprise, but the old lady continued, He put you in good schools, even if only for a limited time. And there are worse assets a diplomat's wife can have than fluency in two major European languages, not to mention an ability to adjust to new situations. And giving you to Alice Payton to launch was a stroke of genius, even though his methods were wicked. Lucy frowned. She had never considered Papa's actions in that light. But now that she thought about it, there was something in what Lady Stornoway said. They reached Stornoway Manor, and the old lady handed over the reins to a groom. I enjoyed our little chat, Miss Bamber, and I hope you'll think about what I said. Gerald came out to greet them and helped his grandmother down. This girl she said to him, if you let her get away, you're not the man I hope you are. He grinned. Grandmama, I will do my best not to disappoint you. Lucy didn't know where to look. 
Gerald took Lucy straight into the small sitting room. See, my grandmother knows everything, and she still approves of you. So, can we agree that the betrothal stands? And when we get back to London, we can start to make arrangements for the wedding. He reached for her, but she pushed his hands away. Are you sure, Gerald? Because I need you to be very sure. Sure of what? That I'll make you happy? All I can promise is that I'll try my very best. His eyes darkened. Am I sure that I love you? Oh, yes. I'm very, very sure of that. Lucy's heart missed a beat, and then started to thump in a rapid tattoo. Stunned, she stared at Gerald. You love me? Of course I love you, you goose. Haven't I made it obvious? Don't call me a goose. She was breathless, shocked, poised between tears and laughter. But you love geese. And so do I, ever since we were introduced by a goose called Ghislaine. He reached for her again, but she stepped away. Stop it. Be serious and think about how it would be. There is so much I don't know about how high society works. I'm never sure about precedence, for instance. You can learn. Or how to address a duke or a marquis. You'll pick it up, you're very clever. Then there's all that cutlery at those big formal dinners. Work from the outside in. See? You know all that stuff without even thinking. Because you were born to it. I wasn't. He caught her hands in his. None of that stuff, none of it matters. I love you, and I want to marry you. There is only one reason I will accept that you can't marry me. Her insides tightened. And what's that? That you don't love me. There was a long pause. She eyed him from under lowered lashes, then made a frustrated sound. There was a limit to self-sacrifice. Oh, very well. But if, when, I mess up and embarrass you and make terrible mistakes and inadvertently insult important people or unimportant ones, you must never reproach me or blame me or yell at me. Because I won't allow it, do you hear? If you take me, you take me warts and all. He grinned. That's my girl. Didn't you hear me? I heard every word. His smile widened. And I understood you too. You love me. How did he know? I didn't say that. Of course you did. He drew her into his arms and kissed her and giving up all thoughts of directing him to a better match. She kissed him back, with all the pent-up love in her heart. Now, he murmured after a while. Somehow, they'd moved to the sofa. Where are these warts you mentioned? She shoved him lightly on the arm. I don't have any warts, you fool. Oh, well, nobody's perfect. He gave her one more long, luscious kiss. Then, hearing footsteps outside in the hall, he sat up with a sigh. We'd better save things for the wedding night. Then we'd better make the wedding soon. He laughed and hugged her again, a wench after my own heart. The bands will be called for the third time this Sunday. We can wed any time after that. Or sooner, if you like, with a special license. As long as Alice is there, I don't mind. And Grandmama. She will want to attend, if only to watch my mother gnashing her teeth. She laughed. And I'd like a new dress. Something she hadn't worn before. Naturally. And a trousseau, I suppose. He sighed. I can see the date stretching further into the future. No, the clothes don't matter. Only the people. 
She wound her arms around his neck and kissed him again. I do love you, Gerald. I know. When they arrived back in Bel Air Gardens, Alice took one look at them and hugged first Lucy, then Gerald. I'm so pleased. You two are finally smelling of April and May. You've sorted things out, haven't you? Lucy's blush and Gerald's possessive grin confirmed it. They were in love. Gerald left, and Alice and Lucy decided to go to Miss Chance's establishment after lunch to order Lucy's wedding dress. Alice couldn't help feeling a little wistful, but she pushed those thoughts aside. No regrets. They were in the hall debating whether they would need umbrellas or not, when the front doorbell jangled furiously. Tweed had barely opened the door when Gerald burst in, waving a small, slender book bound in red leather. On the cover, elegantly tooled in gold, was the title, Letters to a Mistress by a Noble Gentleman. That unprincipled swine Bamber has broken his word. He's published those damned letters. For a moment, Alice thought she was going to faint or throw up. Alice, are you all right? Lucy led her into the drawing room where she sank onto the sofa. Are you sure they're the letters that Thaddeus wrote? It was a foolish question. Of course, Gerald was sure. See for yourself. Gerald offered her the book, but she waved it away. She didn't want to touch the vile thing, let alone read it. An advance copy was sent to my father, Gerald continued. They don't use names, of course, but most of the ton will understand who Lord C and Lady C and Mrs. J are, especially given the scandalous way Uncle Thaddeus died in Mrs. Jennings' bed. Papa didn't read it, but Mama did, from cover to cover. I stole her copy. Alice groaned. The doorbell jangled again, and this time it was James who burst into the room. Have you heard? He broke off, seeing the small red book in Gerald's hand. I see you have. He crossed the room in two steps and sat down beside Alice, taking her hands in his. Are you all right? She nodded. Just a bit shaken. I thought we were finished with all that. I'm sorry. Lucy croaked. I'm so, so sorry. It's not your fault, Alice assured her. I should have known. How could you possibly have known? Lucy's eyes were tragic. It's not like Papa to pass up an opportunity to make money. And, oh, that's what he meant by that last part in his letter. When he apologized to you, Alice, and claimed he had no choice, I thought at the time he was apologizing for the blackmail. Why didn't I realize there was more to it? No choice indeed. She bit her lip, then glanced at Gerald. Is there nothing we can do? There certainly is, James said decisively. I only came here to warn you. I'm off to the publishers. He picked up letters to a mistress and pocketed it. I'll do what I can to stop this nasty little book from being distributed. I'll come with you, Gerald said. Alice rose to her feet, a little shaky but determined. I'll go too. James shook his head. It would be better if you didn't. So far, given that only initials have been used, there's nothing concrete to link you with the book. But if you're seen going into the publishers... Alice could see his point, but she didn't like it. But I can't just sit here and wait. That would be too feeble for words. Lucy linked her arm through Alice's. We planned to go shopping this morning. It's probably the last thing either of us feels like doing, but... Alice took a shaky breath, then nodded. Lucy was looking pale and shamefaced. The poor girl must be feeling dreadful about her father's betrayal. 
This morning, after Gerald had left, Lucy had been radiantly happy. Now she looked pinched and miserable. Alice could wring Bamber's neck. Very well, it's not the kind of bold action I'd prefer. But I will not allow this horrid little book to get in the way of your wedding plans. So, we will go out and shop, in style, heads held high. James squeezed her hands. That's the spirit. Come, Gerald, let us deal with this grubby little publisher. The publisher's premises was a narrow building in a lane off Fleet Street. It was a small operation, and as James and Gerald entered, they could see men and women at work, printing, binding, and packing books, all with red linen bindings and bearing the title Letters to a Mistress. The leather ones that had gone out were no doubt to entice members of the ton to open them. Elegant and salacious and vicious. Their entry caused a stir, but there was no lull in the activity. A plump, fussily dressed little man peered out from an office and emerged smiling. Ebenezer Green at your service, gentlemen. How can I help you? James pulled the small red book from his pocket. You are responsible for this, I believe? The smile vanished. Yes, Green said cautiously. What do you? The original letters, if you please, James said crisply. The orig? Green glanced toward his office. I don't know what you're talking about. What letters? The letters you've printed in this grubby little book. James seized him by the collar. Now, unless you want to see the inside of a prison cell. He marched the man into his office and thrust him with a shove toward a large iron safe. But, 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 those letters were obtained illegally, and I will have no hesitation in prosecuting you to the limit of the law. Now, give me the letters, and I will be prepared to purchase all the copies currently printed. Otherwise, there was a crash from the room outside. Green rushed out. My forms! No, you can't! Can't what? Gerald said, heaving another frame full of print to the floor and smashing it up with his boots. Tiny metal letters burst from their confinement and scattered across the floor. The workers, some of whom were women, stood back watching. Nobody seemed interested in interfering. Gerald picked up another frame and tipped it onto the ground. The wooden frame shattered. Pages of type broke into a thousand pieces, becoming meaningless. James smiled. No chance of reprinting the book now. Green moaned and wrung his hands. James said, so far we're only interested in preventing you from printing any more copies of this nasty little publication. But if I don't get those letters, my friend and I will destroy your printing press as well as the, what did you call them? The forms. I fancy a press will be harder to replace. Another form crashed to the floor. Another sixteen pages destroyed. Tiny metal letters were scattered everywhere. No, no, I beg you, stop it. I bought those letters in good faith. Vile letters that don't deserve to see the light of day. Crash. It sounded as though Gerald was enjoying himself. James glanced at the printing press and said meditatively, I've never tried to destroy a printing press before, but it can't be too difficult. Oh, please, no. The plump little man was almost weeping. I'll give you the cursed letters just to leave my press alone. He hurried into his office, opened the safe, and pulled out a thick sheaf of letters tied with a ribbon. Here, take them, and then leave. James flicked through the sheaf. They'd better all be here, because if not, 
They're all there, I assure you. All that that wretched man sold me. It's him you should be punishing, not me. You're both despicable, James said coldly. He held up the leather-bound copy. How many of these did you send out? Green glanced at a piece of paper on his desk. Twenty-five, he said sulkily. They cost a fortune, too. That's the list, is it? Good. James picked it up, glanced at the list of names, and pocketed it, ignoring Green's protests. He returned to the print room and held up the book to the watching workers. There is a large black carriage waiting in the lane outside. Sixpence for every box of these books that you load into it. My coachman is expecting you. He will keep tally and pay you. The workers glanced at one another, then rushed to grab boxes of books and carry them downstairs. In minutes, not a single box or book remained. James glanced around the room and gave a satisfied nod. He turned to Green and held out a ten-pound note. Green eyed it suspiciously. What's that for? To pay for the books, of course, James said in a bland voice. You're paying me for them? He said incredulously. James arched an eyebrow. Naturally, I'm not a thief. Green glanced at the shambles that was his printing works, but he didn't utter a word. Did you have enough money? James asked his coachman when he went downstairs. Yes, my lord, with three and six left over. Keep it. James and Gerald fitted themselves in around the boxes of books. That was fun, Gerald said as they drove off. Filthy work, though, ruined my gloves. He pulled his ink-stained gloves off and tossed them out of the window. Probably wrecked my boots, too, but it was worth it. After a moment, he added, Lucky your coachman had enough change on him. James gave him a sideways glance. Luck never came into it. You should know from your years in the army that preparation is all. Of course, clever. After a moment, Gerald asked, What will you do with all these books? Burn them. They drove in silence for a while. You don't look as happy as I expected, Gerald said. I thought it went quite well. James shook his head. These damned leather-bound copies are still out there. Oh, hell, I never thought of that. How many do you think went out? Twenty-four, not counting your mother's copy. I got the list from Green while you were busy smashing things. You can't be sure that's what they were whispering about, Lucy insisted. She and Alice had returned from seeing Miss Chance. Alice had found the experience uncomfortable. The minute they'd arrived, two ladies in the shop had fallen silent. Then they'd started whispering, glancing at Alice from time to time as they did. Miss Chance had taken her and Lucy into the back for a private consultation. And when they returned, all the other ladies in the shop were covertly staring at Alice, some with expressions of sympathy, others with ill-disguised, salacious glee. It was obvious to her that they knew about the letters. I think we can assume that it was, Alice said. Gossip travels like wildfire. Tweed was hovering, looking concerned. He didn't know quite what was up, but he could tell she wasn't herself. Alice ordered tea and biscuits. Lucy frowned. What are we going to do about the Reynolds ball tomorrow night? What, indeed? Alice was warmed by Lucy's use of we, indicating she would loyally stand by Alice. 
But by tomorrow night, barely a soul in the tun would be unaware of the letters. Word of mouth would happen first. Whispers carried from house to house during morning calls, and details shared and discussed. Details of the most humiliating moments of her past, brought to life by Thaddeus's clever, vicious pen. Scandalous stories about one of their own. Servants would be sent to the bookshops. The books would fly off the shelves and later be passed around. James and Gerald arrived, and Alice called for more biscuits and a fresh pot. James asked for a fire to be lit, which was odd because it wasn't a cold day. But she asked Tweed to light the fire anyway. While the fire was getting started, and the tea and biscuits were being handed around, Gerald enthusiastically described their adventure at the publishers. And now, here's something for you, James said, passing a small bundle to Alice. A thick sheaf of letters bound with a puce ribbon. And suddenly, Alice realized why he'd wanted a fire lit. She received the letters with nerveless fingers. You do want to destroy them, I presume? James said when she'd sat in silence for several minutes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. She knelt before the fire, pulled the ribbon off, and fed the letters one by one into the fire. She watched as each one smoked and twisted then burst into flames. Sparks danced up the chimney, leaving a pile of grey ash behind. With every letter burned, she felt lighter, freer. It was a cathartic experience. She was purging herself of Thaddeus, finally and forever. The last letter curled up and crumpled into ash, and she dusted off her hands and rose. Turning, she saw the little red leather book sitting on the side table. She would like to burn it, too, but it would make a terrible stench, and she didn't want it polluting her home. The purge was not yet complete, but she felt so much better already. Did you secure all the copies? she asked. All but the leather-bound copies that were sent out in advance. James said. Like that one of Mama's. Gerald indicated his copy. Don't worry, we'll get them back, James assured her. There are only twenty-four, and I have a list. Yes, but if Almeria had already read it cover to cover, then others would have. Alice could tell by his sombre expression that James knew that. Pandora's box was already open. Maybe we should send our apologies to Lady Reynolds, Lucy said. She and Sir Alan are very kind. They'll understand. Lord, yes, the Reynolds ball tomorrow night, Gerald exclaimed. I forgot about that. Of course you won't want to go. James nodded. If you like, I could take you and my girls. Lucy, too, of course, to Towers, my country estate. We could stay there as long as you want. Wait until this thing blows over. Alice sipped her tea in silence. Run from the gossip? Hide? Thaddeus had already done his best to ruin her life. Now it was Bamber, using Thaddeus's words from the grave. And what a fool she'd been to trust the promise of a blackmailer. She thought about her sister-in-law, Almeria, avidly devouring the letters that shamed her. She thought about the ladies in Miss Chance's shop and their ill-natured whispering. She put down her cup with a snap. I've had enough. They all looked at her cup, which was three-quarters full. I won't run. I won't hide. I refuse to be a victim a moment longer. 
they blinked at her in surprise. I am eight and thirty years old, and I don't care what others think of me. Especially ill-natured gossips who mouth pious words of sympathy while secretly enjoying my misfortune. She gestured to the ash in the fireplace. I am not the same girl whose misery those letters described so despicably. I am a different woman now. My own woman. And I refuse to hide away from awkward social encounters or cower in the country, no matter how beautiful and welcoming I'm sure Towers is. Her glance took in all of them. This horrid little book will reveal people for who they truly are. You, my friends, offered instant support. There will be a few others I know. And those who don't, those who secretly revel in what they will see as my humiliation. Well, who needs that sort of friend anyway? Not I. She rose to her feet, and I am going to the ball. Brava, James applauded, and the others joined in. So, Cinders, he said, when the excitement and congratulations had died down. What time shall I bring the pumpkin around to collect you? Chapter 17 In the carriage going to the ball, Lucy sat beside Gerald, and Alice and James sat opposite. Alice was obviously tense, her face pale and tight in the faint transient light inside the carriage. But she was going to the ball determined not to be cowed by the ugly situation she was in. The ugly situation Lucy's papa had put her in. Lucy hoped that one day she'd have the courage Alice was showing. Alice was an extraordinary woman. She'd taken in Lucy unwillingly, purely because of papa's blackmail. And yet, with every reason to despise her, Alice had made Lucy feel like a friend or a beloved daughter. Even when Papa had abandoned her, Alice had insisted Lucy must stay, that she had a home with Alice for as long as she needed. And now, despite all Alice's goodness to Lucy, she was being punished. The shame of it scorched Lucy, even though she knew it wasn't her fault but she was determined to make it up to Alice somehow. She nudged Gerald, leaned closer, and whispered in his ear, I have a plan. It was obvious from the moment they arrived that Lady Reynolds knew about the book, for she stepped forward, seized Alice's hands in hers, and said warmly, I am so very glad you came tonight, my dear. One would have understood if you chose not to, of course. But I am so very proud of you for coming. If there is anything my husband or I can do to support you in this difficult time, please don't hesitate to say so. She squeezed Alice's hands. And don't worry, you have many friends here. Beside her. Tall Sir Alan Reynolds gave a nod and added gruffly, Your late husband deserved a flogging for writing such filthy stuff. Never liked the fella. Alice thanked them both, blinking back incipient tears. When you were braced for spite and scandal, unexpected warmth and kindness could so easily unravel you. Nevertheless, their greeting reminded her that most people here tonight would either have read some of the letters or heard about them. I am no longer that girl, she reminded herself. In fact, she added in her mental conversation, I don't think I ever was the girl that Thaddeus's letters described. It was a freeing thought. Thaddeus never knew her at all. 
Lady Peplow met her in the hallway and drew Alice aside. Are you all right, my dear? I've heard some disquieting rumours about a book. I know all about it, Alice said. It's a vile and hateful thing, but I'm... I'm damned if I let my husband ruin my life a second time. Yes, anger was better than nerves. Good for you. Lady Peplow gave her a searching look. Do I understand that you... She glanced to where James was waiting and trailed off delicately, letting her eyebrows do the talking. Alice felt herself blushing, but she was proud, not embarrassed. Yes, I did. And you were right. With the right man, it's perfectly splendid. Lady Peplow clapped her hands. Oh, wonderful. A martial expression came over her face. Now, let us see what we can do to squash these vile rumours. She sailed off into the ballroom, a woman on a mission. With her hand on James's arm and Gerald and Lucy following behind, Alice took a deep breath and entered the ballroom. The loud buzz of conversation faltered and died away. Hundreds of eyes swiveled toward her. Silence hung in the air for an instant. Someone said something and sniggered loudly. Then the buzz started again, lower but more intense. Alice stiffened her backbone. The darting glances, the nods, the whispers, the snickers and murmurs, they were nothing she hadn't expected and she would not be cowed by them. Head held high, she moved farther into the ballroom. Murmuring, good luck, Alice. Gerald and Lucy melted away to join a group of young people. Alice was a little surprised, but didn't blame them. This was not their problem. Her gaze swept the room, and for a brief panic-stricken moment, she didn't recognize a soul. Then she spied Lady Peplow, standing with Lady Jersey, one of the patronesses of Almax, on the other side of the room. With them stood plump little Princess Esterhazy, and several other ladies she recognized, acknowledged leaders of society. Lady Peplow smiled and gave a little nod, then to Alice's amazement, Lady Jersey lifted a white-gloved hand and graciously beckoned her over. Alice blinked. She didn't know Lady Jersey very well, but she'd always liked her, and she took heart from Lady Peplow's expression. Feigning indifference to the attention she was receiving, Alice strolled across the floor. Her heart was thudding. She felt hollow inside. What did Lady Jersey want with her? That's my brave girl, James murmured. Show em you don't give a damn. She was very glad of his support and his strong arm. To her relief, Lady Peplow and Lady Jersey came forward with warm smiles. Lady Charlton, my dear, what a despicable worm your late husband was, Lady Jersey said affably. And aren't we all glad he's dead and undoubtedly roasting in the other place? Now, are we showing everyone that we don't care what he wrote, or are we pretending those letters weren't about you? The combination of warmth and brisk pragmatism surprised a laugh out of Alice, I don't know. Both? Lady Jersey laughed, then turned to James. Good evening, Lord Tarrant. Now I'm sure you want to stay glued to her side playing watchdog, but leave this nasty little affair to the ladies, if you please. James hesitated. Alice? 
Alice nodded to him. She had no idea what was going on, but she was intrigued. Princess Esterhazy, the pretty young wife of the Austrian ambassador, imperiously waved James away. Such confidence for one so young, Alice thought. She supposed it had a lot to do with being a princess. Now, to business, Lady Jersey said. My friends and I were outraged by those vile letters, Lady Charlton. Oh, they might have been written about you, though you must never admit it. But we all agree it could have been any one of us, had we been married off to that brute. She fixed Alice with a determined look and repeated, any one of us. The only difference was that you had no family to support you and nobody to stand up for you. And you were so young. It's unforgivable. And those letters are a slur against all womankind, not just you. A lump formed in Alice's throat. Lady Jersey slipped an arm through Alice's. I am so sorry that we didn't know how Badly, you needed support back then. My friends and I have realized that we allowed your husband to isolate you in those early days, when you were new to London society, and we were all so young and careless. Shameful behavior, but it is all in the past, and we shall not dwell on it. We will, however, help you now. She gestured to the other ladies, standing a short distance away. Alice knew all the ladies, though not particularly well. Each one of them was influential in society. They hurried forward and surrounded her, expressing sympathy and indignation on her behalf. Now, now, that's enough sympathy. Lady Jersey said crisply. You'll bring Lady Charlton to tears, and we don't want that. Time to get on with our plan. Your plan? Alice repeated, bemused. Yes, of course. She gave Alice a curious look. Didn't you come with a plan? Not really. Just to attend the ball and show everyone that I don't care what my husband wrote about me. Excellent spirit, but it will take more than that. Come along. At her brisk gesture, some of the ladies split off in pairs and joined other groups, leaving Alice with Lady Jersey, Lady Peplow, and Princess Esterhazy. James had drifted away as instructed, though he was keeping a protective eye on her from a distance. Lucy and Gerald seemed happily occupied, moving from group to group of young people, chatting and smiling. Alice turned and saw Almeria, and several of her cronies approaching, their expressions smug. Her mind went blank for a second. Then she braced herself. Stepping away from her companions, she didn't want them to be exposed to Almeria's spite. Alice greeted them politely. Almeria, Lady Beamish, Mrs. Scoria. How delightful to see you. Are you enjoying this charming party? Lady Reynolds has done a beautiful job with the flowers, don't you think? The orchestra was tuning up. She seized on it. Oh, I do believe the dancing is about to start. Almeria's lips thinned. I am surprised you had the audacity to show your face tonight, Alice. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Alice managed a brittle laugh and self-consciously smoothed down her skirts. Oh, dear, you have recognized my old ball dress. I did have it made over by my maid, but you have such an eagle eye for fashion, Almeria, do you not? It wasn't an old ball dress at all, but Almeria wouldn't remember. Almeria's eyes became slits of irritation. I'm not talking about your dress, as you very well know. I'm talking about that disgraceful book. 
She broke off, and her eyes widened with malicious delight. Or don't you know about it yet? Alice inclined her head curiously. What book are you talking about? Mrs. Scoria smirked and pulled out a small red leather volume. This one, of course, Letters to a Mistress. Everyone is talking about it, Almeria added. I cannot believe you haven't seen it. Oh, you must read it. Her eyes were gleaming with relish. Alice's hands had stopped shaking. She was furious. She hadn't expected Almeria to support her in any way. But this barely repressed glee was too much. May I? She held out her hand. Mrs. Scoria hesitated, glanced at Almeria, then with a faint shrug, handed the book to Alice. Alice glanced at it, flipped open the pages, raised her brows, and said, Good heavens! Then she smiled at Mrs. Scoria. Thank you for the loan. I'll read it later. A ball is no place for reading novels. Ignoring Mrs. Scoria's dismayed exclamation, she popped it in her reticule. It's not a novel, Almeria said, her voice laced with spite. It's a book of letters written by someone very close to you. Oh, I doubt that, Alice said. She'd never been close to Thaddeus. Almeria leaned forward and hissed angrily. Those letters are about you, Alice, and they're utterly scandalous. You're a disgrace to the family. Lady Jersey had come up behind Alice and overheard. Rubbish, she said coldly. The only disgrace to his family is the writer of those obscene letters, she snorted. Call himself a noble gentleman, does he? He's obviously some member of the gutter press. No gentleman would write about his wife in such a manner. I'm surprised you fell for it, Almeria. It is about her, Almeria insisted. I know it is. How do you know? Princess Esterhazy demanded, her dark eyes snapping. Are you responsible, perhaps, for the publishing of this filthy material? Is this why you are so obviously happy about it? Almeria gasped and went white. Her two friends gave her sideways glances and moved away. No, of course not. I knew nothing about it until someone, someone anonymous, sent it to my husband. And I'm not at all happy about it. It's, it's a dreadful scandal. Princess Esterhazy sniffed. And yet, you seem determined to spread this scandal around and to blame your sister-in-law, who surely is an innocent in all this, no? She shook her head, sending the plumes in her headdress, waving. Most peculiar. Lady Jersey nodded. Yes, extraordinarily bad form to be trying to whip up a scandal about your own family. Not to mention stupid, ill-natured and pathetic. She paused to let her words sink in. Come, Lady Charlton. No, not you, Almeria. I mean, the young Lady Charlton. She linked her arm with Alice's, then paused and glanced back. I hope you don't intend to spread that vicious, wholly mistaken gossip, Almeria. We would not look on it kindly if you did. It was not quite the royal we, but coming from a patroness of Almax, it carried much the same weight. Alice circled the room with Lady Jersey, Princess Esterhazy, and Lady Peplow, greeting people, stopping to chat, nothing of consequence, and with no mention of a little red book. 
but it was a clear demonstration of support. The music started, and young people filled the dance floor. The first dance was an energetic country dance, the second a cotillion. As the sets for the second dance were forming, Lady Peplow nudged Alice and glanced over her shoulder. Alice turned, and her heart sank. Her brother-in-law, Thaddeus's brother, was marching toward her, his expression grim. She had no doubt she was the reason for his attendance tonight. Edmund almost never attended balls or parties. She swallowed and turned to face him. Edmund. He bowed stiffly. Dance with me, Alice. She tried to hide her surprise. The number of times she'd seen Edmund dance could be counted on one hand. But she gave him her hand and allowed him to lead her onto the floor. Owe you an apology, Alice, on behalf of my brother. His behaviour toward you was unconscionable, indefensible. Realise that now. Alice blinked. It was the last thing she would have expected from him. Thank you, Edmund, she said as they took their places in the set. I appreciate it. He gave a brisk nod. Then the dance began. They danced, Edmund stiff but correct. He never said another word, and at the end he escorted her off the dance floor, bowed to her and left the ball. Are you all right? James came up to her. He wasn't rude to you, was he? No. Alice was still a little bemused. In fact, he apologised for my husband's behaviour. She glanced at the door Edmund had disappeared through. I think the only reason he came tonight was to dance with me in a demonstration of family solidarity. Good, so he should. Another gentleman, the husband of one of Lady Peplow's friends, appeared and asked Alice for the next dance. Then she danced with Gerald, then Lord Peplow, who apologised for being out of practice. Alice danced every dance. The whispers and spiteful looks continued, but they'd lessened, and the kindness she was receiving, much of it from people she barely knew, outweighed the nastiness. It was wonderful, touching, and a bit overwhelming. The next dance was the waltz before supper, and Alice was engaged to dance it with James. The orchestra played a single loud chord, and she looked up and saw Sir Alan and Lady Reynolds standing on the orchestra dais. Sir Alan's deep voice rang out. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. A very important announcement is about to be made by one of our guests. A very exciting announcement, Lady Reynolds added with a smile. The crowd fell silent. To Alice's amazement, James stepped onto the platform and said, I am delighted to share with you all the news that Alice, Lady Charlton, has done me the honour of agreeing to become my wife. Please join us in celebrating. He held out his hand to Alice. There was a short, surprised silence. Then people began murmuring. Go on, up you go. Lady Peplow gave Alice a little push, and Alice started walking, dazed and a little confused. He'd made no mention of this. He hadn't even asked her to marry him. Not since. As she crossed the floor alone, running the gauntlet of the crowd for the second time, someone started clapping. And in seconds, everyone was clapping and calling congratulations. James stepped down from the dais and took her hand just as the orchestra began the waltz. What... I, she began, 
I can't kiss you in front of all these people, he said, but I can dance with you. And he swept her out onto the floor. They circled the floor once, the only couple dancing. Then Lady Jersey and a partner joined them, followed by Lord and Lady Peplow, Gerald and Lucy, Prince Esterhazy and the Ambassador, and their hosts, Sir Alan and Lady Reynolds. One by one, other couples joined them, and soon the dance floor was crowded with waltzing couples, many of whom expressed their congratulations to Alice and James as they twirled past. Alice danced blind, blinking back tears. Good tears, I hope, James murmured. She gave him a misty smile. By the time they went into supper, the atmosphere at the ball had changed. It had been impressed upon the spiteful ones who had been enjoying Alice's misfortune. For, as Lady Peplow had said to Alice, there would always be people who took pleasure in the misery of others, whether they knew them or not. That it would now be in very bad taste to refer to the things revealed in the little red book. Not only did Alice... Lady Charlton, have the support of some of the Tom's most influential ladies. She was newly betrothed, and it must therefore be treated as an occasion for celebration. Supper, and indeed the rest of the night, passed in a blur for Alice. There wasn't a moment that she could talk to James alone and ask him about his surprise, his astounding announcement of their betrothal. Had he had a change of heart about marrying his mistress? Or was it simply another public gesture of support? He was, after all, that sort of man. Protective, gallant, kind. But oh, the hope building inside her was an ache of yearning. By the time the ball was winding down and people were starting to leave, Alice was exhausted, but in a good way. She'd come, half excepting to be excoriated by society. But instead, she'd found friends she hadn't realised she had. And James had announced their betrothal. As they prepared for the carriage to arrive, Guests' carriages were lined up along the street. Lucy said something to a footman, who produced a covered basket, along with their other possessions, from the cloakroom. A basket, Lucy? Alice asked. You didn't bring that with you. What would she want with a basket? Alice had several she could have lent her. Lucy grinned her eyes dancing with mischief. I know, Lady Reynolds lent it to me. She handed the basket to Gerald. The carriage arrived and they climbed in. It's quite heavy, Gerald said, grinning. What's the total? Lucy bounced on her seat. Sixteen. What are you two talking about? James asked. While you two were dancing and chatting and getting betrothed, congratulations again, by the way. It's wonderful news, and I'm so excited for you. Lucy leaned across and kissed Alice on the cheek. We were busy. Busy doing what? In answer, Gerald passed the basket to James. Look inside. James lifted the cover and made a surprised exclamation. He pulled out a little red leather-bound book. There are sixteen copies in here. How on earth did you manage that? It was Lucy's idea, Gerald said. I just... Well, we, because Gerald was very good, spoke to all the young people we knew. Most of them had heard about the letters, and some had sneaked a look at them and thought they were horridly mean. 
So we asked them if they could get hold of their mothers, or aunts, or grandmothers, Gerald interjected. Copies of the book. Lucy grinned triumphantly. And sixteen people, that we know of, had brought the book with them to the ball. Seventeen, Alice said, pulling Mrs. Scoria's copy out of her reticule and tossing it into the basket. Seventeen copies, James said. With the one we already had from Gerald's mother, that means we only need to track down the last seven copies, and that'll be the end of that vile little book. The carriage arrived at Alice's house, and James handed both the ladies down. He glanced at Lucy, then said to Alice in a low voice, I'll call on you tomorrow morning, and we can talk then. Thus, ensuring she would get no sleep at all. As he turned to climb back into the carriage, Alice's hand shot out to grab him. I would rather we talked now. He eyed her a moment, glanced at Lucy again, then said to Gerald, I'll walk home. See you tomorrow. The carriage drove off. Lucy eyed them with speculative excitement. I'm sure you two won't want to be disturbed. You have so much to talk about. And with a mischievous wink, she skipped up the stairs to bed. Alice had told the servants not to wait up. They entered the sitting room, and James lit the fire which had been laid. He rose, dusting off his hands, and Alice came straight to the point. Why did you announce our betrothal tonight? Because I was angry at all the whispers. Because I wanted to slay dragons for you. But the only dragons I could see were wearing ball gowns. So I made the announcement to change the focus of the evening. And it did. You didn't mind, did you? My assumption of your assent. I was just surprised, that's all. I thought you'd changed your mind about wanting to marry me. Changed my mind? Why ever would I do that? Because, well, you hadn't asked me again, and once I became your mistress, you thought I wouldn't want you. He stared at her and rumpled his hair, perplexed. I thought our time at the cottage would have convinced you how passionately I do want you. I must be losing my touch. No, of course you haven't. But mistresses don't get proposals of marriage, do they? Not that I know what your touch was before. She broke off, embarrassed. A slow smile grew on his face. Before we anticipated our wedding vows with a spot of um. Several spots, in fact. And now that I come to think of it, spot is not at all accurate. A lavishness of um, a feast of um, a... Uh, I mean, even though I'd proved to you that I could enjoy the marriage bed, he held up a hand. Hold it right there, my sweet. It wasn't I who needed anything to be proved. I was already wholly and completely committed. You were the one with the doubts. Now, stop all this shilly-shallying. Will you marry me or not? Her heart filled, and she threw herself into his arms. Oh, James, of course I'll marry you. You won't regret it. I promise I'll make you a good wife. She thought he'd kiss her then, but he held back with a quizzical expression. A good wife? Like you pick out a good apple at the market, or a good pair of shoes? Of course, I'll do my best to be a good mother to your daughters as well, she added hastily. I know I could never compare with Selina, but... 
but nothing. He cut her off gently. Selina was the love of my youth. Yes, I loved her, and I will always love her memory. But you, my dearest Alice, are the love of my maturity, my beloved companion in this life. He drew her toward him. His voice deepened. My darling Alice, I didn't ask you to marry me because I thought you'd make a good wife and be a good mother to my daughters, though it goes without saying that you will. I want to marry you for only one reason. I'm madly, deeply, irrevocably in love with you, more than I ever knew was possible. Her hand flew to her mouth, and she took a shaky, inward breath. Truly, James? He cupped her face in his hand. Truly, Alice. I want to live the rest of my life with you in my life, in my bed, and in my heart. Her eyes sheened with tears, and he added, Is it so hard for you to believe? It was a little. In thirty-eight years, no one had ever told Alice they loved her. And now, here was this big, beautiful man, the embodiment of all her dreams, telling her he loved her. And oh, how she'd ached to hear it. Oh, James, I love you too, so very, very much. They kissed then, and for a while, time disappeared. A coal fell out of the fireplace, startling them, and they separated. James scooped it back into the fireplace and set a screen across it. Then to Alice's surprise, he locked the door. James? He surely didn't mean to. He winked. We don't want the servants coming in to investigate any strange sounds, do we? Strange sounds? Oh, my. No. Or Lucy. I have a feeling that nothing much will ever shock that young minx, he said as he swept her into his arms, laid her on the settee, and followed her down. Well... In that case, Alice pulled James's head down to hers and proceeded to show him how much she loved him. The fire was burning low. James and Alice lay on the settee, twined together in the dreamy aftermath of making love. She stirred sleepily and woke. James smoothed the hair back from her face. Lord, she had the softest skin. He didn't want to leave her, didn't want to have to get dressed and go home. She was a miracle, his very precious miracle. He gazed into the glowing coals. I came back to England in something of a grey fog. I thought that the special love a man has for a woman was all in my past. I felt lucky enough just to have my daughters to love and care for. I never expected anything more. And then I went to a party, and I was bored and about to leave when I saw this gorgeous woman arriving. You smiled, not even at me. In fact, you were quite cruelly cold toward me. She started to explain, but he pressed his finger over her lips and went on. But it was such a sweet smile, and my closed-off, battered heart opened up and whispered, This one. She sighed, and in the following days and weeks in which I came to know you, my heart kept insisting, this one, and all the wild, tumultuous feelings I thought were dead and in the past boiled up again, 
stronger than ever. He stroked her cheek with the back of his hand, and she leaned into it. It's not the same as my first love, but it's just as strong, and it's only going to get stronger. So, my dearest love, you are already in my heart. I just need you in my life. He leaned back so he could see her face properly. Really? The only question left is, when are you going to make an honest man of me? Chapter 18 Alice and James decided to marry at Towers, James's house in Warwickshire. They travelled down in a cavalcade of carriages. The three little girls, and Cat, theoretically travelled with Nanny McCubbin, but hopped from one carriage to another every time they stopped to change horses. Gerald and Lucy followed in a separate carriage, without a chaperone, and Mary and James's valet and a pile of luggage travelled last. Towers was delightful. Nestled in a green wooded valley, it was a sprawling, asymmetrical pile, begun in the 15th century and added to by various ancestors every few centuries. It's a bit of a monstrosity, James said diffidently, when the carriage turned a corner and the house first came into sight. But he clearly loved it. It's wonderful, Alice said, and she meant it. The oldest part of the building was in the half-timbered, black-and-white Tudor style. Other parts were stone, and one wing was brick. And there were battlements and several towers, including one round brick turret with a pointy roof. The girls, too, were enchanted. It's a fairy palace, Judy exclaimed. Can we sleep in the turret, Papa, can we? The church on the estate was small and beautiful, built of bluestone, with a steep slate roof and a slightly crooked spire. Arched, stained glass windows glinted in the late afternoon sun. The moment Alice saw the little church, she knew that this was where she wanted to be married, rather than the impressive, much larger church in Kenilworth that they'd seen earlier. James paced back and forth at the front of the altar. It was ridiculous to be so nervous, he knew. But waiting for his bride in a church was almost as nerve-wracking as waiting to go into battle. He just wanted it over and done with, and to be left alone with his family. Don't worry, she'll be here, Gerald said heartily. James gave him a baleful look. Wait till it's your turn. He knew she'd be here. He didn't know why he was nervous. He just was. The church smelled of beeswax and flowers. The village ladies had descended and given it a good scrub and polish. Guests had been arriving over the last few days. The pews were filling up, county gentlefolk and villagers. He'd been stunned by the welcome he'd received from the local people. Apparently, they remembered him with fondness and had warmly welcomed Alice and the three little girls. There was no organ, but the vicar had brought in a small choir to sing the bride down the aisle. They started to hum then broke into a soft hymn. James turned, and a small figure dressed in blue began marching importantly down the aisle. A small figure wearing a very strange black and white fur collar. The collar yowled, stretched and leapt to the floor. Luckily, it wore a smart blue velvet harness, which restrained it. The congregation chuckled, and some of James's tension dissolved. Next came Lena, elfin and dainty, 
looking more like her mother every day. Then Judy, serious and responsible, his firstborn. After that came Lucy, part of his family now, and he wouldn't have it any other way. And finally, there she was, the love of his life, serene and lovely, in shades of sea green and blue, to match her glorious eyes, shining now as they met his. She was radiant, smiling. He had the biggest lump in his throat. He held out his hand to her, and she took it. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. As it dances through the night In the electronic pulse Friendships take flight In the sweetness of companionship That spirit thrives Global crumble Where you need it As the journey concludes Its heart is light Epilogue The biggest, splashiest wedding of the season Was over and nobody had been strangled. The large and lavish wedding breakfast was coming to an end, and Lucy was upstairs with Alice and Mary, changing from her wedding dress into a travelling outfit. She and Gerald were going to Paris for their honeymoon. Are you sure you like the murals? Lucy asked Alice, while Mary removed dozens of tiny pink rosebuds from her hair. If you don't like them, you can always paper over them. Never, Alice said, shocked. The girls adore them. I don't know how you came up with such charming designs, each one so different, but so perfect for each child. Lena is in love with her fairy Dell. Judy adores her horses. And Debo... Well, we could hardly get Debo to leave her room once she saw it. She's named every single cat, all 35 of them. Lucy laughed. I'm so glad. The door opened, and Gerald poked his head around it. Ready? Lucy looked a query at Mary. Mary stepped back, beaming. All done, miss. I mean, Lady Thornton, you look beautiful. Thank you, Mary. Lucy wrinkled her nose. So strange to be a Lady Thornton. It doesn't feel like me at all. You'll get used to it, Alice assured her. Gerald entered, followed by James, who had been his best man. Alice had given away the bride, an action that raised more than a few eyebrows. The baggage is all packed, Gerald said. We're driving to Dover, and we'll spend the night there, then catch the packet to France in the morning. He glanced at Lucy. Or oh, the next day. Alice looked at Lucy. Something in Gerald's expression suggested that she and James hadn't been the only ones who had anticipated their wedding vows. The house at Bel Air Gardens had been empty, after all. But there was a faint crease between Lucy's brow, and she was looking at Alice in a very particular way. At a very particular part of Alice's anatomy. Alice, she began on a query, and stopped. Alice raised a brow at James, who nodded. Yes, Lucy, what you're wondering about. It's true, Alice said softly. Really? 
Lucy gasped. Oh, Alice, that's wonderful. She embraced Alice. Alice placed a hand on her swelling midriff and leaned back against James. I know, it's our little miracle. After all those years of being barren, you must have been mistaken. Alice smiled mistily. I don't understand it. Thaddeus had a son, after all. But who cares about the whys or wherefores? All I know is that I'm expecting a child, and I'm over the moon. She glanced up at James and said softly, We're over the moon. Congratulations, Gerald said. But this son of Uncle Thaddeus's, when was this? He was born shortly after Thaddeus and I were married. His mistress, Mrs. Jennings, went to the country where she gave birth to a son in secret. The baby was raised by one of his tenants in the country. Thaddeus made no secret of it to me. Far from it. He was furious. Gerald frowned. So this son would now be... Nineteen or twenty, then? Alice nodded. I suppose so. Thaddeus never let me forget it. If old Lord Charlton had allowed him to marry Mrs. Jennings, instead of forcing him to marry me, that son would have been his legitimate heir. Gerald snorted. I doubt it. What do you mean? I've seen Mrs. Jennings' son and he is definitely not related to Uncle Thaddeus. What are you saying? How could you have seen him? It was when we were sorting out Uncle Thaddeus's will. He gave Alice an embarrassed look. He'd made a number of bequests to her, you see. Papa got me to deal with it, dealing with a mistress being beneath his dignity. So I went to her home, and her butler answered the door. I also met a young man there, nineteen or twenty, who called her mother. He paused for dramatic effect. That young man was the spitting image of her butler. There was a short, shocked silence. That would explain why she never brought the boy to the city, Alice said after a moment. Thaddeus claimed it was too painful to meet the son who should have been his heir. I wonder if he knew, Gerald mused. Alice thought about it, then shook her head. No, he would never forgive infidelity, let alone being cuckolded by a butler. And if he'd known, he would never have left Mrs. Jennings a penny in his will. She thought about all the years of guilt and shame she'd endured for her apparent failure as a wife, and then dismissed them forever. She was no longer that woman. James's arm slipped around her waist, and she smiled and leaned into him. She had a new life now, a husband who told her daily he adored her and demonstrated it in the most blissful ways. Three little girls who filled her days with joy and laughter, and cats, and a goddaughter who'd begun as an unwelcome imposition and became a beloved daughter and a friend. And soon, Alice laid a hand on her burgeoning belly, a baby. Life was wonderful. Well, are you ready to go now? Gerald asked Lucy. The carriage is waiting, and everyone's gathered downstairs to see us off. Lucy glanced around the room, checking that she'd left nothing behind, then kissed Alice and James goodbye, as well as Mary the maid. Then she turned to her brand new husband. I'm ready. Gerald bowed and gestured gracefully toward the door. After you, 
Lady Thornbottle? This concludes The Scoundrel's Daughter by Anne Gracie. Narrated by Christine Rendell. Copyright 2021 by Anne Gracie. This unabridged audiobook is recorded by arrangement with Berkeley, an imprint of Penguin Publishing Group, a division of Penguin Random House LLC, and was produced in the year 2021 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.